Journey of Souls Case Studies of Life Between Lives by Michael Newton, Ph.D. 9. The Beginner's Soul There are two types of beginner souls. Souls who are truly young in terms of exposure to an existence out of the spirit world and souls who have been reincarnating on earth for a long period of relative time but still remain immature. I find beginner souls of both types in levels 1 and 2. I believe almost three quarters of all souls who inhabit human bodies on earth today are still in the early stages of development. I know this is a grossly discouraging statement because it means most of our human population is operating at the lower end of their training. On the other hand, when I consider a world population beset by so much negative cross-cultural misunderstanding and violence, I am not inclined to change my opinion about the high percentage of lower level souls on earth. However, I do think each century brings improvement of awareness in all humans. Over a number of years, I have maintained a statistical count of client soul levels in my case files. Undoubtedly, the figures are weighted to some extent at the lower levels because these subjects were not selected at random. My cases could be overrepresented by souls at the lower levels of development because they are the very people who require assistance in life and might come to me seeking information. For those who are curious, the percentages by soul level of all my cases are as follows. Level 1, 42%. Level 2, 31%. Level 3, 17%. Level 4, 9%. And level 5, 1%. Projecting these figures into a world population of 5 billion souls would be unreliable using my small sample. Nevertheless, I see the possibility we may have only a few hundred thousand people on Earth at level 5. My subjects state that souls end their incarnations on earth when they reach full maturity. What is significant about the high percentage of souls in the early stages of development is our rapidly multiplying population and the urgency babies have for available souls. We are increasing by 260,000 children per day. This human necessity for souls means they must normally be drawn from a spiritual pool of less advanced entities who require more incarnations to progress and are, therefore, more available to return to another life. I am sensitive to the feelings of clients whom I know to be in the early stages of development. I cannot count the number of times a new client has come into my office and said, I know I am an old soul, but I seem to have problems coping with life. We all want to be advanced souls, because most people hate to be considered a beginner in anything. Every case is unique. There are variables within each soul's character, individual development rate, and the qualities of the guides assigned to them. I see my task as offering interpretations of what subjects report to me about the progression of their souls. I have had many cases where a client has been incarnating for up to 30,000 years on Earth and is still in the lower levels of 1 and 2. The reverse is also true with a few people, although rapid acceleration in spiritual development is uncommon. As with any educational model, students find certain lessons more difficult than others. One of my clients has not been able to conquer envy for 850 years in numerous lives, but she did not have too much trouble overcoming bigotry by the end of this same period. Another has spent nearly 1,700 years off and on seeking some sort of authoritative power over others. However, he has gained compassion. The next case represents an absolute beginner soul. This novice shows no evidence of having a spiritual group assignment as yet because she has lived too few past lives. In her first life, she was killed in 1260 A.D., in northern Syria by a Mongol invasion. Her name was Shabez, and her settlement was sacked, resulting in a terrible massacre of the inhabitants when she was five years old. Case 20 Dr. N. Shabez, 
Now that you have died and returned to the spirit world, tell me what you feel. Subject shouts. Cheated. That life was so cruel. I couldn't stay. I was only a little girl unable to help anybody. What a mistake. Dr. N. Who made this mistake? Subject in a conspiratorial tone. My leader. I trusted his judgment, but he was wrong to send me into that cruel life to be killed before my life got started. Dr. N. But you did agree to come into the body of Chavez. Subject upset. I didn't know Earth would be such an awful place full of terror. I wasn't given all the facts. The whole stupid life was a mistake, and my leader is responsible. Dr. N. Didn't you learn anything from this life? Subject. Pause. I started to learn to love. Yes, that was wonderful. My brother, parents, but it was so short. Doctor N, did anything good come out of this life? Subject. My brother Ahmed, to be with him. Doctor N, is Ahmed in your present life? Subject. Suddenly, my subject rises out of her chair. I can't believe it. Ahmed is my husband Bill, the same person. How can, Doctor N, after calming subject, I explain the process of soul transference to a new body and then continue. Do you see Ahmed on your return to the spirit world after dying as Chavez? Subject, yes. Our leader brings us together here, where we stay. Doctor N. Does Ahmed emit the same energy color as yourself, or are there differences? Subject. Pause. We are all white. Doctor N. Describe what you do here. Subject. While our leader comes and goes, Ahmed and I just work together. Doctor N. Doing what? Subject. We search out what we think about ourselves, our experience on Earth. I'm still sore about us being killed so soon, but there was happiness, walking in the sun, breathing the air of Earth, love. Doctor N, go back further to the time before you and Ahmed had your life together, perhaps when you were alone. What was it like being created? Subject, disturbed. I don't know. I was just here, with thought. Doctor N, do you remember during your own creation when you first began to think as an intelligent being? Subject, I realized I existed, but I didn't know myself as myself until I was moved into this quiet place alone with Ahmed. Doctor N. Are you saying your individual identity came more into focus when you began interacting with another soul entity besides your guide? Subject. Yes, with Ahmed. Doctor N. Keep to the time before Ahmed. What was it like for you then? Subject. Warm. Nurturing. My mind opening. She was with me then. Doctor N. She. I thought your leader displayed a male gender to you. Subject. I don't mean him. Someone was around me with the presence of a mother and father, mostly mother. Doctor N. What presence? Subject. I don't know. The soft light, changing features. I can't grasp it. Loving messages, encouragement. Doctor N, this was at the time of your creation as a soul. Subject, yes, it's all hazy. There were others, helpers, when I was born. Doctor N, what else can you tell me about the place of your creation? Subject, long pause. Others love me in a nursery. Then we left. And I was with Ahmed and our leader, Doctor N. 
Who actually created you and Ahmed? Subject. The One. I have learned there seems to be a kind of spirit world maternity ward for newborn souls. One client told me, This place is where infantile light is arranged in a honeycomb fashion, as unhatched eggs ready to be used. In Chapter 4 on Displaced Souls, we saw how damaged souls can be remodeled. My conjecture is these creation centers described by Chavez have the same function. In the next chapter, Case 22 will explain more about spiritual areas of ego creation, where raw, undefined energy can be manipulated into a genesis of self. Case 20 has some obvious traits of the immature soul. The subject is a 67-year-old woman who has had a lifetime of getting into disastrous ruts. She does not demonstrate a generosity of spirit toward others, nor does she take much personal responsibility for her actions. This client came to me searching for answers as to why life had cheated me out of happiness. In our session, we learned Ahmed was her first husband, Bill. She left him long ago for another man whom she also divorced because of her inability to bond with people. She does not feel close to any of her children. The beginner's soul may live a number of lives in a state of confusion and ineffectiveness, influenced by an earth curriculum which is different from the coherence and supportive harmony of the spirit world. Less developed souls are inclined to surrender their will to the controlling aspects of human society. With a socioeconomic structure, which causes a large proportion of people to be subordinate to others. The inexperienced soul tends to be stifled by a lack of independent thinking. They also lean towards being self-centered and don't easily accept others for who they are. It is not my intention to paint a totally bleak portrait of souls who comprise so much of our world population, if my estimates of the high numbers of this category of soul are accurate. Lower-level souls are also able to lead lives which have many positive elements. Otherwise, no one would advance. No stigma should be attached to these souls, since every soul was once a beginner. If we become angry, resentful, and confused by our life situations, this does not necessarily mean we possess an underdeveloped spirit. Soul development is a complex matter, where we all progress by degrees in a variety of areas in an uneven manner. The important thing is to recognize our faults, avoid self-denial, and have the courage and self-sufficiency to make constant adjustments in our lives. One of the clear indications that souls are coming out of novice status is when they leave their spiritual existence of relative isolation. They are removed from small family cocoons with other novices, and placed in a larger group of beginner souls. At this stage, they are less dependent upon close supervision and special nurturing from their guides. For the younger souls, the first realization that they are part of a substantial group of spirits like themselves is a source of delight. Generally, I find this important spiritual event has occurred by the end of a fifth life on Earth regardless of the relative length of time the novice soul was in semi-isolation. Some of the entities of these new spiritual groups are the souls of relatives and friends with whom the young soul was associated in their few past lives on earth. What is especially significant about the formation of a new cluster group is that other peer group members are also newer souls who find themselves together for the first time. In Chapter 7 on Placement, we saw how a soul group appeared when Case 16 rejoined them, and the manner in which life experiences were studied through pictorial scenes, as reported by this subject. Case 21 will offer a more detailed account of spiritual group dynamics, and how members impact on each other. The capacity of souls to learn certain lessons may be stronger or weaker between one another, depending upon inclination, motivation, and prior incarnation experience. Cluster groups are carefully designed to give peer support through a sensitivity of identity traits between all members. This cohesiveness is far beyond what we know on Earth. Although the next case is presented from the perspective of one group member, his superconscious mind provides an objectivity into the process of what goes on in groups. 
My subject will describe a grandiose, male-oriented spiritual group. The raucous entities of this group are linked by exhibitionism, which could be labeled narcissistic. The common approaches these souls use in finding personal value is one indication why they are working together. The extravagant behavior modes of these souls is offset to some extent by their spiritual prescience. Since the complete truth is known by all group members about each other in a telepathic world, humor is indispensable. Some readers may find it hard to accept that souls do joke with each other about their failings, but humor is the basis upon which self-deception and hypocrisy are exposed. Ego defenses are so well understood by everyone in spiritual groups that evidence of a mastery of oneself among peers is a strong incentive for change. Spiritual therapy occurs because of honest peer feedback, mutual trust, and the desire to advance with others over eons of time. Souls can hurt, and they need caring entities around them. The curative power of spiritual group interaction is quite remarkable. Soul members network by the use of criticism and acclaim as each strives toward common goals. Some of the best help I am able to give my clients comes from information I receive about their soul group. Spiritual groups are a primary means of soul instruction. Learning appears to come as much from one's peers as from the skills of guides who monitor these groups. In the case which follows, my client has finished reliving his last past life as a Dutch artist living in Amsterdam. He died of pneumonia at a young age in 1841, about the time he was gaining recognition for his painting. We have just rejoined his spiritual group when my subject bursts out laughing. Case 21 Dr. N. Why are you laughing? Subject I'm back with my friends and they are giving me a hard time. Dr. N. Why? Subject Because I'm wearing my fancy buckled shoes and the bright green velvet jacket with yellow piping down the sides. I'm flashing them my big floppy painter's hat. Dr. N. They are kidding you about projecting yourself wearing these clothes? Subject. You know it. I was so vain about clothes, and I cut a really fine figure as an artist in Amsterdam Cafe Society. I enjoyed this role and played it well. I don't want it to end. Dr. N. What happens next? Subject. My old friends are around me and we are talking about the foolishness of life. We rib each other about how dramatic it all is down there on Earth and how seriously we all take our lives. Dr. N. You and your friends don't think it is important to take life on Earth seriously? Subject. Look, Earth is one big stage play. We all know that. Dr. N. And your group is united in this feeling? Subject. Sure. We see ourselves as actors in a gigantic stage production. Dr. N. How many entities are in your particular cluster group in the spirit world? Subject. Pause. Well, we work with some others, but there are five of us who are close. Dr. N. By what name do they call you? Subject. L Lem. No, that's not right. It's Alum. That's me. Dr. N. All right, Alum. Tell me about your close friends. Subject laughs. <laughs> Norcross. He is the funniest. At least he is the most boisterous. Dr. N. Is Norcross the leader of your group? Subject. No, he is just the loudest. We are all equal here, but we have our differences. Norcross is blunt and opinionated. Dr. N. Really? Then how would you characterize his earth behavior? Subject. Oh, as being rather unscrupulous, but not dangerous. Dr. N. Who is the quietest and most unassuming member of your group? Subject. Quizzical. How did you guess? It's Velo. Dr. N. Does this attribute make Velo the least effective contributing member of your group? Subject. Where did you get that idea? Velo comes up with some interesting thoughts about the rest of us. 
Dr. N. Give me an example. Subject. In my life in Holland, the old Dutch couple who adopted me after my parents died, they had a beautiful garden. Vilo reminds me of my debt to them, that the garden triggered my painting. To see life as an artist, and what I didn't do with my talent. Dr. N., does Vilo convey any other thoughts to you about this? Subject, sadly, that I should have done less drinking and strutting around and painted more. That my art was reaching the point of touching people. Subject pulls his shoulders back. But I wasn't going to stay cooped up painting all the time. Dr. N., do you have respect for Vilo's opinions? Subject, with a deep sigh. Yes, we know he is our conscience. Dr. N., so what do you say to him? Subject, I say, Innkeeper, mind your own business. You were having fun, too. Dr. N., Vila was an innkeeper? Subject, yes, in Holland. Engaged in a business for profit, I might add. Dr. N., do you feel this was wrong of Vilo? Subject, contrite. No, not really. We all know he took losses to help those poor people on the road who needed food and shelter. His life was beneficial to others. Dr. N., I would guess telepathic communication makes it hard to sustain your arguments when the complete truth is known by everyone. Subject, yes, we all know Vilo is progressing. Damn! Dr. N., does it bother you that Vilo may be advancing faster than the rest of you? Subject, yes, we have had such fun. Subject then recalls an earlier life with Vilo, where they traveled together as brothers in India. Dr. N., what will happen to Vilo? Subject, he is going to leave us soon, we all know that, to have associations with the others who have also gone. Dr. N., how many souls have left your original group, Alum? Subject, a long pause and then ruefully, Oh, the couple have moved on. We will eventually catch up to them, but not for a while. They haven't disappeared. We just don't see their energy as much. Dr. N., name the others of your immediate group for me, besides Velo and De Norcross. Subject, brightening. Dubry and Trinian. Now those two know how to have a good time. Dr. N., what is the most obvious identifying characteristic of your group? Subject, with relish. Adventure. Excitement. We have some real pioneer types around here. Subject rushes on happily. Dubry just came off a wild life as a sea captain. Norcross was a freewheeling trading merchant. We live life to its fullest because we are talented at taking what life has to offer. Dr. N., I'm hearing a lot of self-gratification here, Alum. Subject, defensively. And what's wrong with that? Our group is not made up of shrinking violets, you know. Dr. N., what's the story on Trinian's last life? Subject, reacts boisterously. He was a bishop. Can you believe it? What hypocrisy! Dr. N. In what way? Subject. What self-deception! Norcross, Dubry, and I tell Trinian his choice to be a churchman had nothing to do with goodness, charity, or spirituality. Dr. N. And what does Trinian's soul mentally project to you in self-defense? Subject. He tells us he gave solace to many people. Dr. N. What do you, Norcross, and Dubry tell him in response? Subject. That he is going soft. Norcross tells him that he wanted money or otherwise he would have been a simple priest. Ha! Ah, that's telling him. And I'm saying the same thing. You can guess what Dubry thinks about all this. Dr. N. No. Tell me. Subject. Huh. That Trinian picked a large city with a rich cathedral, spilling a ton of money into Trinian's fat pockets. Dr. N., and what do you tell Trini and yourself? Subject, oh, I'm attracted to the fancy robes he wore. Bright red, 
the finest of cloth, his bishop's ring which he loved, and all the gold and silver around. I also mention his desire to bask in adulation from his flock. Trinian can hide nothing from us. He wanted an easy, cushy life where he was well fed. Dr. N., does he try to explain his motivations for choosing this life? Subject, yes, but Norcross reproaches him. He confronts Trinian on seducing a young girl in the vestry. Jovially, yes, it actually happened. So much for providing solace to parishioners. We know Trinian for who he really is, an outright rogue. Dr. N., does Tridian offer any excuses to the group for his conduct? Subject. Subject becomes quieter. Oh, the usual. He got carried away with the girl's need for him. She had no family. He was lonely in his choice of a celibate church life. He says he was trying to get away from the customary lives we all choose by going into the church. That he fell in love with the girl. Dr. N., and how do you, Norcross and Dubry, feel about Trinian now? Subject, severely. We think he is trying to follow Velo as an advancing soul, but he failed. His pious intentions just didn't work for him. Dr. N. Alum, you sound rather cynical about Trinian's attempts to improve himself and make changes. Tell me honestly, how do you feel about Trinian? Subject, Oh, we are just teasing him. After all... Dr. N., your amusement sounds as if you are scornful over what may have been Trinian's good intentions. Subject, sadly. You're right, and we all know that, but you see, Norcross, Dubry, and I... Well, we don't want to lose him from the group, too. Dr. N., what does Velo say about Trinian? Subject... He defends Trinian's original good intentions and tells him that he fell into a trap of self-gratification during this life in the church. Trinian wants too much admiration and attention. Dr. N. Forgive me for passing judgment on your group, Alum, but it seems to me this is something you all want, except perhaps Velo? Subject. Hey, Velo can be pretty smug. Let me tell you, his problem is conceit. And Dubry tells him that in no uncertain terms. Dr. N. And does Velo deny it? Subject. No, he doesn't. He says at least he is working on it. Dr. N. Who among you is the most sensitive to criticism? Subject. Pause. Oh, I guess it would be Norcross. But it's hard for all of us to accept our faults. Dr. N. Level with me, Alum. Does it bother the members of your soul group when things can't be hidden from the others? When all your shortcomings in a past life are revealed? Subject. Pause. We are sensitive about it, but not morbid. There is great understanding here among us. I wanted to give artistic pleasure to people and grow through the meaning of art. So what did I do? I ran around the Amsterdam canals a lot at night and got caught up in the fun and games. My original purpose was pushed aside. Dr. N. If you admit all this to the group, what kind of feedback do you get? For example, how do you and Norcross regard each other? Subject. Norcross often points out I hate to take responsibility for myself and others. With Norcross it's wealth. He loves power. But we are both selfish. Except that I am more vain. Neither of us gets many gold stars. Dr. N. How does Dubry fit into your group with his faults? Subject. He enjoys controlling others by leadership. He is a natural leader more than the rest of us. He was a sea captain, a pirate, one tough individual. He wouldn't want to cross him. Dr. N. Was he cruel? Subject. No, just hard. He was respected as a captain. Dubry was merciless against his opponents in sea battles, but he took care of his own men. Dr. N. You have told me that Velo assisted people who were in need on the road, but you haven't said much about the positive side of your lives. 
Is anyone in your group given any gold stars for unselfish acts? Subject. Intently. There is something else about Dubry. Dr. N. What is that? Subject. He did one outstanding thing. Once, during heavy seas, a sailor fell off the mast into the ocean and was drowning. Dubry tied a line around his waist and dove off the deck. He risked his life and saved a shipmate. Dr. N. When this incident is discussed in your group, how do you all respond to Dubry? Subject. We praise him for what he did with admiration in our minds. We came to the same conclusion that none of us could match this single act of courage in our last lives. Dr. N. I see. Yet Velo's life at the inn, feeding and housing people who could not pay him, may represent acts of unselfishness for a longer term and therefore is more praiseworthy? Subject. Granted, and we give him that. Laughs. He gets more gold stars than Dubry. Dr. N. Do you get any strokes from the group for your last life? Subject. Pause. I had to scramble for patrons to survive as a painter. But I was good to people. It wasn't much. I enjoyed giving pleasure. My group recognizes I had a good heart. Every one of my clients has special attachments to their soul group, regardless of character makeup. People tend to think of souls in the free state as being without human deficiencies. Actually, I think there are many similarities between groups of souls close to each other and human family systems. For instance, I see Norcross as the rebellious scapegoat for this group of souls, while he and Alam are the inventory takers for everyone's shortcomings. Alam said Norcross is usually the first to openly scrutinize any rationalizations or self-serving justifications of past life failures offered by the other members. He appears to have the least self-doubt and emotional investment over standards of conduct. This may define his own insecurity, because Norcross is probably fighting the hardest to keep up with the advancing group. I suspect Alam himself could be the group's mascot, often the youngest child in human families, with all his clowning around, preening and making light of serious issues. Some souls in spiritual groups do seem to me to be more fragile and protected than other group members. Velo's conduct demonstrates he is the current hero, or eldest family member, with his drive for excellence. I have the impression from Alam that Velo is the least defiant of the group, partly because he has the best record of achievement in recent past lives. Just as in human family systems, the role of spiritual group members can be switched around. But I was told Velo's kinetic energy is turning pink, signaling his growth into level two. I attach human labels on ethereal spirits, because after all, souls who come to Earth do show themselves through human characteristics. However, I don't see hatred, suspicion, and disrespect in soul groups. In a climate of compassion, there are no power struggles for control among these peer groups, whose members are unable to manipulate each other or keep secrets. Souls distrust themselves, not each other. I do see fortitude, desire, and the will to keep trying in their new physical lives. In an effort to confirm some of my observations about the social dynamics among spiritual group members in this case, I ask Alam a few more questions. Dr. N. Alam. Do you believe your criticism of each other is always constructive? Subject. Sure, there is no real hostility. We have fun at each other's expense, I admit that. But it's just a form of... acknowledgement of who we really are, and where we should be going. Dr. N. Is any member of your soul group ever made to feel shame or guilt about a past life? Subject. Those are... human weapons and too narrow for what we feel. Dr. N. Well, let me approach your feelings as a soul in another way. Do you feel safer getting feedback from one of your group members more than another? Subject. No, I don't. We all respect each other immensely. The greatest criticism comes from within ourselves. Dr. N. Do you have any regrets for your conduct in any past life? Subject. Long pause. 
Yes. I feel sorry if I've hurt someone. And then have everyone here know all about my mistakes. But we learn. Dr. N. And what do you do about this knowledge? Subject. Talk among ourselves. And try to make amends the next time. Dr. N. From what you told me earlier, I had the idea that you, Norcross, and Dubri might be releasing some pent-up feelings over your own shortcomings by dumping on each other. Subject, thoughtfully. We make cynical remarks, but it's not like being human anymore. Without our bodies, we take criticism a little differently. We see each other for who we are without resentment or jealousy. Dr. N., I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I just wondered if all this flamboyance exhibited by your group might indicate underlying feelings of unworthiness. Subject. Oh, that's something else again. Yes, we do get discouraged as souls and feel unworthy about our abilities to meet the confidence placed in us to improve. Dr. N. So while you have self-doubts about yourselves, it's okay to make cynical remarks about each other's motivations? Subject, of course. But we want to be recognized by one another for being sincere in working on our individual programs. Sometimes self-pride gets in the way and we use each other to move past this. In the next passage of dialogue, I introduce another spiritual phenomenon relating to group healing. I have heard a number of variations about this activity, which are supported by the interpretations of Case 22. Dr. N., now, Alam, as long as we are discussing how your group members relate to each other, I want you to describe the spiritual energy by which you are all assisted in this process. Subject, hesitant. I'm not sure I can tell you. Dr. N., think carefully. Isn't there another means by which your group is brought into harmony with each other with intelligent energy? Subject, long pause. You mean from the cones? Dr. N. The word cone is new to me, but I know I'm on the right track. Yes, the cones. Explain what you know about them relative to your group. Subject, slowly. Well, the cones do assist us. Dr. N. Please continue, and tell me what the cone does. I think I have heard about this before, but I want your version. Subject. It's shaped to go around us, you know. Dr. N., shaped in what way? Try to be more explicit. Subject. It is cylindrical, very bright. It is above and all around us. The cone is small at the top and wide at the bottom, so it fits over all of us, like getting under a great white cap. We can float under the cone in order to use it. Dr. N., are you sure this isn't the shower of healing you experienced right after your return to the spirit world? Subject. Oh no, that was more individual purification. To repair earth damage. I thought you knew. Dr. N. I do. I want you to explain how the cone is different from the shower of healing. Subject. The top funnels energy down as a waterfall in a spreading circle around all of us and allows us to really concentrate on our mental sameness as a group. Dr. N., and what do you feel when you are under the cone? Subject, we can feel all our thoughts being expanded, then drawn up and returned back, with more knowledge added. Dr. N., does this intelligent energy help your unity as a group in terms of more focused thinking? Subject, yes, it does. Dr. N., deliberately confrontational. To be frank with you, Alum, I wonder if this cone is brainwashing your original thoughts. After all, the arguments and disagreements between you and the others of your group are what make you individuals. Subject, laughs. We aren't brainwashed. Don't you know anything about the afterlife? It gives us more collective insight to work together. Dr. N., is the cone always available? Subject, it is there when we need it. Dr. N. Who operates the cone? Subject. Those who watch over us. Dr. N. 
your guide? Subject bursts out laughing. Shato? <laughs> I think he is too busy traveling around on his circuit. Dr. N, what do you mean? Subject, we think of him as a circus master, a stage manager of our group. Dr. N, does Shato take an active part in your group deliberations? Subject shakes head. Not really. Guides are above a lot of this stuff. We are left on our own quite a bit, and that's fine. Dr. N, do you think there is one specific reason for the absences of Shato? Subject, pause. Oh, he probably gets bored with our lack of progress. He loves to show off as the master of ceremonies, though. Dr. N, in what way? Subject, chuckling. Oh, to suddenly appear in front of us during one of our heated debates, throwing off blue sparks, looking like a wizard who is an all-powerful moderator. Dr. N, a wizard? Subject, still laughing. A shadow appears in long sapphire blue robes with a tall pointed hat. With his flowing white beard, he looks simply great, and we do admire him. Dr. N. I get the picture of a spiritual Merlin. Subject. An oriental Merlin, if you will. Very inscrutable sometimes. He loves making a grand entrance in full costume, especially when we are about to choose another life. He knows how much we appreciate his act. Dr. N. With all this stage management, I am curious if Shato has much emotional connection to your group as a serious guide. Subject, scoffing at me. Listen, he knows we are a wild bunch, and he plays to that as a nonconformist himself. But he is also very wise. Dr. N. Is Shato indulgent with your group? He doesn't seem to limit your extravagance very much. Subject. Shato gets results from us because he is not heavy-handed or preachy. That wouldn't sit well with our people. We respect him. Dr. N. Do you see Shato as a consultant who comes only once in a while to observe, or as an active supervisor? Subject. He will pop in unannounced to set up a problem for our discussions. Then he leaves, coming back later to listen to how we might solve certain things. Dr. N. Give me an example of a major problem with your group. Subject. Pause. Shadow knows we identify too much as actors playing parts on Earth. He hits on superficiality. He is trying to get us to cast ourselves from the inside out rather than the reverse. Dr. N. So Shato's instruction is serious, but he knows you all like to have fun along the way? Subject. Yeah, that's why Shato is with us, I think. He knows we waste opportunities. He assists us in interpreting the predicaments we get into in order to get the best out of us. Dr. N. From what you have told me, I have the impression that your spiritual group is run as a kind of workshop directed by your guide. Subject. Yes. He builds up our morale and keeps us going. Unlike educational classrooms or therapy groups on Earth, I have learned teacher counselors in the spirit world are not confined as group activity leaders on a continuous basis. Although Shato and his students are a colorful family of souls, there is much here that is typical of all cluster groups. A guide's leadership is more parental than dictatorial. In this case, Shato is a directive counselor while not being possessive, nor does he pose a threat to the group. There is a warm acceptance of these young souls by this empathic guide, who seems to cater to their masculine inclinations. I will close this case with a few final questions about the group as a spiritual unit. Dr. N. Why is your group so male-oriented on Earth? Subject. Earth is an action planet which rewards physical exertion. We are inclined to male roles so we can grab hold and mold events, to dominate our surroundings, to be recognized. Dr. N. Women are also influential in society. How can your group hope to progress without more experience in female roles? Subject. We know this, but we have such a fierce desire to be independent. 
In fact, we often expend too much energy for too little return. But the female aspects don't interest us as much right now. Dr. N. If you have no female counterparts in your immediate group, where do you go for those entities to complement your lives on Earth? Subject. Nearby, there are some who relate better to female roles. I get along with Josie. She has been with me in some of my lives. Trinian is attached to Nyala. And there are others. Dr. N. Alam, I would like to end our conversation about your spiritual associations by asking you what you know about the origin of your group. Subject. Long pause. I can't tell you. We just came together at one time. Dr. N. Well, someone had to bring those of you with the same attributes together. Do you think it was God? Subject. Puzzled. No. Below the source. The higher ones. Dr. N. Shato or other guides like him? Subject. No. Higher. I think. The planners. I don't know anymore. Dr. N. A while back, you told me some of your old friends were reducing their active participation in your group due to their development. Do you ever get new members? Subject. Never. Dr. N. Is this because a new member might have trouble assimilating with the rest of you? Subject. Laughs. We aren't that bad. It's just we are too closely connected by thought for an outsider, and they would not have shared our past experiences. Dr. N. During your discussions about these past lives together, does your group believe it contributes to the betterment of human society? Subject. Pause. We want our presence in a community to challenge conventions, to question basic assumptions. I think we bring nerve into our physical lives. And laughter, too. Dr. N. And when your spiritual group has finished discussing what is necessary to further your aims, do you look forward to a new life? Subject. Zestfully. Oh, yeah. Every time I leave for a new role on Earth, I say goodbye with, See you all back here, A.D. After death. This case is an example of like-minded souls with ego-inflating needs who support and validate each other's feelings and attitudes. Herein lies the key to understanding the formation of soul groups. I have learned that many spiritual clusters have subgroups made up of entities whose identities are linked by similar issues, blocking their advancement. Even so, these souls do have differences in strengths and weaknesses. Each group member contributes their best attributes toward advancing the goals of others in the family. I do not want to leave the impression from Case 21 that the few remaining souls in this inner circle of close friends represent the behavior traits of everyone in the original cluster. When a primary group of, say, 15 or 20 souls is formed, there are marked similarities in talent and interests. But a support group is also designed to have differences in disposition, feelings, and reactions. Typically, my subjects report a male-female oriented mixture of one or more of the following character types in their groups. 1. Courageous, resilient, a tenacious survivor. 2. Gentle, quiet, devoted, and rather innocent. 3. Fun-loving, humorous, a jokester and risk-taker. 4. Serious, dependable, cautious. 5. Flamboyant, enthusiastic, frank. 6. Patient, steady, perceptive. 7. Thoughtful, calculating, determined. 8. Innovative, resourceful, adaptable. These differences give a group balance. However, if an entire group displays a strong tendency toward flamboyance or daring, the most cautious member would appear less so to another group of souls. There is no question that the souls in Case 21 are in for a long development period. Yet they do contribute to the vitality of Earth. Subsequent questioning of this subject revealed the paths of these souls continue to cross in the 20th century. For instance, Alum is a graphic designer and part-time professional guitar player, involved with Josie, who is a singer. 
The fact that the closely knit souls in this case were so male-oriented in their physical lives does not take away from their ability to associate with young souls with predominantly female preferences. Cluster groups are gender mixed. As I have mentioned, truly advanced souls have balanced gender preferences in their physical life choices. The desire for expression of self-identity is an important motivating factor for souls choosing to come to Earth to learn practical lessons. Sometimes a reason for discomfort with the lower level soul is the discrepancy in perception of self in their free soul state compared to how they act in human bodies. Souls can get confused with who they are in life. Case 21 did not seem to exhibit any conflict in this area, but I question the rate of growth achieved by Alam in recent past lives. However, the basic experience of living a life may compensate to some extent for the lack of insight gained from that life. Our shortcomings and moral conflicts are recognized as faults far more in the spirit world than on earth. We have seen how the nuances of decision-making are dissected and analyzed in spiritual groups. Cluster members have worked together for such a long time in earth years that entities become accountable to each other and the group as a whole. This fosters a great sense of belonging in all spiritual groups and can give the appearance of thought barriers between clusters, especially with souls in the lower levels. Nevertheless, while rejection and loneliness is part of every soul's life in human form, in the spirit world our individual ego identity is constantly enhanced by warm peer group socialization. The social structure of soul groups is not the same as groups of people on earth, Although there is some evidence of paired friendships, I don't hear about cliques, stars of attraction, or isolated souls within clusters. I am told souls do spend time alone in the silence of personal reflection when attached to a group. Souls are intimate entities in their family relationships on Earth and engagement in group community life in the spirit world. And yet, souls do learn much from solitude. I understand from my white light subjects that souls at the beginning levels are frequently separated from their groups to individually work on simple energy projects. One rather young soul recalled being alone in an enclosure trying to put together a moving puzzle of dissembled geometric shapes of cylinders, spheres, cubes and squares with self-produced energy. It was described as being multidimensional, colorful and holographic in nature. He said, We have to learn to intensify our energy to bring the diffused and jumbled into focus to give it some kind of basic shape. Another subject added, These tests give the watchers information about our imagination, creativity, and ingenuity, and they offer us encouragement rather than being judgmental. Souls on all levels engage in another important activity when they are alone. They are expected to spend time mentally concentrating on helping those on Earth or other physical worlds whom they have known and cared about. From what I can gather, they go to a space some call the place of protection. Here they enter an interdimensional field of floating silvery blue energy and project outward to geographical areas of their choosing. I am told this is a mental exercise in holding and releasing positive vibrational energy to create a territory. This means souls ride on their thought waves to specific people, buildings, or a given area of land in an attempt to comfort or affect change. 10. The Intermediate Soul Once our souls advance past level 2 into the intermediate ranges of development, group cluster activity is considerably reduced. This does not mean we return to the kind of isolation we saw with the novice soul. Souls evolving into the middle development levels have less association with primary groups because they have acquired the maturity and experience for operating more independently. These souls are also reducing the number of their incarnations. Within levels 3 and 4, we are at last ready for more serious responsibilities. The relationship we have with our guides now changes from teacher-student to one of colleagues working together. Since our old guides have acquired new student groups, 
It is now our turn to develop teaching skills which will eventually qualify us for the responsibilities of being a guide to someone else. I have said the transitional stages of levels two and four are particularly difficult for me in pinpointing a soul's development. For instance, some level four souls begin targeting themselves toward primary cluster teacher training while still in level three, while other subjects who are clearly level fours find they are unsuited to be effective guides. Despite their high standards of morality and conduct, entities who have reached the intermediate levels of maturity are modest about their achievements. Naturally, each case is different, but I notice more composure with clients in this stage and above. I see trust rather than suspicion toward the motives of others on both a conscious and subconscious level. These people demonstrate a forward-looking attitude of faith and confidence for the future of humanity, which encourages those around them. My questions to the more mature soul are directed to esoteric ideas of purpose and creation. I admit to taking advantage of the higher knowledge possessed by these souls for the sort of spiritual information others lack. There have been clients who have told me they felt I pushed them rather hard in drawing out their spiritual memories, and I know they are right. The more advanced souls of this world possess remarkable comprehension of a universal life plan. I want to learn as much as possible from them. My next case falls into the upper portion of level three development, radiating a yellow energy devoid of any reddish tones. This client was a small, nondescript man, nearly fifty years old. His demeanor was quietly courteous towards me when we met, and I thought him a trifle solemn. I felt his unassuming detachment was somewhat studied, almost as a cover for stronger emotions. The most striking feature about him was his dark, morose eyes, which grew more intense as he began to talk about himself in a direct and persuasive manner. He told me he worked for a charitable organization dispensing food to the homeless and that he had once been a journalist. This client had traveled quite some distance to discuss with me his concern over a decline in enthusiasm for his work. He said he was tired and wanted to spend the rest of his life quietly alone. His first session involved a review of the highlights of many past lives so we could better evaluate a proper course for the remainder of his current life. I began by regressing the subject rapidly through a series of early lives, starting from his first life as a Cro-Magnon man in a Stone Age culture some 30,000 years ago. As we moved forward in time, I noted a consistency of lone wolf behavior patterns as opposed to normal tribal integration. From about 3000 BC to 500 BC, my client lived a number of lives in the Middle East during the rise of the early city-states in Sumerian, Babylonian, and Egyptian cultures. Nevertheless, even in lives as a woman, this subject often avoided family ties, including having no children. As a man, he showed a preference for nomadism. By the time we reached a life in Europe during the Dark Ages, I was becoming accustomed to a rebellious soul resisting tyrannical societies. During his lives, my subject worked to uplift people from fear, while remaining non-aligned to opposing factions. Suffering hardships and many setbacks, he continued as a wanderer with an obsession for freedom of movement. Some lives were not too productive, but during the 12th century, I found him in Central America in the body of an Aztec organizing a band of Indians against the oppressions of a high priest. He was killed in this setting as a virtual outcast, while promoting nonviolent relations between tribes who were traditional enemies. In the 14th century, this soul was a European chronicler, traveling the Silk Road to Carthay to gain understanding of the peoples of Asia. Always facile with languages, as he is today, my client died in Asia as an old man, happily living in a peasant village. In Japan, at the beginning of the 17th century, he was a member of the clan of the Bleeding Crane. These men were respected, independent samurai mercenaries. At the end of this life, my subject was living in seclusion from the ruling Tokugawa shoguns, 
because he had advised their weaker opponents on battle strategy. Frequently the outsider, always an explorer searching for truth across many lands, this soul continued to seek a rational meaning to life while giving aid to those he met along the way. I was surprised when he popped up as the wife of an American farmer on the frontier in the 19th century. The farmer died soon after their marriage. I learned my subject had deliberately incarnated to be a widow with children, tied to a piece of property, as an exercise in the loss of mobility. When this part of his session ended, I knew I was working with a more advanced, older soul, even though he had a great many lives we did not review. Since this soul is approaching level four, I would not have been surprised if his first appearance on Earth had gone back 70,000 years rather than half that amount of time. However, as I have mentioned, it is not an absolute prerequisite that souls have hundreds of physical lives in order to advance. I once had a client who entered into a level three state of awareness after only 4,000 years, an outstanding performance. I talked to my client about his current life and his customary methods of learning in previous lives. He explained he had never been married and that social non-alignments worked best for him. I suggested a few alternatives for his consideration. Primarily, I felt his lack of intimacy with people in too many lives was obstructing his progress. When this session ended, he was anxious that we explore his mind further for perceptions about the spirit world in another session. Upon his arrival the next day, I placed him in a superconscious state, and we went back to work. Case 22 Dr. N By what name are you called in the spirit world? Subject I am called Nentham Dr. N Nentham Do you have spirits around you right now or are you alone? Subject Pause I am with two of my longtime companions Dr. N What are their names? Subject Raoul and Senji Dr. N And the three of you are part of a larger spiritual group of souls working together? Subject We were But now the three of us work More by ourselves Dr. N What are the three of you doing at this moment? Subject We are discussing the best ways to help each other during our incarnations Dr. N Tell me what you do for each other. Subject. I help Senji to forgive herself for mistakes and appreciate her own worth. She needs to stop being a mother figure all the time on Earth. Dr. N. How does she assist you? Subject. To see my lack of a sense of belonging. Dr. N. Give me an example of Senji's actions to assist you with this issue. Subject Well, she was my wife in Japan after my days as a warrior were over. Something is troubling Nentham, and after a pause he adds the following. Raoul likes to pair with Senji and I am usually alone. Dr. N What about Raoul? How do you two help each other? Subject I help him with patience, and he helps me with my tendency to avoid community life. Dr. N are you always two males and a female in your incarnations on Earth? Subject No, we can change, and do, but this is comfortable for us. Dr. N Why are the three of you working independently from the rest of your spiritual group? Subject Pause Oh, we see them here. Some have not gone forward with us. A few others are further ahead of us in their tasks. Dr. N do you have a guide or teacher? Subject, in a soft tone. She is Idis. Dr. N. It sounds to me as if you have a high regard for her. Do you communicate well with Idis? Subject, yes I do. Not that we don't have our disagreements. Dr. N. What is the main area of conflict between the two of you? Subject, she doesn't reincarnate much and I tell her she should have more direct exposure to current conditions on Earth. Dr. N. Are you mentally in tune with Idis to such an extent 
that you know all about her background training as a guide? Subject shakes head while pondering. It isn't that we can't ask questions, but we can only question what we know. Idis reveals to me what she thinks is relevant to my own experience. Dr. N. Are guides able to screen their thoughts so you can't read their minds completely? Subject. Yes, the older ones get proficient at that. Knowing how to filter things we don't need to know because this knowledge would confuse us. Dr. N. Will you learn to filter images? Subject. I already have a little. Dr. N. This must be why I have had many people tell me they have not been given definitive answers by their guides to all their questions. Subject. Yes, and the intent of the question is important. When it was asked, and why. Perhaps it was not in their best interests to be given certain information which might disrupt them. Dr. N. Aside from her teaching techniques, are you fond of Idis in terms of her identity? Subject. Yes. I just wish she would agree to come with me, once. Dr. N. Oh, you would like to actually have an Earth incarnation with her? Subject. Grins mischievously. I have told her we might relate better here if she would consent to come to Earth sometime and mate with me. Dr. N. And what does Ida say to that suggestion? Subject. She laughs and says she will think about it, if I can prove to her that it would be productive. At this juncture, I ask Nentham how long Idas has been associated with him, and learn she was assigned these three entities when they moved into level three. Nentham, Raoul, and Senji are also under the tutelage of a beloved older master guide, who has been with them since the beginning of their existence. It would be inaccurate to assume that more advanced spirits lead lonely spiritual lives. This subject told me he was in contact with many souls. Raoul and Senji were simply his closest friends. Level 3 and 4 are significant stages for souls in their development because now they are given increased responsibilities for younger souls. The status of a guide is not given to us all at once, however. As with many other aspects of soul life, we are carefully tested. The intermediate levels are trial periods for potential teachers. While our aura is still yellow, our mentors assign us a soul to look after, and then evaluate our leadership performance both in and out of physical incarnations. Only if this preliminary training is successful are we allowed to function even at the level of a junior guide. Not everyone is suited for teaching, but this does not keep us from becoming an advanced soul in the blue section. Guides, like everyone else, have different abilities and talents, as well as shortcomings. By the time we reach level 5, our soul aptitudes are well known in the spirit world. We are given occupational duties commensurate with our abilities, which I will go into later in this chapter. Different avenues of approach to learning eventually bring all of us to the same end in acquiring spiritual wholeness. The richness of diversity is part of a master plan for the advancement of every soul, and I am interested in how Case 22 is progressing in Level 3. Dr. N. Nentham, can you tell me if Idis is preparing you to be a guide? assuming you have an interest in that activity. Subject. Quick response. I do have an interest. Dr. N. Oh, then are you developing as a guide yourself? Subject. Modestly. Don't make too much of it. I'm really no more than a caretaker, helping Idis and taking directions. Dr. N. Do you try and imitate her teaching style? Subject. No, we are different. As an apprentice, a caretaker, I couldn't do what she is able to accomplish anyway. Dr. N. When did you know you were ready to be a caretaker and begin assisting others spiritually? Subject. It's an awareness which comes over you after a great number of lives, that you are more in balance with yourself than previously, and are able to aid people as a spirit and in the flesh. Dr. N. Are you operating in or out of the spirit world as a caretaker at this time? Subject. Has difficulty in forming a response. 
I'm out in two lives. Dr. N, are you living in two parallel lives now? Subject, yes, I am. Dr. N, where are you living in this other life? Subject, Canada. Dr. N, is geography important to your Canadian assignment? Subject, yes, I picked a poor family in a rural community where I would be more indispensable. I'm in a small mountain town. Dr. N, give me the details of this Canadian life and your responsibilities. Subject, slowly. I'm taking care of my brother, Billy. His face and hands were horribly burned by a flash fire from a kitchen stove when he was four years old. I was ten when it happened. Dr. N, are you the same age in the Canadian life as you are now in your American one? Subject, about the same. Dr. N, and your prime assignment in the Canadian life? Subject, to care for Billy, to help him see the world past his pain. He is almost blind and his facial disfigurement causes him to be rejected by the community. I try to open him to an acceptance of life and to know who he really is from the inside. I read to him and go for walks in the forest holding his arm. I don't hold his hands because they are so damaged. Dr. N, what about your Canadian parents? Subject, without boasting. I am the parent. My father left after the fire and never came back. He was a weak man who was not kind to the family even before the fire. My mother's soul is not very capable in her body. They need someone with seasoning. Dr. N. Someone physically strong? Subject, laughing. No, I'm a woman in Canada. I'm Billy's sister. My mother and brother require someone mentally tough to hold the family together and give them a course to follow. Dr. N. How do you provide for the family? Subject. I am a baker, and I'll never marry, because I can't leave them. Dr. N. What is your brother's major lesson? Subject. To acquire humility without being crushed by a life of little self-gratification. Dr. N. Why didn't you take the role of your burned brother? Wouldn't that scenario provide you with the more difficult challenge? Subject. Grimacing. Hmm. I've already been through that one. Note, this subject has been physically injured in a number of past lives. Dr. N. Yes, I suppose you have. I wonder if Billy's soul was ever involved with physically hurting you in one of your past lives. Subject. As a matter of fact, he did in one of them. When I was the sufferer, another caretaker stayed with me and I was a grateful receiver. Now it is Billy's turn and I am here for him. Dr. N. Did you know in advance your brother was going to be incapacitated before you came into the Canadian life? Subject. Sure. Idis and I discussed the whole situation. She said Billy's soul would require a caretaker, and since I had negative contact with this soul before in another life, I welcomed the job. Dr. N. Besides the karmic lesson for Billy's soul, there are some for you too in terms of your being in the role of a woman who is tied down. You can't just take off and roam around as you often do in your lives. Subject, that's true. The degree of difficulty in a life is measured by how challenging the situation is for you, not others. For me, being Billy's caretaker is harder than when I was on the receiving end with another soul as my caretaker. Dr. N. Give me the most difficult factor of this assignment for you as a caretaker. Subject. To sustain a child through their helplessness to adulthood. To teach a child to confront torment with courage. Dr. N. Billy's life is an extreme example. But it does seem Earth's children have much physical and emotional pain to go through. Subject. Without addressing and overcoming pain, you can never really connect with who you are and build on that. I must tell you, 
The more pain and adversity which come to you as a child, the more opportunity to expand your potential. Dr. N. And how are things working out for you as a caretaker in Canada? Subject. There is a more difficult set of choices to be made in the Canadian family, unlike my American life. But I have confidence in myself to put my comprehension to practical use. Dr. N. Did Idis encourage or discourage your wanting to accelerate development by living parallel lives? Subject. She is always open about this. I haven't done it too much in the past. Dr. N. Why not? Subject. Life combinations can be tiring and divisive. The effort may become counterproductive with diminished returns for both lives. Dr. N. Well, I see that you are helping people in both your lives today. But have you ever lived contrasting lives where you did poorly in one life and better in another at the same time? Subject. Yes, although that was a long time ago on Earth. This is one of the advantages of life combinations. One life can offset the other. Still, doing this can be rough going. Dr. N. Then why do the guides permit parallel lives? Subject, scowling at me. Souls are not in a rigid bureaucratic environment. We are allowed to make mistakes in judgment and learn from them. Dr. N. I have the impression you think the average soul is better off living one life at a time. Subject, I would say yes in most instances, but there are other motivations to cause us to speed up incarnations. Dr. N. Such as? Subject, amused. The rewards for bunching up lives can allow for more reflection out of incarnation. Dr. N. You mean the rest periods between lives might last longer for us after concurrent lives? Subject, smiles. Sure. It takes longer to reflect on two lives than one. Dr. N. Nentham. I just have a couple more questions on the mechanics of soul splitting. How do you see the manner in which you divide your soul energy into various parts? Subject. We are, as particles, of energized units. We originated out of one unit. Dr. N. What was the original unit? Subject. The maker. Dr. N. Does each part of your soul remain intact, complete within itself? Subject. Yes, it does. Dr. N. Do all parts of our social energy go out of the spirit world when we incarnate? Subject. Part of us never leaves since we do not totally separate from the Maker. Dr. N. What does the part that remains in the spirit world do while we are on Earth in one or more bodies? Subject. It is more dormant, waiting to be rejoined to the rest of our energy. Most of my colleagues who work with past life clients have listened to overlapping time chronologies from people living on Earth in two places at once. Occasionally there are three or more parallel lives. Souls in almost any stage of development are capable of living multiple physical lives, but I really don't see much of this in my cases. Many people feel the idea of souls having the capacity to divide in the spirit world and then attaching to two or more human bodies is against all their preconceptions of a singular, individualized spirit. I confess that I too felt uncomfortable the first time a client told me about having parallel lives. I can understand why some people find the concept of soul duality perplexing, especially when faced with the further proposition that one soul may even be capable of living in different dimensions during the same relative time. What we must appreciate is, if our souls are all part of one great oversoul energy force which divides or extends itself to create our souls, then why shouldn't the offspring of this intelligent soul energy have the same capacity to detach and then recombine? Collecting information about spiritual activity from souls who are in the higher stages of development is sometimes frustrating. This is because the complex nature of memory and knowledge at these levels can make it difficult to sift out what these people recognize and won't tell me from what they really don't know. 
Case 22 was both knowledgeable and open to my questions. This case is compatible with other accounts in my files about the diversity of soul training in the spirit world. Dr. N. Nentham, I want to turn now to your activities in the spirit world when you are not so busy with earth incarnations, interacting in soul groups and learning to be a guide. Can you tell me of other spiritual areas in which you are occupied? Subject. Long pause. Yes, there are other areas. I know of them. Dr. N. How many? Subject. Cautiously. I can think of four. Dr. N. What would you call these areas of activity? Subject. The world without ego. The world of all-knowing. The world of creation and non-creation. And the world of altered time. Dr. N. Are they worlds which exist in our physical universe? Subject. One does. The rest are non-dimensional spheres of attention. Dr. N. All right. Let's start with the non-dimensional spheres. Are these three areas in the spirit world for the use of souls? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. Why do you call all these spiritual areas worlds? Subject. I see them as habitations for spiritual life. Dr. N. So three of them are mental worlds? Subject. Yes, that's what they are. Dr. N. What is the world without ego? Subject. It's the place of learning to be. Dr. N. I have heard of it expressed in different ways. Doesn't it involve the beginners? Subject. Yes. The newly created soul is there to learn who they are. It's the place of origin. Dr. N. Are the ego identities passed out at random? Or is there a choice for beginner souls? Subject. The new soul is not capable of choice. You acquire your character based upon the way your energy is... combined, put together for you. Dr. N. Is there some sort of spiritual inventory of characteristics that are assigned to souls? So much of one type, so much of another? Subject. Long pause. I think many factors are considered in the allocations of that which makes us who we are. What I do know is, once given, ego becomes a covenant between oneself and the givers. Dr. N. What does that mean? Subject. To do the best I can with who I am. Dr. N. So the purpose of this world is the distribution of soul identity by advanced beings? Subject. Yes, the new soul is pure energy with no real self yet. The world without ego provides you with a signature. Dr. N. Then why do you call it the world without ego? Subject. Because the newly created souls arrive with no ego. The idea of self has not come into the new soul's consciousness. It is here where the soul has offered meaning to its existence. Dr. N. And does the creation of souls with personhood go on continually? Subject. As far as I know, yes. Dr. N. I want you to answer this next question carefully for me. When you acquired your particular identity as a soul, did that automatically mean you were slated for earth incarnations in human form? Subject. Not specifically, no. Planets don't last forever. Dr. N. I wondered if certain types of souls have an affinity for specific forms of physical life in the universe. Subject. Pause. I won't argue against that. Dr. N. In your beginnings, Nentham, were you given the opportunity to choose other planetary hosts besides humans on Earth? Subject. Ah, as a new soul, the guides assist in those selections. I was drawn to human beings. Dr. N. Were you given other choices? Subject. Long pause. Yes. But it's not very clear at the moment. 
They usually start you on an easy world or two without much to do. Then I was offered service on this severe planet. Dr. N. Earth is considered severe? Subject. Yes. On some worlds you must overcome physical discomforts, even suffering. Others lean toward mental contests. Earth has both. We get kudos for doing well on the hard worlds. Smiling. We are called the adventurous ones by those who don't travel much. Dr. N. What really appeals to you about Earth? Subject. The kinship humans have for each other while they struggle against one another, competing and collaborating at the same time. Dr. N. Isn't that a contradiction? Subject. Laughs. That's what appeals to me. Mediating quarrels of a fallible race which has so much pride and need of self-respect. The human brain is rather unique, you know. Dr. N. How? Subject. Humans are egocentric, but vulnerable. They can make their character mean, and yet have a great capacity for kindness. There is weak and courageous behavior on Earth. It's always a push-me-pull-you tug-of-war going on with human values. This diversity suits my soul. Dr. N. What are some of the other things about human hosts which might appeal to the souls who are sent to Earth? Subject. Hmm. Those of us developing on Earth have a sanction to help humans know of the infinite beyond their life and to assist them in expressing true benevolence through their passion. Having a passion to fight for life, that's what is so worthwhile about humanity. Dr. N. Humans also have a great capacity for malevolence. Subject. That's part of the passion. But it's evolving, too. And when humans experience trouble, they can be at their best and are... quite noble. Dr. N. Perhaps it is the soul which fosters the positive characteristics you suggested. Subject. We try to enhance what is already there. Dr. N. Does any soul ever go back to the world without ego after they have once been there and acquired identity? Subject. Uncomfortable. Yes. But I don't want to get into that. Dr. N. Well, then we won't. But I have been told some souls do return if their conduct during physical assignments is consistently irregular. I have the impression they are considered defective and are returned to the factory for a kind of spiritual prefrontal lobotomy. Subject. Subject shakes his head with annoyance. I am offended by that description. Where did you get such a notion? These souls who have developed severe obstacles to improvement are mended by the restoration of positive energy. Dr. N. Is this procedure just for Earth souls? Subject. No. Young souls from everywhere may require restoration as a last resort. Dr. N. Are these restored spirits then allowed to return to their respective groups and eventually go back to incarnating on physical worlds? Subject. Sighs deeply. Yes. Dr. N. How would you compare the world without ego to the world of all-knowing? Subject. They are opposites. This world is not for young souls. Dr. N. Have you been to the world of all-knowing? Subject. No, I am not ready. I am only aware of it as a place we strive for. Dr. N. What do you know about this spiritual area? Subject. Long pause. It is a place of contemplation. The ultimate mental world of planning and design. I can tell you little about this sphere, except it is the final destination of all thought. The senses of all living things are coordinated here. Dr. N. Then the world of all-knowing is abstract in the highest form? Subject. Yes, it's about blending content with form, the rational with ideals. It is a dimension where the realization of all our hopes and dreams is possible. Dr. N. Well, if you can't go there yet, how come you know about it? Subject. We get 
glimpses as an incentive to encourage us to make that final effort to finish our work and join the masters. The foundation of the spirit world is a place of knowing and has been alluded to under different names by clients. I am given only bare references to this universal absolute because even my advanced subjects have no direct experience there. All souls are anxious to reach and be absorbed by this nucleus, especially as they draw closer and are enticed by what little they can see. I'm afraid the world of all-knowing can only be fully understood by a non-reincarnating soul above level five. Dr. N. If the world without ego and the world of all-knowing are at opposite ends of a soul's experience, then where does the world of altered time fall? Subject. This sphere is available to all souls because it represents their own physical world. In my case, it is Earth. Dr. N. Oh, this must be the physical dimension you told me about. Subject. No, the sphere of Earth is only simulated for my use. Dr. N. Then all souls in the spirit world wouldn't study the same simulated world? Subject. No. Each of us studies our own geographical planet where we incarnate. They are physically real, temporarily. Dr. N. And you don't physically live on this simulated world which appears as Earth? You only use it? Subject. Yes, that's right, for training purposes. Dr. N. Why do you call this third sphere the world of altered time? Subject. Because we can change time sequences to study specific events. Dr. N. What is the basic purpose of doing this? Subject. To improve my decisions for life. This study makes me more discriminating and prepares me for the world of all-knowing. Note. Subjects frequently use the term world to describe non-physical spatial work areas. These regions can be tiny or indescribably large in relation to the soul and may involve different dimensions. I believe there are separate realities for different learning experiences outside the restrictions of time. The coexistence of past, present, and future time in spiritual settings suggested by this case will be explored further in the next two chapters with cases 23 and 25. Dr. N. We haven't talked about the world of creation and non-creation. This must be the three-dimensional physical world you spoke of earlier. Subject. Yes, and we enjoy using it as well. Dr. N. Is this world intended for the use of all souls? Subject. No, it is not. I'm just starting to apply myself there. I am considered a newcomer. Dr. N. Well, before we get into that, I want to ask you if this physical world is the same as Earth. Subject. No, it is a little different. It's larger and somewhat colder. There is less water, fewer oceans, but similar. Dr. N, is this planet further from its sun than Earth is from our sun? Subject, yes. Dr. N, if I could call this physical world Earth 2, since it seems to be geographically similar to the Earth we know, would it be near Earth 1 in the sky? Subject, no. Dr. N, where is Earth 2 in relation to Earth 1? Subject, pause. I can't tell you. Dr. N. Is Earth 2 in our Milky Way galaxy? Subject. Long pause. No. I think it's further away. Dr. N. Could I see the galaxy Earth 2 is located in with a telescope from my backyard? Subject. I would think so. Dr. N. Would you say the galaxy containing this physical world is shaped like a spiral as our galaxy, or is it elliptical? How would it look in a telescope from a long way off? Subject. As a great extended chain with a troubled expression. I can't tell you more. Note. As an amateur stargazer who uses a large reflector telescope designed for deep sky objects, 
I am always inquisitive when a session takes an astronomical turn. Client responses to these kinds of questions usually fall short of my expectations. I am never sure if this is due to blocking by guides or the subject's lack of a physical frame of reference between Earth and the rest of our universe. Dr. N. I throw out a leading question. I suppose you go to Earth too to reincarnate with some sort of intelligent being? Subject. Loudly. No. That's just what we don't want to do there. Dr. N. When do you go to Earth too? Subject. Between my lives on this Earth. Dr. N. Why do you go to Earth too? Subject. We go there to create and just enjoy ourselves as free spirits. Dr. N. And you don't bother the inhabitants of Earth too? Subject. Enthusiastically. There are no people. It's so peaceful. We roam among the forests, the deserts, and over oceans with no responsibilities. Dr. N. What is the highest form of life on Earth too? Subject. Evasive. Oh, small animals, without much intelligence. Dr. N. Do animals have souls? Subject. Yes, all living things do, but they are very simple fragments of mind energy. Dr. N. Has your soul and that of your friends evolved from using lower forms of physical life on Earth-1 after your creation? Subject. We don't know for sure, but none of us thinks so. Dr. N. Why not? Subject. Because intelligent energy is arranged by a, a precedence of life. Plants, insects, reptiles, each is in a family of souls. Dr. N. And all the categories of living things are separated from each other? Subject. No. The Maker's energy joins the units of every living thing in existence. Dr. N. Are you involved with this element of creation? Subject. Startled. Oh, no! Dr. N. Well, who is selected to visit Earth too? Subject. Those of us who are connected with Earth come here. This is a vacation spot compared to Earth. Dr. N. Why? Subject. There is no fighting, bickering, or striving for supremacy. There is a pristine atmosphere and all life is... quiet. This place gives us an incentive to return to Earth and make it more peaceful too. Dr. N. Well, I do see how this Garden of Eden would allow you to rest and be carefree. But you also said you come here to create. Subject. Yes, we do. Dr. N. It is no accident, then, that souls from Earth come to a world that is so similar geographically? Subject. That's right. Dr. N. Do other souls, who are not Earth-bound, go to physical worlds which resemble those planets where they incarnate? Subject. Yes. Younger worlds with simpler organisms, to learn to create without any intelligent life around. Dr. N. Go on. Subject. We can experiment with creation and see it developing here. It's as if you were in a lab where you can form physical things from your energy. Dr. N. Do these physical things resemble what you might see on Earth-1? Subject. Yes, only on Earth. That's why I am here. Dr. N. Start with your arrival on Earth-2 and explain to me what your soul does first. Subject. Balks at my question and then finally says, I'm not very good. Note. Since this subject is experiencing resistance, I take a few minutes for reconditioning and end with the following. On the count of three, you will feel more relaxed about telling me what you and Idis consider appropriate for my knowledge. One, two, three. I repeat my question. Subject. I look to see what I am supposed to make on the ground in front of me. Then I mold the object in my mind and try and create the same thing with small doses of energy. The teachers assist us with control. 
I'm supposed to see my mistakes and make corrections. Dr. N. Who are the teachers? Subject. Idis and Mulkovgil. Subject's highly advanced guide. And there are other instructors around. I don't know them very well. Dr. N. Try to be as clear as possible. What exactly are you doing? Subject. We form things. Dr. N. Living things? Subject. I'm not ready for that yet. I experiment with the basic elements. You know, hydrogen and oxygen. To create planetary substance. Rocks, air, water, keeping everything very small. Dr. N. Do you actually create the basic elements of our universe? Subject. No, I just use the elements available. Dr. N. In what way? Subject. I take the basic elements and charge them with impulses from my energy. And they can change. Dr. N. Change into what? Subject. Simply. I'm good with rocks. Dr. N. How do you form rocks with your energy? Subject. Oh, by learning to heat and cool dust to make it hard. Dr. N. Do you make the minerals in the dust? Subject. They do that for you. The teachers give us that stuff. Gas vapors for water making and so on. Dr. N. I want to understand this clearly. Your work consists of learning to create by causing heat, pressure, and cooling from your energy flow? Subject. That's about right. By alternating our currents of energy radiation. Dr. N. So you don't actually produce the substance of rock and water in some chemical way? Subject. No, like I told you. My job is to transform things by mixing what I am given. I play with the frequency and dosages of my energy. It's tricky, but not too complicated. Dr. N. Not complicated. I thought nature did those things. Subject. Laughs. Who do you think nature is? Dr. N. Well, who creates the basic elements of your experiments? The primary substances of physical matter. Subject. The maker. And those creating on a grander scale than me. Dr. N. Well, in a sense, you are creating inanimate objects such as rocks. Subject. Hmm. It's more our trying to copy what we see in front of us. What we know. As an afterthought. I'm getting into plants, but I can't do them yet. Dr. N. And you start small, experimenting until you get better? Subject. That's it. We copy things and compare them against the original, so we can make larger models. Dr. N. This all sounds like souls playing as children in a sandbox with toys. Subject. Smiles. We are children. Directing an energy flow resembles the sculpturing of clay. Dr. N. Are the other members of this creative training class from your original cluster group? Subject. Some are. Most come from all over, the spirit world. But they have all incarnated on Earth. Dr. N. Does everyone make the same things as you do? Subject. Well, of course, some of us are better with certain things, but we help each other. The teachers come around and give us tips and advice on how to improve, but... Stops. Dr. N. But what? Subject. Sheepishly. If I am clumsy and do a bad job... I disassemble some creations without showing them to Idis. Dr. N. Give me an example. Subject. Plants. I don't apply my energy delicately enough to produce the proper chemical conversions. Dr. N. You are not good with the formation of plant life? Subject. No, so I undo my abominations. Dr. N. Is this what you mean by uncreation you can destroy energy subject 
Energy can't be destroyed. We reassemble it and start over using different combinations. Dr. N. I don't see why the Creator needs your help in creating. Subject. For our benefit. We participate in these exercises so that when our work is judged to be of quality, hopefully we can make real contributions to life. Dr. N. If we are all working up the ladder of development as souls, Nentham, I am left with the impression the spirit world is one huge organizational pyramid with a supreme authority of power at the top. Subject, size. No, you are wrong. It is not a pyramid. We are all threads in the same long piece of fabric. We are all woven into it. Dr. N., it's hard for me to visualize fabric when there are so many levels of competency for souls. Subject. Think of it as a moving continuum rather than souls being in brackets of highs and lows. Dr. N. I always think of souls moving up in their existence. Subject. I know you do, but consider us moving across. Dr. N. Give me something I can picture in my mind. Subject. It's as if we are all part of a universal train on a flat track of existence. Most of the souls on Earth are in one car moving along the track. Dr. N. Are all other souls in different cars? Subject. Yes, but all on the same track. Dr. N. Where are the conductors, such as Idis? Subject. They move back and forth between the connected cars, but sit closer to the engine. Dr. N. Where is the engine? Subject. The maker? Up front, naturally. Dr. N. Can you see the engine from your car? Subject. Laughs at me. No, but I can smell the smoke. I can feel the engine rumbling along and I can hear the motor. Dr. N. It would be nice if all of us were closer to the engine. Subject. Ultimately, we will be. From what I am able to determine, souls are expected to begin familiarizing themselves with the forces of creation by the time they are solidly established in level three. Exposure to plant photosynthesis takes place before student souls work up the organic scale of life. I am told that early creation training consists of souls learning relationships between substances to develop the ability of unifying their energy with different values in the elements. The formation of inanimate to animate objects from the simple to the complex is a long, slow process. Students are encouraged to create miniature planetary microhabitats for a given set of organisms which can adapt to certain environmental conditions. With practice comes improvement, but not until they approach level five do my clients begin to feel they might actually contribute to the development of living things. We will hear more about this with case 23. However, many of my clients won't or can't talk about creation. Some souls seem to have a natural gift for working with energy in their creation classes. My cases indicate ability in creation assignments does not mean a soul is at the same level of advancement in all other areas of the spiritual curricula. A soul may be a good technician in harnessing the forces of creation, but lack the subtle techniques of a competent guide. Perhaps this is why I have been given the impression that the highly advanced soul is allowed to specialize. In the previous chapter, I explained some benefits of soul solitude, and the last case gave us another example. Spiritual experience is not easily translated into human language. Case 22 talks about the world of altered time as a means of transient planetary study. To someone in trance, it is the timeless mental world that is true reality, while all else is an illusion created for various benefits. Other subjects at about the same level call this sphere the space of transformation, or simply rooms of recreation. Here, I'm told, 
souls are able to meld their energy into animate and inanimate objects created for learning and pleasure. One subject said to me, I think of what I want and it happens. I know I'm being assisted. We can be anything familiar to our past experiences. For instance, souls can become rocks to capture the essence of density, trees for serenity, water for a flowing cohesiveness, butterflies for freedom and beauty, and whales for power and immensity. People deny these actions represent former earthly transmigrations. I have also learned souls may become amorphous without substance or texture and totally integrate into a particular feeling such as compassion to sharpen their sensitivity. Some subjects tell of being mystical spirits of nature including figures I associate with folklore such as elves, giants and mermaids. Personal contact with strange mythological beasts are mentioned as well. These accounts are so vivid it is hard for me to simply label them as metaphoric. Are the old folk tales of many races pure superstition or manifestations of shared soul experience? I have the sense that many of our legends are the sympathetic memories of souls carried from other places to earth long ago. 11. The Advanced Soul People who possess souls which are both old and highly advanced are scarce. Although I haven't had the opportunity to regress many blues in level 5, they are always stimulating to work with because of their comprehension and far-reaching spiritual consciousness. The fact is, a person whose maturity is this high doesn't seek out a regression therapist to resolve life plan conflicts. In most cases, level fives are here as incarnated guides. Having mastered the fundamental issues most of us wrestle with daily, the advanced soul is more interested in making small refinements towards specific tasks. We may recognize them when they appear as public figures, such as a Mother Teresa. However, it is more usual for the advanced soul to go about their good work in a quiet, unassuming manner. Without displaying self-indulgence, their fulfillment comes from improving the lives of other people. They focus less on institutional matters and more on enhancing individual human values. Nevertheless, level fives are also practical, and so they are likely to be found working in a cultural mainstream, which allows them to influence people and events. I have been asked if most people who are sensitive, aesthetic, and particularly right-brained have advanced souls, since individuals with these characteristics often appear to be at odds with the wrongs of an imperfect world. I see no correlation here. Being emotional, appreciating beauty, or having extrasensory impressions, including psychic talent, does not necessarily denote an advanced soul. The mark of an advanced spirit is one who has patience with society and shows extraordinary coping skills. Most prominent is their exceptional insight. This is not to say life has no karmic pitfalls for them. Otherwise, the level five probably wouldn't be here at all. They may be found in all walks of life, but are frequently in the helping professions or combating social injustice in some fashion. The advanced soul radiates composure, kindness, and understanding toward others. Not being motivated by self-interest, they may disregard their own physical needs and live in reduced circumstances. The individual I have chosen to represent the level five soul is a woman in her mid-thirties who works for a large medical treatment facility specializing in chemical substance abuse. I was introduced to this woman by a colleague who told me of her skill in guiding recovering drug addicts into an improved state of self-awareness. At our first meeting, I was struck by the woman's expression of serenity while surrounded by chaotic emergencies at her place of employment. She was tall and excessively thin, with flaming red hair which stuck out in all directions. Although warm and friendly, there was about her an air of impenetrability. Her clear, luminous gray eyes were those of one who sees small things unnoticed by ordinary folk. 
I felt she was looking into rather than at me. My colleague suggested the three of us have lunch, because this woman was interested in my studies of the spirit world. She told me that she had never been hypnotically regressed, but there was the sense of a long spiritual genealogy through her own meditations. She thought our meeting was no accident on her own learning path, and we came to an agreement to explore her spiritual knowledge. A few weeks later, she arrived at my office. Clearly, this woman had no compelling desire for a long chronology of past life history. I decided to get a brief sketch of her earliest lives on Earth to use as a springboard into superconscious memories. She rapidly entered into a deep trance and made instant contact with her inner self. Almost at once, I found this woman's span of incarnation staggering, going far back into the distant past of human life on Earth. Touching on her earliest memories, I came to the conclusion her first lives occurred at the beginning of the last warm interglacial period, which lasted from 130,000 to 70,000 years ago, before the last great ice age spread over the planet. During the warmer climate of the Middle Paleolithic period of Earth's history, my subject described living in moist, subtropical savannas near hunting, fishing, and plant-gathering areas. Later, some 50,000 years ago, when continental sheets of ice had again changed Earth's climate, she spoke of living in caves and enduring bitter cold. Leaping rapidly over large blocks of time, I found her physical appearance changing from a slightly bent to a more erect posture. As we moved forward in time, I directed her to look into pools of water and feel her body while reporting back to me. Her sloping forehead became more vertical over thousands of years in different bodies. Supraorbital ridges above the eyes grew less pronounced, as did body hair and the massive jaws of archaic man. In many lives as both men and women, I was given enough information on habitat, the use of fire, tools, clothes, food, and ritualistic tribal practices for rough anthropological dating. Paleontologists have estimated Homo erectus, an ape-like ancestor of modern humans, appearing at least 1.7 million years ago. Have souls been incarnating on Earth for this long, utilizing the bodies of these primitive bipeds we call hominids? A few of my more advanced clients declare that highly advanced souls, who specialize in seeking out suitable hosts for young souls, evaluated life on Earth for over a million years. My impression is these examiner souls found the early hominid brain cavity and restricted voice box to be inadequate for soul development earlier than some 200,000 years ago. Archaic Homo sapiens, whom we call humans, evolved several hundred thousand years ago. Within the last 100,000 years, we find two clear signs of spiritual consciousness and communication. These are burial practices and ritualistic art, as found in carved totems and rock drawings. There is no anthropological evidence that these practices existed on Earth before Neanderthal peoples. Souls eventually made us human, not the reverse. One of my advanced subjects remarked, Souls have seeded the Earth in different cycles. A composite of information collected from a wide range of clients suggests to me that the land masses we know today deviate from earlier continents, drowned perhaps by cataclysmic volcanic or magnetic upheavals. For instance, the Azores and the Atlantic Ocean have been said to represent the tops of mountains of the submerged continent of Atlantis. Indeed, I have had subjects discuss being in ancient lands on Earth that I cannot identify with modern geography. Thus, it is possible souls existed in bodies more than advanced Homo erectus, who died out about a quarter of a million years ago, with the fossilized evidence hidden from us today by geological change. However, this hypothesis means the physical evolution of humans was an up-down, up-down affair, which I think is unlikely. I now moved my subject into an African life around 9,000 years ago, which she said was an important milestone in her advancement. This was the last life she was to spend with her guide, Kumara. Kumara was an advanced soul herself at the time of this life, 
counseling a benevolent tribal chief as his influential wife. I tentatively located their land as the highlands of Ethiopia. Apparently, my subject had known Kumara in a number of earlier lives, covering thousands of years during Kumara's final incarnations on Earth. Their association in human form ended when my subject died, saving Kumara's life on a riverboat by throwing herself in front of an enemy spear. Full of love, Kumara still appears to this subject as a large woman with skin of polished mahogany and a shock of white hair crowned by a headdress of feathers. She is practically nude, except for a strip of animal hide around her ample middle. On Kumara's neck hangs a garish bunch of multicolored stones, which she sometimes jiggles in my subject's ear to get her attention during dreams in the middle of the night. Kamora teaches by a technique of flashing symbolistic memories of prior lessons already learned in past lives. Old solutions to problems are mixed with new hypothetical choices in the form of metaphoric picture puzzles. By these means, Kumara tests her students' considerable storehouse of knowledge during meditations and dreams. I glanced at my watch. There was no more time for background information if I was going to allow for exploration of this woman's afterlife experiences. Rapidly, I took her into superconsciousness, anticipating some interesting spiritual disclosures. She would not disappoint me. Case 23 Dr. N. What is your spiritual name? Subject. Thies. Dr. N. And your spiritual guide kept her African name of Kumara. Subject. For me, yes. Dr. N. What do you look like in the spirit world? Subject. A glowing fragment of light. Dr. N. What exactly is the color of your energy? Subject. Sky blue. Dr. N. Does your light have flecks of another color in it? Subject. Pause. Some gold. Not much. Dr. N. How about Kumara's energy color? Subject. It's violet. Dr. N. How does light and color identify the quality of a soul's spiritual attainment? Subject. The intensity of mental power increases with the darker phases of light. Dr. N. Where does the highest intensity of intelligent light energy originate from? Subject. The knowledge by which the energy of darker light is extended to us comes from the source. Our light is attached to the source. Dr. N. When you say source, you mean God? Subject. That word has been misused. Dr. N. How? Subject. By too much personalizing, which makes the source less than it is. Dr. N. What's wrong with us doing that? Subject. It takes the liberty of making the source too... human. Although we are all part of its oneness. Dr. N. Thies, I want you to reflect on the source as we talk about other aspects of soul life and the spirit world. Later, I will ask you more about this oneness. Now let's go back to the energy manifestations of souls. Why do spirits display two black glowing cavities for eyes when not showing their human forms? It seems so spooky to me. Subject laughs and is more relaxed. That's how Earth's legends of ghosts came about, from these memories. Our energy mass is not uniform. The eyes you speak of represent a more concentrated intensity of thought. Dr. N., well, if the mists about ghosts are not so fanciful after all, then these black eye sockets must be useful extensions of their energy. Subject. Rather than eyes, they are windows to old bodies and all the physical extensions of former selves. This blackness is a concentration of our presence. We communicate by absorbing the energy presence of each other. Dr. N., when you return to the spirit world, 
Do you have energy contact with other souls who may look like ghosts? Subject. Yes. And appearance is a matter of individual preference. Of course, there is always a multitude of thought waves around me, mingling with my returning energy, but I avoid too much contact. Dr. N. Why? Subject. It is not necessary for me to make attachments here. I will be alone for a while to contemplate and sort out any mistakes from my last incarnation, before talking to Kamara. Note. This statement is typical of advanced souls returning to the spirit world, mentioned earlier in Case 9. However, this soul is so advanced, she will have no deliberations with her guide until much later, and upon her request. Dr. N. Perhaps we should talk about older souls for a minute. Does Kumara incarnate on Earth anymore? Subject. No, she doesn't. Dr. N. Do you know others like Kumara who are here during the early times on Earth and don't come back anymore? Subject. Cautiously. A few. Yes. Many got on Earth early and got off before I came. Dr. N. Did any stay? Subject. What do you mean? Dr. N. Advanced souls who keep coming back to life on Earth when they could stay in the spirit world. Subject. Oh, you mean the sages. Dr. N. Yes, the sages. Tell me about them. This is a new term for me, but I often pretend to know more than I do with advanced souls to elicit information. Subject. With admiration. They are the true watchers of Earth, you know to be here and keep watch over what is going on. Dr. N. Has highly advanced souls who continue to incarnate? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. Don't the sages get tired of still hanging around Earth? Subject. They choose to stay and help people directly because they are dedicated to Earth. Dr. N. Where are these sages? Subject. Wistfully. They live simple lives. I first came to know some of them thousands of years ago. Today it's hard to see them. They don't like cities much. Dr. N. Are there many of them? Subject. No. They live in small communities or out in the open. In the deserts and mountains, in simple dwellings. They wander about, too. Dr. N. How does one recognize them? Subject. Size. Most people don't. They were known as the oracles of truth in earlier times on Earth. Dr. N. I know this sounds pragmatic, but wouldn't these old, highly developed souls be more useful helping humankind in positions of international leadership, rather than being hermits? Subject. Who said they were hermits? They prefer to be with the common people who are most affected by the movers and shakers. Dr. N. What is the feeling one gets when meeting a sage on Earth? Subject. Ah, you get a special presence. Their power of understanding and the advice they give you is so wise. They do live simply. Material things mean nothing to them. Dr. N. Are you interested in this sort of service, Thies? Subject. Hmm. No, they are saints. I welcome the time when I can stop incarnating. Dr. N. Perhaps the word sage could also be applied to souls like Kumara, or even with the entities to whom she turns for knowledge. Subject. Pause. No, they are different. They are beyond the sages. We call them the old ones. Note. I would place these beings beyond level six. Dr. N. Are there many old ones working with souls at Kumara's level and above? Subject. I don't think so, compared to the rest of us, but we feel their influence. Dr. N., what do you feel in their presence? Subject, pensive. Ah, uh, concentrated power of enlightenment and guidance. Dr. N., could the old ones be embodiments of the source itself? Subject, it is not for me to say, but I don't think so yet. They must be close to the source. The old ones represent the purest elements of thought, engaging in the planning and arranging of 
substances. Dr. N, could you clarify a bit more what you mean by these highly placed souls being close to the source? Subject, vaguely. Only that they must be close to conjunction. Dr. N, does Kumara ever talk about these entities who help her? Subject, to me, only a little. She aspires to be one of them, as we all do. Dr. N, is she getting close to the old ones in knowledge? Subject, faintly. She approaches as I approach her. It is slow assimilating with the source because we are not complete. Once the duties of a guide are fully established for the advancing soul, it is necessary for these entities to juggle two balls. Besides completing their own unfinished business with continued, though less frequent, incarnations, they must also help others while in a discarnated state. Please talk to me about this aspect of her soul life. Dr. N. When you are back in the spirit world and come out of your self-imposed isolation, what do you ordinarily do then? Subject. I join with members of my company. Dr. N. How many souls are in your company? Subject. Nine. Dr. N. Jumping to the next conclusion too quickly. Oh, so the ten of you are a group of souls under the leadership of Kumara? Subject. No. They are my responsibility. Dr. N. Then these nine entities are students whom you teach? Subject. Hmm. You could say that. Dr. N. And they are all in one group, cluster, which I assume is your company? Subject. No, my company is made up of two different groups. Dr. N. Why is that? Subject. They are in different progressions, levels. Dr. N. And yet you are the spiritual teacher for all nine? Subject. I prefer to call myself a watcher. Three of my company are also watchers. Dr. N. Well, who are the other six? Subject, matter-of-factly. People who don't watch. Dr. N. I want to clarify this using my terms, if you will, Thies. If you are a senior watcher, three of your company must be what I would call junior guides? Subject. Yes, but the words senior and junior, that portrays us as authoritarian, which we are not. Dr. N. My intention is not to denote rank. For me, it is just an easy identification of responsibility. Consider the word senior as meaning an advanced teacher. I would call Kumara a master teacher or possibly an educational director. Subject shrugs. That's okay, I suppose. As long as director doesn't mean dictator. Dr. N. It doesn't. Now, Thies, cast your mind to a place where you can see the energy colors of all your company. What do the six souls who are not watchers look like? Subject smiles. Dirty snowballs. Dr. N. If they are white in tone, what about the rest? Subject, pause. Well, two are rather yellowish. Dr. N, we are one short. What about the ninth member? Subject, that's An Ross. He is doing quite well. Dr. N, describe his energy color. Subject, he is turning bluish. An excellent watcher. He will be leaving me soon. Dr. N. Let's go to the opposite end of your company. What member are you most concerned about and why? Subject. Ojana Wynn. She has the conviction for many lives that love and trust only bring hurt. Musing. She has fine qualities which I want to bring out, but this attitude is holding her back. Dr. N. Ojana Wynn is developing more slowly than the rest? Subject. Protectively. Don't misunderstand. I am proud of her effort. She has great sensitivity and integrity, which I like. She just requires more of my attention. Dr. N. As a watcher, teacher, what is the one quality which An Ross has acquired, which you want to see in Ojanawin? Subject. No hesitation. 
adaptability to change. Dr. N. I am curious if the nine members of your company advance in a rather uniform way together under your teaching. Subject. That's totally unrealistic. Dr. N. Why? Subject. Because there are differences in character and integrity. Dr. N. Well, if learning rates are different between souls because of character and integrity, how does this equate with the mental capabilities of the human brain a soul selects? Subject. It doesn't. I was speaking of motivation. On Earth, we use many variations of the physical brain in the course of our expansion. However, each soul is driven by its integrity. Dr. N. Is this what you mean by a soul having character? Subject. Yes, and the intensity of desire is part of character. Dr. N. If character is the identity of a soul, where does desire come in? Subject. The drive to excel is internal to each soul, but this too can fluctuate between lives. Dr. N. So where does a soul's integrity fit into this? Subject. The extension of desire. Integrity is the desire to be honest about self and motives to such an extent that full awareness of the path to the source is possible. Dr. N. If all basic intelligent energy is the same, why are souls different in their character and integrity? Subject. Because their experiences with physical life change them and this is intentional. By that change, new ingredients are added to the collective intelligence of every soul. Dr. N. And this is what incarnation on Earth is all about? Subject. Incarnation is an important tool, yes. Some souls are driven more than others to expand and achieve their potential. But all of us will do so in the end. Being in many physical bodies in different settings expands the nature of our real self. Dr. N. And this sort of self-actualization of the soul identity is the purpose of life on our world? Subject. On any world. Dr. N. Well, if each soul is preoccupied with self, doesn't this explain why we have a world of self-centered people? Subject. No, you misinterpret. Fulfillment is not cultivating self for selfish means but allowing for integration with others in life. That also shows character and integrity. This is ethical conduct. Dr. N. Does Ojanawin have less honesty than Anras? Subject. Pause. I'm afraid she does engage in self-deception. Dr. N. I wonder how you can function effectively as a spiritual guide for the nine members of your company and still incarnate on Earth to finish your own lessons. Subject. It used to affect my concentration to some extent, but now there is no conflict. Dr. N. Do you have to separate your soul energy to accomplish this? Subject. Yes. This capacity of souls allows for the management of both. Being on Earth also permits me to directly assist a member of my company and help myself at the same time. Dr. N. The idea that souls can divide themselves is not an easy thing for me to conceptualize. Subject. Your use of the term divide is not quite accurate. Every part of us is still whole. I'm only saying it does take some getting used to at first, since you manage more than one program at a time. Dr. N. So your effectiveness as a teacher is not diminished by having multiple activities. Subject. Not in the least. Dr. N. Would you consider the major thrust of your instruction to be on Earth with your human body or in the spirit world as a free entity? Subject. They are two different settings. My instruction is diversified but no less effective. Dr. N. But your approach to a company member would be different depending upon the setting. Subject. Yes, it would. Dr. N. Wouldn't you say the spirit world is the main center for learning? Subject. It is the center for evaluation and analysis. But souls do rest. Dr. N. When your students are living on Earth, 
Do they know you are their guide and are with them always? Subject laughs, some more than others, but they all sense my influence at one time or another. Dr. N. Thies, you were on Earth with me right now as a woman. Are you also able to be in contact with other members of your company? Subject, I told you, yes. Dr. N., what I'm getting at is this. Isn't teaching by example difficult when your Earth visits are rather infrequent these days? Subject, if I came too often and worked with them directly as one human being to another, I would be interfering with their natural unfolding. Dr. N., do you have the same reservations about interference as a teacher operating from the spirit world in a discarnate state? Subject. Yes, I do, although the techniques are different. Dr. N. For mental contact? Subject. Yes. I would like to know more about the ability of spiritual teachers to contact their students. What exactly do you do from the spirit world to comfort or advise one of the nine company members on Earth? Subject. No answer. Dr. N. Coaxing her. Do you know what I'm asking? How do you implant ideas? Subject. Finally. I'm unable to tell you. Note. I suspect blocking here, but I can't complain. So far, Thies has been liberal with information, and so has her guide. I decide to stop the session for a minute to appeal directly to Kamara. It is a speech I have given before. Dr. N. Kamara, permit me to reason with you through Thies. My work here is intended for good. By questioning your disciple, I wish to add to my knowledge of healing and bring people closer to the higher creative power available within themselves. My larger mission is to combat the fear of death by offering people understanding about the nature of their souls and their spiritual home. Will you aid me in this endeavor? Subject. Thies answers me in an odd tone of voice. We know who you are. Dr. N., then would you both assist me? Subject. We will talk to you at our discretion. Note. This tells me if I exceed the undefined boundaries of these two guides with an intrusive question, it won't be answered. Dr. N. All right, Thies. On the count of three, you will feel more comfortable talking to me about how souls function as guides. Begin by telling me in what way a company member on Earth can signal to get your attention. One, two, three. I snap my fingers for added effect. Subject, after a long pause. First, they have to calm their minds and focus attention away from their immediate surroundings. Dr. N., how would they do this? Subject, by silence. Reaching inward to fasten on their inner voice. Dr. N., is this how one calls for spiritual help? Subject, Yes, at least to me. They must expand upon their inner consciousness to engage me on a central thought. Dr. N., on you or on the specific problem which is bothering them? Subject, they must reach out beyond what is troubling them in order to be receptive to me. That's difficult when they don't remain calm. Dr. N., do all nine company members have about the same abilities to reach you for help? Subject. No, they don't. Dr. N. Perhaps Ojanawin has the most problems? Subject. Hmm. She is one of those that does. Dr. N. Why? Subject. For me, getting the signals is easy. It's harder for people on Earth. The energy of directed thought must override human emotion. Dr. N. Within a spirit world framework. How do you pick up the messages of just your company out of billions of souls who are sending out distress signals to other guides? Subject. I know instantly. All watchers do because people send out their own individual patterns of thought. Dr. N. Like a vibrational code in a field of thought particles? Subject. Laughing. You could describe an energy pattern that way, I guess. Dr. N. Okay. Then how would you reach back to someone in need of guidance? Subject grins. By whispering answers into their ear. Dr. N. Lightly. 
Is that what a friendly spirit does with a troubled mind on earth? Subject. It depends. Dr. N. On what? Are teacher spirits rather indifferent with the day-to-day -day problems of humans? Subject. Not indifferent, or we wouldn't communicate. We gauge each situation. We know life is transitory. We are more detached. Because without human bodies, we are unencumbered by the immediacy of human emotion. Dr. N. But when the situation does call for spiritual guidance, what do you do? Subject, gravely. As watchers in the stillness, we recognize the amount of turbulence from the wake of troubled thought. Then we carefully merge with it and gently touch the mind. Dr. N., Please describe this connection process further. Subject. Pause. It's a slipstream of thought, which is usually turbulent rather than smooth from someone in distress. I was awkward at first, and I still don't have Kamara's skill. One must enter with subtlety to wait for the best receptivity. Dr. N., how can a watcher be awkward? You have had thousands of years of experience. Subject. Communicators are not all the same. Watchers, too, have a variety of abilities. If one of my company is in crisis, physically hurt, sad, anxious, resentful, they send out great amounts of uncontrolled negative energy which alerts me, but exhausts them. This is the challenge of a watcher, to know when and how to communicate. When people want immediate relief, they may not be in the proper mode for reflection. Dr. N. Well, in terms of abilities, can you tell me how you were awkward as an inexperienced guide? Subject. I wanted to rush in too fast to help without coordinating the patterns of thought we talked about. People can go numb. You don't get through to them when they have intense grief, for example. You are shut out of a cluttered mind when attentions are distracted and thought energy is scattered all about. Dr. N. Do the nine members of your company sense your intrusion into their minds, following a cry to you for help? Subject. Watchers are not supposed to intrude. It's more of a... soft coupling. I implant ideas which they assume as inspiration to try and give them peace. Dr. N. What single thing do you have the most problem with during communications with people on Earth? Subject. Fear. Dr. N. Would you enlarge on that? Subject. I have to be careful not to spoil my people by making life too easy for them. To let them work out most of their difficulties without jumping right in. They only suffer more if a watcher moves in too quickly before this is done. Kamara is an expert at this. Dr. N. Is she ultimately responsible for you and your company? Subject. Well, yes, we are all under her influence. Dr. N. Do you ever see any of your own peer members around? I'm thinking of associates at your level of attainment with whom you can confer about teaching methods. Subject. Oh, you mean with those I grew up with here? Dr. N. Yes. Subject. Yes, three in particular. Dr. N. And do they lead company groups themselves? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. Are these more advanced souls responsible for about the same number of souls as you? Subject. Um, yes. Except Waru. His company is more than double my own. He is good. Another company is being added to his workload. Dr. N. How many superior entities do you and your friends who are company leaders go to for advice and direction? Subject. One. We all go to Kamara to exchange observations and seek ways of improvement. Dr. N. How many souls like you and Waru does Kumara oversee? Subject. Oh, I couldn't know that. Dr. N. Try and give an estimate of the number. Subject, after reflection. At least fifty, probably more. Additional inquiries into Kamara's spiritual activities were fruitless, so I turned next to Thesa's creation training. 
Her experiences, which I have condensed, take us a little further than those training exercises described by Nentham in the last chapter. To those listeners with a scientific bent, I want to stress that when a subject is reporting to me about creation, their frame of reference is really not grounded in earth science. I have to make the best interpretations I can from the information provided. Dr. N. The curriculum for souls seems to have great variety, Thies. I want to go into another aspect of your training. Does your energy utilize the properties of light, heat, and motion in the creation of life? Subject, startled. Ah, uh, you know about that? Dr. N. What more can you tell me? Subject, only that I am familiar with this. Dr. N. I don't want to talk about anything which will make you uncomfortable, but I would appreciate your confirmation of certain biological effects resulting from the actions of souls. Subject hesitates. Oh, I don't think... Dr. N, I jump in quickly. What creation have you recently done which makes Kumara proud of you? Subject, without resistance. I am proficient with fish. Dr. N. I follow up with a deliberate exaggeration to keep her going. Oh, so you can create a whole fish with your mental energy? Subject, vexed. You must be kidding. Dr. N, then where do you start? Subject, with the embryos, of course. I thought you knew. Dr. N, just checking. When do you think you will be ready for mammals? Subject, no answer. Dr. N, Look, Thies, if you will try to cooperate with me for a few more minutes, I promise not to take long with my questions on this subject. Will you agree to that? Subject, pause. We will see. Dr. N. Okay. As a means of basic clarification, tell me what you actually do with your energy to develop life up to the stage of fish. Subject, reluctantly. We give instructions to organisms within the surrounding conditions. Dr. N, do you do this on one world or many in your training? Subject, more than one. Would not elaborate except to say these planets were Earth types. Dr. N, in what kind of environment are you working now? Subject, in oceans. Dr. N, with basic sea life such as algae and plankton? Subject, when I started. Dr. N, you mean before you worked up to the embryos of fish? Subject, yes. Dr. N, then when souls start to create forms of life, they begin with microorganisms? Subject, small cells, yes. And this is very difficult to learn. Dr. N, why? Subject, the cells of life. Our energy cannot become proficient unless we can direct it to alter molecules. Dr. N, then you are actually producing new chemical compounds by mixing the basic molecular elements of life by your energy flow? Subject, nods. Dr. N, can you be more explicit? Subject, no, I can't. Dr. N, let me try and sum this up, and please tell me if I am on the wrong track. A soul who becomes proficient with actually creating life must be able to split cells and give DNA instructions, and you do this by sending particles of energy into protoplasm? Subject. We must learn to do this, yes, coordinating it with a sun's energy. Dr. N, why? Subject because each sun has different energy effects on the worlds around them. Dr. N, then why would you interfere with what a sun would naturally do with its own energy on a planet? Subject, it is not interference. We examine new structures, mutations, to watch and see what is workable. We arrange substances for their most effective use with different suns. Dr. N, when a species of life evolves on a planet, are the environmental conditions for selection and adaptation natural? 
or are intelligent soul minds tinkering with what happens? Subject, evasively. Usually a planet hospitable to life has souls watching, and whatever we do is natural. Dr. N. How can souls watch and influence biological properties of growth evolving over millions of years on a primordial world? Subject. Time is not in Earth years for us. We use it to suit our experiments. Dr. N. Do you personally create suns in our universe? Subject. A full-scale sun? Oh no, that's way over my head and requires the powers of many. I generate only on a small scale. Dr. N. What can you generate? Subject. Ah. Small bundles of highly concentrated matter. Heated. Dr. N. But what does your work look like when you are finished? Subject. Small solar systems. Dr. N. Are your miniature suns and planets the size of rocks, buildings, the moon? What are we talking about here? Subject laughs. My suns are the size of basketballs, and the planets... Marbles. That's the best I can do. Dr. N. Why do you do this on a small scale? Subject. For practice. So I can make larger suns. After enough compression, the atoms explode and condense, but I can't do anything really big alone. Dr. N. What do you mean? Subject. We must learn to work together to combine our energy for the best results. Dr. N. Well, who does the full-size thermonuclear explosions which create physical universes and space itself? Subject. The source. The concentrated energy of the old ones. Dr. N. Oh, so the source has help? Subject. I think so. Dr. N. Why is your energy striving to create universal matter and more complex life when Kumara and the entities above her are already proficient? Subject. We are expected to join them, just as they wish to unite their accomplished energy with the old ones. Creation questions always evoke the issue of first cause. Was the exploding interstellar mass which caused the birth of our stars and planets an accident of nature or planned by an intelligent force? When I listen to subjects such as Thies, I ask myself why souls would be practicing the chain reactions of energy matter with models on a small scale, if they were not intending to make larger celestial bodies. I have had no subjects in level six and above to substantiate how they might carry the forces of creation further. It would seem if souls do progress, then entities at this level could be expected to involve themselves with the birthing of planets and the development of life forms capable of higher intelligence suitable for soul use. After pondering why less than perfect souls are associated with creation at all, I came to the following conclusion. All souls are given the opportunity to participate in the development of lower forms of intelligent life in order to advance themselves. This principle could also be applied to the reason why souls incarnate in physical form. Thies suggested that the supreme intelligence she calls the Source is made up of a combination of creators, the Old Ones, who fuse their energy to spawn universes. The thought has been expressed to me in different ways by other subjects when they describe the combined power of non-reincarnating Old Souls. This concept is not new. For instance, the idea we have no single Godhead is the philosophy of the Jainist sect in India. The Jains believe fully perfected souls, called Sittas, are a group of universal creators. These souls are fully liberated from further transmigrations. Below them are the Arhat souls, advanced illuminators who still incarnate along with three more lower gradations of evolving souls. To the Jains, reality is uncreated and eternal. Thus, the Sittas need no creator. Most Eastern philosophies deny this tenet of Jainism in favor of a divine board of directors created by a chairman. This conclusion is more palatable to the Western mind as well. With certain subjects, it is possible to pursue a wide range of topics in condensed periods. Earlier, Thies had alluded to intelligent life existing on other worlds, 
when she talked about a soul's cosmic training. This brings up another aspect about soul life, which may be hard for some of us to accept. A small percentage of my subjects, usually the older advanced souls, are able to recall being in strange, non-human, intelligent life forms on other worlds. Their memories are rather fleeting and clouded about the circumstances of these lives, the physical details, and planetary location relative to our universe. I wondered if Thies had any such experiences long ago, so I opened up this line of inquiry for a few minutes to see where it might lead. Dr. N. A while back, you remarked about other physical worlds besides Earth, which are available to souls. Subject hesitant. Yes. Dr. N. Casually. And I assume some of these planets support intelligent life, which are useful to souls wishing to incarnate. Subject. That's true, there are many schoolyards. Dr. N. Do you ever talk to other souls about their planetary schoolyards? Subject. Long pause. It's not my inclination to do so. I'm not attracted to them, the other schools. Dr. N. Perhaps you could give me some idea of what they're like? Subject. Oh, some are analytical schools. Others are basically mental worlds, subtle places. Dr. N. What do you think of the Earth School by comparison? Subject. The Earth School is insecure still. It is filled with resentment of many people over being led and antagonism of the leaders toward each other. There is so much fear to overcome here. It is a world in conflict because there is too much diversity among too many people. Other worlds have low populations with more harmony. Earth's population has outpaced its mental development. Dr. N. Would you rather be training on another planet then? Subject. No. For all Earth's quarreling and cruelty, there is passion and bravery here. I like working in crisis situations to bring order out of disorder. We all know Earth is a difficult school. Dr. N. So the human body is not an easy host for souls? Subject. There are easier life forms who are less in conflict with themselves. Dr. N. Well, how would you know this unless your soul had been in another life form? After I had provided this suitable opening, Thies began talking about being a small flying creature in an alien environment on a dying world where it was hard to breathe. From her descriptions, the sun of this planet was apparently going into a nova stage. Her words were halting and came in short, rapid breaths. Thies said she lived on this world in a humid jungle with a night sky so densely packed with stars there were no dark lanes in between. This gave me the impression she was located near the center of a galaxy, perhaps our own. She also said her brief time on this world was spent as a very young soul, and Kumara was her mentor. After the world could no longer support life, they had come to Earth to continue working together. I was told there was a kinship in the mental evolution of life on Earth and what she had experienced before. This flying race of people began afraid, isolated, and dangerous to each other. Also, like Earth, family alliances were important, representing expressions of loyalty and devotion. While I was concluding this line of questioning, there was a further development. Dr. N. So do you think there are other souls on Earth who also had physical lives on this now-dead world? Subject paused, then unable to restrain herself. Actually, I have met one. Dr. N. Under what circumstances? Subject laughs. I met a man at a party a while ago. He recognized me. Not physically, but with the mind. It was an odd meeting. I was caught off balance when he came up to me and took my hand. I thought he was pushy when he said he knew me. Dr. N. Then what happened? Subject softly. I was in a daze, which is unusual for me. I knew there was something between us. I thought it was sexual. Now I can see it all clearly. It was... Ekak. 
This name is spoken with a clacking noise from the back of her throat. He told me we were once together from a place far away, and there were a couple of others here. Dr. N. Did he say anything more about them? Subject. Faintly. No. I wonder. I ought to know them. Dr. N. Did Ikak say anything else about your former physical relationship on this world? Subject. No. He saw I was confused. I didn't know what he was talking about then anyway. Dr. N. How could he consciously know about this planet when you didn't? Subject. Puzzled. He is ahead of me. He knows Kamara. Then more to herself than me. What is he doing here? Dr. N. Why don't you finish telling me about him at the party? Subject. Laughs again. I thought he was just trying to pick me up. It was awkward because I was drawn to him. He said I was very attractive, which is something men don't usually say to me. There were flashes in my mind that we had been together before, as fragments in a dream sequence. Dr. N., how did your conversation end with this man? Subject, he saw my discomfort. I guess he thought it best to have no further contact because I haven't seen him since. I've thought about him, though. And maybe we will see each other again. I believe souls do come across time and space for each other. Recently, I had two subjects who were best friends and came to me at the same time for regression. Not only had they been soulmates in many former lives on Earth, but were also mated as fish-like intelligent beings in a beautiful water world. Both recalled the enjoyment of playing underwater with their strong appendages and coming up to the surface to peak. Neither subject could recall much about this planet or what happened to their race of sea creatures. Perhaps they were part of a failed Earth experiment long before a land mammal developed into the most promising species on Earth for souls. I suspect it was not Earth, because I have had others who tell of living in an aquatic environment they know was unearthly. One of these subjects said, My water world was very warm and clear, because we had three suns overhead. The total lack of darkness underwater was comforting, and made building our dwellings much easier. I have often wondered if the dreams we have at night about flying, breathing underwater, and performing other non-human physical feats relate to our earlier physical experiences in other environments. In the early days of my studies of souls, I half expected that those subjects who could recall other worlds would say they had lived in our galaxy within the neighborhood of the sun. This assumption was naive. Earth is in a sparse section of the Milky Way, with only eight stars that are ten light years from the sun. We know our own galaxy has more than 200 billion stars within a universe currently speculated at 100 billion galaxies. The worlds around the suns which might support life are staggering to the imagination. Consider, if only a small fraction of 1% of the stars in our galaxy had planets with intelligent life useful to souls, the number would still be in the millions. From what I can gather from subjects willing and able to discuss former assignments, souls are sent to any world with suitable intelligent life forms. Out of all the stars which are known to us, only 4% are like our sun. Apparently this means nothing to souls. Their planetary incarnations are not linked to Earth-type worlds or with intelligent bipeds who walk on land. Souls who have been to other worlds tell me they have a fondness for certain ones and return to them, like Earth, periodically for a succession of lives. I have not had many subjects who are able to recall specific details about living on other worlds. This may be due to lack of experience, a suppression of memory, or blocks imposed by master guides to avoid any discomfort from flashbacks in non-earthly bodies. Those subjects who are able to discuss their experiences on other worlds tell me that before coming to Earth, souls are frequently placed in the bodies of creatures with less intelligence than human beings, unlike Thesa's case. However, once in a human body, souls are not sent back down the mental evolutionary ladder. 
Yet, physical contrasts can be stark, and side trips away from Earth are not necessarily pleasant. One mid-level client of mine expressed it this way. After a long series of human lives, I told my guide I needed a break from Earth for a while in another kind of environment. He warned me, you might not like this change right now because you have become so accustomed to the attributes of the human mind and body. My client persisted and was duly given life on what was described as a pastel world living among a race of small, thickly set beings. They were a thoughtful but somber people, with tiny chalk-white faces which never smiled. Without human laughter and physical flexibility, I was out of sync and made little progress. The assignment must have been particularly difficult for this individual when we consider that humor and laughter is such a hallmark of soul life in the spirit world. I was now approaching the final phase of my session with Case 23. It was necessary to apply additional deepening techniques because I wanted these to reach into the highest recesses of her superconscious mind to talk with me about space-time and the source. Dr. N. Thies, we are coming to the end of our time together, and I want you to turn your mind once again to the source, creator. Pause. Will you do that for me? Subject. Yes. Dr. N. You said the ultimate objective of souls was to seek unification with the supreme source of creative energy. Do you remember? Subject. The act of conjunction. Yes. Dr. N. Tell me. Does the source dwell in some special central space in the spirit world? Subject. The source is the spirit world. Dr. N. Then why do souls speak of reaching a core of spiritual life? Subject. When we are young spirits, we sense power around us everywhere, and yet we feel we are on the edge of it. As we grow older, there is an awareness of a concentrated power, but it is the same feeling. Dr. N. Even though you have called this the place of the old ones? Subject. Yes. They are part of the concentrated power of the source which sustains us as souls. Dr. N. Well, lumping this power together as one energy source, can you describe the Creator in more human terms? Subject. As the ultimate selfless being which we strive to be. Dr. N. If the source represents all the spirit world, how does this mental place differ from physical universes with stars, planets, and living things. Subject. Universes are created to live and die for the use of the source. The place of spirits is the source. Dr. N. We seem to live in a universe which is expanding and may contract again and eventually die. Since we live in a space with time limitations, how can the spirit world itself be timeless? Subject, because here we live in non-space, which is timeless, except in certain zones. Dr. N, please explain what these zones are. Subject, they're interconnecting doors, openings for us to pass through into a physical universe of time. Dr. N, how can time doors exist in non-space? Subject, the openings exist as thresholds between realities. Dr. N. Well, if the spirit world is non-dimensional, what kind of reality is that? Subject. A constant reality state, as opposed to the shifting realities of dimensional worlds, which are material and changing. Dr. N. Do past, present, and future have any relevance for souls living in the spirit world? Subject. Only as a means of understanding succession in physical form. Living here, there is a changelessness. For those of us not crossing thresholds into a universe of substance and time. Note. A major application of time thresholds used by souls will be examined in the upcoming chapter on life selection. Dr. N. You speak of universes in the plural. 
Are these other physical universes besides the one which contains Earth? Subject, vaguely. There are differing realities to suit the source. Dr. N. Are you saying souls can enter various rooms of different physical realities from spiritual doorways? Subject, nods. Yes, they can. And do. Before concluding the session with this highly advanced subject, I should add that most people who are in deep hypnosis are able to see beyond an earth reality of three-dimensional space into alternate realities of timelessness. In their subconscious state, my subjects experience a chronology of time with their past and present lives, which resembles what they perceive when conscious. There is a change when I take them into superconsciousness and the spirit world. Here they see the now of time as one homogeneous unit of past, present, and future. Seconds in the spirit world seem to represent years on earth. When their sessions are over, clients will often express surprise at how time in the spirit world is unified. Quantum mechanics is a modern branch of physics which investigates all subatomic movement in terms of electromagnetic energy levels where all things in life are thought to be ultimately non-solid and existing in a unified field. Going beyond Newton's physical laws of gravity, the elements of action on time are also considered to be unified by light wave frequency and kinetic energy. Since I show that souls do experience feelings of the passage of time in a chronological fashion in the spirit world, doesn't this contradict the concept of oneness for past, present, and future? No, it does not. My research indicates to me that the illusion of time progression is created and sustained for those souls coming to and from physical dimensions, who are used to such biological responses as aging, so they may more easily gauge their advancement. Thus it makes sense to me when the quantum physicists hypothesize that time, rather than being an absolute of three phases, is only an expression of change. When my subjects speak of traveling as souls on lines which curve, I think of the space-time theories of those astrophysicists who believe light and motion are a union of time and space curving back on itself. They say if space is bent severely enough, time stops. Indeed, when listening to my clients talk about time zones and tunnels of passage into different dimensions, I think about the similarities here to current astronomical theories of physical space being warped or twisted into cosmic loops creating mouths of hyperspace and black holes which may lead out of our three-dimensional universe. Perhaps the space-time concepts of astrophysics and metaphysics are edging closer together. I have suggested to my subjects that if the spirit world seems round to them, and appears to curve when they travel rapidly at souls, this could represent a finite enclosed sphere. They deny the idea of any dimensional boundaries, yet offer me little else except metaphors. Case 23 says the spirit world itself is the source of creation. Some have called this place the heart or breath of God. Case 22 defined the space of souls as fabric, and I have had other subjects give the spirit world a quality of the folds of a seamless dress swishing back and forth. They sometimes feel the effects of a gently rippling motion from light energy, which has been described as waves or rings rolling outward from a disturbed pool of water. Normally, the geography of soul spaces has a smooth and open consistency to people in superconsciousness, without displaying the properties of gravity, temperature, pressure, matter, or a time clock associated with a chaotic physical universe. However, when I attempt to characterize the entire spirit world as a void, people in trance resist this notion. Although my cases are unable to fully explain the place where their souls live, they are all outspoken about its ultimate reality for them. A subject in trance doesn't see the spirit world as being either near or far away from our physical universe. Nevertheless, in a curious way, they do portray spiritual substance as being light or heavy, thick or thin, and large or small, when comparing their experiences as souls to life on Earth. 
While the absolute reality of the spirit world appears to remain constant in the minds of people in hypnosis, their references to other physical dimensions do not. I have the sense that universes other than our own are created for the purpose of providing environments suitable for the growth of souls with beings we can't even imagine. One advanced subject told me he had lived on a number of worlds in his long existence, never dividing his soul more than twice at one time. Some adult lives lasted only months in Earth time for him, due to local planetary conditions and short lifespans of the dominant life form. While speaking of a paradise planet, with few people and a quieter, simpler version of Earth, he added this world was not far from Earth. Oh, I interrupted, then it must only be a few light years from Earth? He patiently explained that the planet was not in our universe, but closer to Earth than many planets in our own galaxy. It is important for the reader to understand that when people do recall living on other worlds, they seem not to be limited by the dimensional constraints of our universe. When souls travel to planets intergalactically or interdimensionally, they measure the trip by the time it takes them to reach their destinations through the tunnel effect from the spirit world. The size of the spatial region involved and the relative position of worlds to each other are also considerations. After listening to references about multiple dimensional realities from some of my subjects, I am left with the impression they believe there is a confluence of all these dimensional streams into one great river of the spirit world. If I could stand back and take apart all these alternate realities seated in the minds of my cases, it would be like peeling an artichoke of all its layers down to one heart at the core. I had been questioning Thies for quite a while, and I could see she was growing tired. Few subjects can sustain this level of spiritual receptivity for very long. I decided to end the session with a few questions about the genesis of all creation. Dr. N. Thies, I want to close by asking you more about the Source. You have been a soul for a long time. So how do you see yourself relating to the oneness of creation you told me about earlier? Subject. Long pause. By sensations of movement. In the beginning there is an outward migration of our soul energy from the source. Afterward our lives are spent moving inward. Toward cohesion and the uniting. Dr. N. You make this process seem as though a living organism was expanding and contracting. Subject. There is an explosive release, then a returning. Yes, the source pulsates. Dr. N. And you are moving toward the center of this energy source? Subject. There really is no center. The source is all around us as if we were inside a beating heart. Dr. N. But you did say you were moving back to a point of origin as your soul advanced in knowledge. Subject. Yes. When I was thrust outward, I was a child. Now I'm being drawn back as my adolescence fades. Dr. N. Back where? Subject. Further inside the source. Dr. N. Perhaps you could describe this energy source through the use of colors to explain soul movement in the scope of creation. Subject, size. It's as if souls are all part of a massive electrical explosion which produces a halo effect. In this circular halo is a dark purple light which flares out, lightning to a whiteness at the edges. Our awareness begins at the edges of brilliant light and as we grow, we become more engulfed in the darker light. Dr. N. I find it hard to visualize a god of creation as cold, dark light. Subject. That's because I am not close enough to conjunction to explain it well. The dark light is itself a covering beyond which we feel an intense warmth, full of a knowing presence which is everywhere for us and alive. Dr. N. What was it like when you were first aware of your identity as a soul 
after being pushed out to the rim of this halo. Subject. To be is the same as watching the first flower of spring open, and the flower is you. And as it opens more, you become aware of other flowers in a glorious field, and there is unbounded joy. Dr. N, if this explosive multicolored energy source collapses in on itself, will all the flowers eventually die? Subject, nothing is collapsing. The source is endless. As souls, we will never die. We know that somehow. As we coalesce, our increasing wisdom makes the source stronger. Dr. N, is that the reason the source desires to perform this exercise? Subject, yes, to give life to us so we can arrive at a state of perfection. Dr. N, why does a source, who is ostensibly perfect already, need to create further intelligence which is less than perfect? Subject, to help the Creator create. In this way, by self-transformation and rising to higher plateaus of fulfillment, we add to the building blocks of life. Dr. N. Were souls forced to break away from the Source and come to places like Earth because of some sort of original sin or fall from grace in the spirit world? Subject. That's nonsense. We came to be magnified in the beautiful variety of creation. Dr. N. Thies, I want you to listen to me carefully. If the source needs to be made stronger or more wise by using a division of its divine energy to create lesser intelligence which it hopes will magnify, doesn't this suggest it lacks full perfection itself? Subject. Pause. The source creates for fulfillment of itself. Dr. N, that's my point. How can that which is absolute become more absolute unless something is lacking? Subject, hesitates. That which we see to be our source is all we can know. And we think what the Creator desires is to express itself through us by birthing. Dr. N, and do you think the Source is actually made stronger by our existence as souls? Subject, long pause. I see the Creator's perfection, maintained and enriched, by sharing the possibility of perfection with us, and this is the ultimate extension of itself. Dr. N. So the Source starts out by deliberately creating imperfect souls and imperfect life forms for these souls, and watches what happens in order to extend itself? Subject. Yes. And we have to have faith in this decision and trust the process of returning to the origin of life. One has to be starving to appreciate food or cold to understand the blessings of warmth and to be children to see the value of the parent. The transformation gives us purpose. Dr. N. Do you want to be a parent of souls? Subject. Participation in the conception of ourselves is a dream of mine. Dr. N. If our spirits did not experience physical life, would we ever know of these things you are telling me about? Subject. We would know of them, but not about them. It would be as if your spiritual energy were told to play piano scales with only one note. Dr. N. And do you believe if the Source didn't create souls to nurture and grow, its sublime energy would shrink from a lack of expression? Subject. Size. Perhaps that is its purpose. With this last prophetic statement by Thies, I ended the session. As I brought this subject out of her deep trance, it was as though she were returning to me from across time and space. As she sat quietly focusing her eyes around my office, I expressed my appreciation for the opportunity of working with her on such an advanced level. Smiling, the lady said if she had any idea of the grilling in store for her, 
she might well have refused to work with me. As we said goodbye, I thought about her last statements concerning the source of life. In ancient Persia, the Sufis had a saying that if the Creator represents absolute good and therefore absolute beauty, it is the nature of beauty to desire manifestation. 12. Life Selection There comes that time when the soul must once again leave the sanctuary of the spirit world for another trip to earth. This decision is not an easy one. Souls must prepare to leave a world of total wisdom where they exist in a blissful state of freedom for the physical and mental demands of a human body. We have seen how tired souls can be when re-entering the spirit world. Many don't want to think about returning to earth again. This is especially true when we have not come close to our goals at the end of a physical life. Once back in the spirit world, souls have misgivings about even temporarily leaving a world of self-understanding, comradeship, and compassion to go to a planetary environment of uncertainty and fear brought about by aggressive competing humans. Despite having family and friends on earth, many incarnated souls feel lonely and anonymous among large impersonal populations. I hope my cases show the opposite is true in the spirit world, where our souls are involved in the most intimate sharing on an everlasting basis. Our spiritual identity is known and appreciated by a multitude of other entities whose support is never-ending. The rejuvenation of our energy and personal assessment of one's self takes longer for some souls than others, but eventually the soul is motivated to start the process of incarnation. While our spiritual environment is hard to leave, as souls we also remember the physical pleasures of life on earth with fondness and even nostalgia. When the wounds of a past life are healed and we are again totally at one with ourselves, we feel the pull of having a physical expression for our identity. Training sessions with our counselors and peer groups have provided a collaborative spiritual effort to prepare us for the next life. Our karma of past deeds towards humanity and our mistakes and achievements have all been evaluated with an eye toward the best course of future endeavors. The soul must now assimilate all this information and take purposeful action based upon three primary decisions. Am I ready for a new physical life? What specific lessons do I want to undertake to advance my learning and development? Where should I go and who shall I be in my next life for the best opportunity to work on my goals? Older souls incarnate less, regardless of the population demands of their assigned planets. When a world dies, those entities with unfinished business move on to another world, which has a suitable life form for the kind of work they have been doing. Cycles of incarnation for the eternal soul seem to be regulated more by the internal desires of a particular soul than by the urgency of host bodies evolving in a universe of planets. Nevertheless, Earth certainly has an increasing need for souls. Today we have over five billion people. Demographers vary in their calculations on how many individuals have lived on Earth in the last 200,000 years. The average estimate is some 50 billion people. This figure, which I think is low, does not signify the number of visitations by different souls. Bear in mind, the same souls continue to reincarnate and there are those who occupy more than one body at a time. There are reincarnationists who believe the number of people living on Earth today is close to the total number of souls who ever lived here. The frequency of incarnation on Earth by souls is uneven. Earth clearly has more need for souls today than in the past. Population estimates in 1 AD are around 200 million. By 1800, humans had quadrupled and after only 170 more years quadrupled again. Between 1970 and 2010, the world's population is expected to double once more. When I study the incarnation chronology of a client, I find there is usually a long span of hundreds, even thousands of years, between their lives in Paleolithic nomadic cultures. 
when the introduction of agriculture and domesticated animals in the Neolithic age, from 7,000 to 5,000 years ago, my subjects report living more frequent lives. Still, their lives are often spaced as much as 500 years apart. With the rise of cities, trade, and more available food, I see the incarnation schedules of souls increasing with a growing population. Between 1000 and 1500 AD, my clients live an average of once in two centuries. After 1700, this changes to once in a century. By the 1900s, living more than one life in a century is common among my cases. It has been argued these increases in soul incarnations only appear to be so because past life recall improves as people in hypnosis get closer to their current lives. This may be true to some extent, but if a life is important, it will be vividly remembered at any age in time. Without doubt, the enormous population increase on Earth is the basic cause for souls coming here more often. Is there a possibility that the inventory of souls slated for Earth could be strained by this surge in human reproduction? When I ask clients about the inventory of available souls, they tell me I should worry more about our planet dying from overpopulation than exhausting the reserve of souls. There is the conviction that new souls are always available to fill any expanding population requirements. If our planet is just one example among all other intelligent populations which exist in this universe, the inventory of souls must truly be astronomical. I have said souls do have the freedom to choose when, where, and who they want to be in their physical lives. Certain souls spend less time in the spirit world in order to accelerate development, while others are very reluctant to leave. There is no question but what our guides exert great influence in this matter. Just as we were given an intake interview in the orientation phase, right after death, there are preparatory exit interviews by spiritual advisors to determine our readiness for rebirth. The case which follows illustrates a typical spiritual scene with a lower level soul. Case 24 Dr. N When do you first realize that you might be returning to Earth? Subject A soft voice comes into my mind and says, It's about time, don't you think? Dr. N, who is this voice? Subject, my instructor. Some of us have to be given a push when they think we are ready again. Dr. N, do you feel you are about ready to return to Earth? Subject, yes, I think so. I have prepared for it. But my studies are going to take such a long time in Earth years before I'm done. It's kind of overwhelming. Dr. N, and do you think you will still be going to Earth when you near the end of your incarnations? Subject, long pause. Ah, maybe no. There is another world besides Earth. But with Earth people. Dr. N, what does this mean? Subject, Earth will have fewer people. Less crowded. It's not clear to me. Dr. N, where do you think you might be then? Subject, I'm getting the impression there is colonization someplace else. It's not clear to me. Note, the opposite of past life regression is post life progression, which enables some subjects to see snatches of the future as incomplete scenes. For instance, some have told me Earth's population will be greatly reduced by the end of the 22nd century, partially due to adverse soil and atmospheric changes. They also see people living in odd-looking domed buildings. Details about the future are always rather limited, due, I suspect, to built-in amnesia from karmic constraints. I'll have more to say about this with the next case. Dr. N. Let's go back to what you were saying about the instructors giving people a push to leave the spirit world. Would you prefer that they not do this? Subject. Oh, I'd like to stay. But the instructors don't want us hanging around here too long or we will get into a rut. Dr. N, could you insist on staying? Subject, well, yes. The instructors don't force you to leave because they're so gentle. Laughs, but they have their ways of encouraging you when the time comes. 
Dr. N, do you know of anyone who didn't want to be reborn again on Earth for any reason? Subject, yes, my friend Mark. He said he had nothing to contribute anymore. He was sick of life on Earth and didn't want to go back. Dr. N, had he lived many lives? Subject, no, not really. But he wasn't adjusting well in them. Dr. N, what did the teachers do with him? Was he allowed to stay in the spirit world? Subject, reflectively. We choose to be reborn when it is decided we are ready. They don't force you to do anything. Mark was shown he did benefit others around him. Dr. N, what happened to Mark? Subject, after some more indoctrination, Mark realized he had been wrong about his abilities and finally he went back to Earth. Dr. N, indoctrination? This makes me think of coercion. Subject, disturbed by my remark. It's not that way at all. Mark was just discouraged and needed the confidence to keep trying. Note, Case 10 in Chapter 4 on Displaced Souls told us about how souls who had absorbed too much negative energy from Earth were remodeled. Case 22 also mentioned the need for restoration with some damaged souls. These are more extreme alterations than the basic reframing apparently used on Mark's tired soul. Dr. N, if the guides don't force you, could a soul absolutely refuse to be reborn? Subject, pause. Yes, I guess you could stay here and never be reborn if you hated it that much. But the instructors told Mark that without life in a body, his studies would take longer. If you lose having direct experience, you miss a great deal. Dr. N. How about the reverse situation, where a soul insists on returning to Earth immediately, say, after an untimely death? Subject. I have seen that, too. It's an impulsive reaction and does wear off after a while. The instructors get you to see that wanting to hurry back someplace as a new baby wouldn't change the circumstances of your death. It might be different if you could be reborn as an adult right away in the same situation. Eventually, everyone realizes they must rest and reflect. Dr. N. Well, give me your final thoughts about the prospect of living again. Subject. I'm excited about it. I would have no satisfaction without my physical lives. Dr. N. When you are ready for a new incarnation, what do you do? Subject. I go to a special place. Once a soul has decided to incarnate again, the next stage in the return process is to be directed to the place of life selection. Souls consider when and where they want to go on Earth before making a decision on who they will be in their new life. Because of this spiritual practice, I have divided life selection and our final choice of a body into two chapters for ease of understanding. The selection of a time and place for incarnation and who we want to be are not completely separate decisions. However, we start by having the opportunity of viewing how we might fit into certain environments in future time segments. Then our attention is directed to people living in these places. I was a little distracted by this procedure until I realized a soul is largely influenced by cultural conditions and events, as well as by the participants in these events during a span of chronological time. I have come to believe that the spirit world as a whole is not functionally uniform. All spiritual regions are seen by traveling souls as having the same ethereal properties, but with different applications. As an illustration, the space of orientation for incoming souls could be contrasted to the space of life selection for those who are leaving. Both involve life evaluations for souls in transit, which include scenes from Earth, but there the resemblance ends. Orientation spaces are said to be small, intimate conference areas designed to make a newly arrived soul comfortable. But our mental attitude in this space can be somewhat defensive. This is because there is the feeling we might have done better with life. A guide is always directly interacting with us. On the other hand, when we enter the space of life selection, we are full of hope, promise, and lofty expectations. Here, souls are virtually alone, with their guides out of sight while evaluating new life options. 
This hectic, stimulating place is described as being much larger than other spiritual study areas. Case 22 considered it a world unto itself, where transcendent energy alters time to allow for planetary study. While some spiritual locales are difficult for my subjects to describe, most love to talk about the place of life selection, and they use remarkably similar descriptions. I am told it resembles a movie theater, which allows souls to see themselves in the future playing different roles in various settings. Before leaving, Souls will have selected one scenario for themselves. Imagine being given a dress rehearsal before the actual performance of a new life. To tell us about it, I have picked a male subject who is well acquainted with the way his soul is assisted in making appropriate decisions. Case 25 Dr. N After you have made the decision you want to come back to Earth, what happens next? Subject well, when my trainer and I agree the time is right to accomplish things, I send out thoughts. Dr. N. Go on. Subject. My messages are received by the coordinators. Dr. N. Who are they? Doesn't your trainer guide handle all the arrangements for incarnation? Subject. Not exactly. He talks to the coordinators who actually assist us in previewing our life possibilities at the ring. Dr. N. What is the ring? Subject. That's where I'm going. We call it the ring of destiny. Dr. N. Is there just one place like it in the spirit world? Subject. Pause. Oh, I think there must be many, but I don't see them. Dr. N. All right. Let's go to the ring together on the count of three. When I am finished with my count, you will have the capacity to remember all the details of this experience. Are you ready to go? Subject, yes. Dr. N, one, two, three. Your soul is now moving toward the space of life selection. Explain what you see. Subject, long pause. I am floating towards the ring. It's circular. A monster bubble. Dr. N, keep going. What else can you tell me? Subject, there's a concentrated energy force. The light is so intense. I'm being sucked inward through a funnel. It's, it's a little darker. Dr. N, are you afraid? Subject, mm, no. I've been here before, after all. It's going to be interesting. I'm excited at what's in store for me. Dr. N, okay. As you float inside the ring, what are your first impressions? Subject. Voice lowers. I am a little apprehensive, but the energy relaxes me. I have an awareness of concern for me. Hearing. I don't feel alone. My trainer's presence is with me, too. Dr. N. Continue to report everything. What do you see next? Subject. The ring is surrounded by banks of screens. I'm looking at them. Dr. N. Screens on walls? Subject. They appear as walls themselves, but nothing is really solid. It's all... elastic. The screens curve around me, moving. Dr. N. Tell me more about the screens. Subject. They are blank, not reflecting anything yet. They shimmer as sheets of glass. Mirrors. Dr. N. What happens next? Subject, nervously. I feel a moment of quietness. It's always like this. Then it's as if someone flipped a switch on the projector in a panorama movie theater. The screens come alive with images and there's color, action, full of light and sound. Dr. N, keep reporting to me. Where is your soul in relation to the screens? Subject. I am hovering in the middle, watching the panorama of life all around me. Places. People. Jauntily. I know this city. Dr. N. What do you see? Subject. New York. Dr. N. Did you ask to see New York City? Subject. We talked about my going back there. 
absorbed. Gee, it's changed. More buildings and the cars. It's as noisy as ever. Dr. N, I'll come back to New York in a few minutes. Right now I want you to tell me what is expected of you in the ring. Subject, I'm going to mentally operate the panel. Dr. N, what's that? Subject, a scanning device in front of the screens. I see it as a mass of lights and buttons. It's as if I'm in the cockpit of an airplane. Dr. N, and you see these mechanical objects in a spiritual setting? Subject, I know it sounds crazy, but this is what is coming through to me, so I can explain to you what I am doing. Dr. N, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Just tell me what you are supposed to do with the panel. Subject, I will help the controllers change the images on the screens by operating the scanner with my mind. Dr. N, oh, you are going to operate the projector as if you were working in a movie theater? Subject, laughs. Not the projector, the scanner. Anyway, they aren't really movies. I am watching life actually going on in the streets of New York. My mind connects with the scanner to control the movement of the scenes I am watching. Dr. N, would you say this device resembles a computer? Subject, sort of. It works on a tracking system which converts... Dr. N, converts what? Subject, my commands are registered on the panel so I can track the action. Dr. N, position yourself at the panel and become the operator while continuing to explain everything to me. Subject, pause. I have assumed control. I see lines converging along various points in a series of scenes. I'm traveling through time now on the lines and watching the images on the screens change. Dr. N, and the scenes are constantly moving around you. Subject, yes. Then the points light up on the lines when I want the scene to stop. Note, lines of travel is a term we have heard before in other spiritual regions to describe soul transition. That is case 14. Dr. N, why are you doing all this? Subject, I'm scanning. The stops are major turning points on life's pathways involving important decisions, possibilities, events which make it necessary to consider alternate choices in time. Dr. N. So the lines mark the pathways through a series of events in time and space? Subject. Yes. The track is controlled in the ring and transmitted to me. Dr. N. Do you create the scenes of life while you track? Subject. Oh, no. I simply control their movement through time on the lines. Dr. N. What else can you tell me about the lines? Subject. The lines of energy are roads with points of colored light as guideposts, which I can move forward, backward, or stop. Dr. N. As if you were running a videotape with start, fast forward, stop, and rewind buttons? Subject laughs. That's the idea. Dr. N. All right. You are moving along the track, scanning scenes, and you decide to stop. Tell me what you do then. Subject. I suspend the scene on the screens so I can enter it. Dr. N. What? Are you saying you become part of the scene yourself? Subject. Yes. Now I have direct access to the action. Dr. N. In what way? Do you become a person in the scene? Or does your soul hover overhead while people move around? Subject. Both. I can experience what life is like with anyone in the scene. Or just watch them from any vantage point. Dr. N. How can you leave the panel and go into a scene on Earth while still monitoring the action in the ring? Subject. I know you probably won't understand this, but part of me stays at the control so I can start up the scene again and stop at any time. Dr. N. Perhaps I do understand. Can you divide your energy? Subject. Yes, and I can send thoughts back to myself. Of course, the controllers are helping too as I go in and out of the screens. 
Dr. N. So, essentially, you can move time forward, backward, and stop it while tracking. Subject, yes, in the ring. Dr. N. Outside the ring, does time coexist for you in the spirit world, or is it progressive? Subject, it coexists here, but we can still see it progress on Earth. Dr. N. It seems to me when souls are in the ring of destiny, they use time almost like a tool. Subject. As spirits, we do use time subjectively. Things and events are moved around and become objects in time, but to us time is uniform. Dr. N. The paradox I have with time travel is that what is going to happen has already happened. So you could meet your own soul in some human being as you come and go in life scenes from the future. Subject. Smiles enigmatically. When making contact, the soul in residence is put on hold for a moment. It's relatively short. We don't disturb life cycles when tracking through time. Dr. N. Well, if past, present, and future are not really separate while you are tracking, why do you stop scenes to consider choices when you can already see into the future. Subject. I'm afraid you don't realize the real purpose of time use by the controllers of the ring. Life is still conditional. Progress of time is created to test us. We are not shown all the possible endings to a scene. Parts of lives are obscured to us. Dr. N. So, time is used as a catalyst for learning by viewing lives when you can't see everything that is going to happen? Subject. Yes, to test our ability to find solutions. We gauge our abilities against the difficulty of the events. The ring sets up different experiments to choose from. On Earth, we will try to solve them. Dr. N. In the ring, can you look at life on planets besides Earth? Subject. I can't because I'm programmed for tracking time on Earth. Dr. N. Your being able to jump through time from the screens sounds like a ball. Subject. Grins. Oh, it's stimulating, that's for sure. But we can't frolic around because there are serious decisions to be made for the next life. I'll have to accept the consequences for any mistakes in my choices if I am not able to handle a life well. Dr. N. I still don't see how you could make many serious mistakes in your choices when you actually experience part of the life in which you plan to live. Subject. My choices of life environments are not unlimited. As I said, I probably won't be able to see all of a scene in one time segment. Because of what they don't show you, there is risk attached to all body choices. Dr. N. If one's future destiny is not fully preordained, as you say, why call this space the ring of destiny? Subject. Oh... There is destiny, all right. The life cycles are in place. It's just that there are so many alternatives which are unclear. When I take my subjects into the spatial area of life selection, they see a circle of past, present, and future time, such as the ring in this case. Sensing they are leaving spiritual now time within the circle, souls apparently rotate back and forth on resonating waves during their observational runs. All aspects of time are presented to them as reoccurring realities, ebbing and flowing together. Because parallel realities are superimposed upon one another, they too can be seen as possibilities for physical lives, especially by the more experienced souls. I was puzzled why my subjects did not fully see the future under these conditions, as part of an all-knowing spiritual setting. In trying to sort this out, I finally came to the conclusion that the spirit world is designed to protect the interests of each soul. Generally, the people I work with are still incarnating younger souls. They may not clearly see significant events too far into the future, because the further away these souls get from present probabilities, the higher the incidence of possible alternative realities which cloud their images. Although the same properties hold true for time in the distant past, there is one exception. A soul's own past lives are more easily identified. This is because a single reality with a definite course of action 
was previously established to train this soul and thus is firmly imprinted on his memory. In chapter 5, case 13 demonstrated how amnesia is imposed upon us when we come into a current life so that past life experiences will not inhibit self-discovery in the present. The same condition holds true for souls examining future lives. Without knowing why, most people believe their life has a plan. Of course, they are right. Although amnesia does prevent having full conscious knowledge of this plan, the unconscious mind holds the key to spiritual memories of a general blueprint for each life. The vehicle of life selection provides a kind of time machine for souls, where they see some alternative routes to the main road. Although these paths are not fully exposed to us as souls, we carry some of the road map to Earth. A client once said to me, Whenever I am confused about what to do in life, I quietly sit down and think about where I have been and compare this to where I might want to go in the future. The answer to the next step just comes to me from inside myself. Accepting what befalls us on the road of life as acts of God does not mean our existence should be locked into spiritual determinism where we must submit to an unalterable fate. If everything was preordained, there would be no purpose or justice to our struggle. When adversity strikes, it is not intended that we sit back with a fatalistic attitude and not fight to improve the situation by making on-site changes. During our lives, all of us will experience opportunities for change which involve risk. These occasions may come at inconvenient times. We may not act upon them, but the challenge is there for us. The purpose of reincarnation is the exercise of free will. Without this ability, we would be impotent creatures indeed. Thus, karmic destiny means we are not just caught up in events over which we have no control. This also means we have karmic lessons and responsibilities. The law of cause and effect for our actions always exists, which is why this case did not want to make a mistake in choosing a life unsuited to him. But whatever happens to us in life, it is important we understand that our happiness or pain does not reflect either blessings or betrayal on the part of a God oversoul, our guides, or life selection coordinators. We are the masters of our destiny. As I conclude my conversation with Case 25, it may strike the reader that the musical goals of this individual toward his next life are rather self-serving. Certainly his desire to be an admired musical talent has elements of personal compensation which would be less evident in a more advanced soul. However, it will also be seen that this soul wants to give a lot of himself. Dr. N. Now, I want to talk more about the scenes you are seeing of New York City. Prior to your coming into the ring, were you given any preparation about selections based on geography? Subject. Oh, to some extent. My trainer and I talked about the fact that I had died young in New York in my last life. I wanted to go back to this dynamic city and study music. Dr. N. Did you also talk to your trainer about other souls? Your friends who might want to incarnate with you? Subject. Sure, that's part of it. Some of us begin staking out a new life by deciding what surroundings are best for all concerned. I made it known I wanted to start again in the same place where I was killed. My trainer and friends offered their suggestions. Note. This subject came to America as a Russian immigrant in his past life. He was killed in a railway construction accident in New York at age 22 in 1898. His rebirth in the same city occurred in 1937. Dr. N. What suggestions? Subject. We talked about my wanting to be a classical pianist. I had played an accordion for extra pickup change. You know, banquets, weddings, that kind of thing. Dr. N. And this experience is motivating your interest in the piano? Subject. Yes. When making ice deliveries on the streets of New York, I would pass by the concert hall. It was my goal to someday study music and make a name for myself in the big city. I hardly got started before I died. Dr. N. 
Did you see your death as a young man in New York during your last visit to the ring? Subject, sadly. Yes, and I accepted that, as a condition of the life. It was a good life, just short. Now I want to go back with a better start and make a name for myself in music. Dr. N., could you ask to go anywhere on Earth? Subject. Hmm. It's fairly open. If we have preferences, they are weighed against what's available. Dr. N. You mean against what bodies are available? Subject. Yes, in certain places. Dr. N. When you said you wanted a better start in music, I assume this is another reason you want to go back to New York. Subject. This city will give me the best opportunity to develop my desire to study the piano. I wanted a large cosmopolitan city with music schools. Dr. N. What's wrong with a city like Paris? Subject. I wasn't offered a body in Paris. Dr. N. I want to be clear on your selection options. When you start previewing life scenes in the ring, are you primarily looking at people or locations? Subject. We begin with locations. Dr. N. Okay. And so you are looking at the streets of New York City at the moment? Subject. Right. That is wonderful. Because I'm doing more than looking. I'm floating around smelling the food in the restaurants. I hear the honking of cars. I'm following people walking past the shops on Fifth Avenue. Getting the feel of the place again. Dr. N. At this point, have you actually entered the minds of the people walking along the streets? Subject. No, not yet. Dr. N. What do you do next? Subject. I go to other cities. Dr. N. Oh, I guess I just assumed your body choices had to be in New York City. Subject. I didn't tell you that. I also could go to Los Angeles, Buenos Aires, or Oslo. Dr. N. I'm going to count to five, and when I reach five, you will scan these cities while we continue talking. One, two, three, four, five. Report what you are doing. Subject. I'm going to concert halls and music academies and watching the students practice. Dr. N. Do you just observe the general surroundings while floating around these students? Subject. I do more. I go inside the heads of some of them to see how they translate the music. Dr. N. Do you need to be in a special place like the ring to examine the mental processes of people? Subject. For past and future events, I do. Making contact with someone in the present on Earth can be done anywhere from the spirit world. Dr. N. Could you describe the way your soul makes contact with someone? Subject. Pause. As a light brush stroke. Note. Souls are quite capable of sending and receiving messages from each other between spiritual and temporal worlds, as many of us have personally experienced. However, these temporary connections are made and broken quickly. The joining of a soul to a soulless baby for a lifetime is more difficult, and will be described further in Case 29. Dr. N. As you look at these prospective lives, what year is it on Earth? Subject. Hesitates. It's 1956 now. And most of my prospects are in their teens. I'll check them out before and after this year, as much as the ring will let me. Dr. N. So the ring gives you the opportunity to actually be various people who, in relative time on Earth, are not yet born? Subject. Uh-huh. To see if I would fit in well. To check out their talent and parents. That sort of thing. Decisively. I want New York. Dr. N. Do you think you have looked at the other cities carefully enough? Subject. Impatiently. Yes, I did that, but I don't want them. Dr. N. Wait a minute. What if you liked a music student in Oslo but wanted to live in New York City. Subject. Laughs. As a matter of fact, there is a promising girl in Los Angeles. 
but I still want New York. Dr. N. All right, move forward. As your time in the ring draws to a close, give me the details of your probable life selection. Subject. I am going to New York to be a musician. I'm still trying to make up my mind between a couple of people, but I think I will choose... Stops to laugh. <laughs> a dumpy kid with a lot of talent. His body won't have the stamina of my last one, but I'll have the advantage of parents with some money who will encourage me to practice, practice, practice. Dr. N. Money is important. Subject. I know I sound grasping, selfish, but there was no money in my last life. If I want to express the beauty of music and give pleasure to myself and others, I need proper training and supportive parents. Otherwise, I'll get sidetracked. I know myself. Dr. N. If you didn't like any of the options presented to you in the ring, could you ask for more places and people to look at? Subject. It isn't necessary, at least for me. I'm offered enough. Dr. N. Let me be more blunt. If you are supposed to select a life from only the selections shown you in the ring, how do you know the coordinators aren't stacking the deck against you? Maybe they are programming you to make certain choices. Subject. Pause. I don't think so, considering all the times I've come to the ring. We don't go unless our minds are made up as to the type of life we want to live. And I've always had interesting choices based upon my own ideas. Dr. N. Okay. After you are completely finished with reviewing lives in the ring, what happens then? Subject. The controllers come into my mind to see if I am satisfied with what I've been shown. Dr. N. Are they always the same entities? Subject. I think so. As far back as I can remember. Dr. N. Do they pressure you to make a decision before leaving the ring? Subject. Not at all. I float out and go back to talk to my companions before making up my mind. Case 25 told us his choice of locations was confined to four cities. The number of scenes souls preview before a new life is, of course, different for each visit. Individual life offerings are selective, which indicates to me that other spiritual entities have been actively working on our behalf to set up location scenes before we arrive. The number of specialist spirits who assist souls at the space of life selection never seems to be large. They appear as rather vague apparitions to my subjects, although most believe members of their council of elders and personal guides are involved. Early in human history, when the world was underpopulated, my clients recall lives where they were always born in sparse human settlements. In time, with the rise of villages and then larger centers of ancient civilizations, my cases report returning to the same areas. Life selections were geographically scattered again by the great migrations of people colonizing new lands, particularly in the last 400 years. In this century of overpopulation, more souls are choosing to live in places where they have been before. Does this tendency today mean souls want to return to the same countries because of race? Souls are not inclined toward life selections based on ethnicity or nationalism. These products of human separatism are taught in childhood. Aside from the comfortable familiarity of culture in a soul's choice, which is different from racial bias, we must also factor in the affinity many spirits have for deserts, mountains, or the sea. Souls may also have a preference for rural or urban living. Are souls drawn back to the same geographic areas because they want a new life with the same family they had in their past life? The tradition among certain cultures, such as Native Americans, is that souls choose to stay within family bloodlines. A dying man is expected to come back as his own unborn grandchild. In my practice, I rarely see souls repeating the same genetic choices in past lives, because this would inhibit growth and opportunity. Once in a while I hear about a soul returning to the body of a relative in a former life under unusual karmic circumstances. For example, if a brother and sister had a close affinity for each other, 
and one were to die suddenly while still young, the soul of the dead sibling might want to return in the surviving sibling's child to restore this broken life connection to finish an important task. What is even more common in my experience are the souls of young children who die soon after birth and then return to the same parents as the soul of their next baby. These plans are all made in advance by the souls participating in tragic family events. They involve a maze of karmic issues. Not long ago, I had a case where my client had died from a birth defect early in his last life. I asked, What was the purpose of your life ending when you were only a few days old? He replied, The lesson was for my parents, not me. And that's why I elected to come back for them as a filler. When souls return for a short time to help someone else, rather than work on their own issues, because there isn't time. Some call this a filler life. In this case, the parents had abused and finally caused the death of another child when they were together in an earlier life. Although they were a loving young couple in the last life of my client, these parents evidently needed to experience the grief of having a child they desperately wanted taken away from them. Experiencing the anguish from this terrible loss gave the souls of these parents a deeper insight into the effects of severing a blood bond. I will have an example of this theme in Case 27. Spirits do not routinely see their deaths in future lives. If souls choose a life where their death will be premature, they often see it in the place of life selection. I have found that souls essentially volunteer in advance for bodies who will have sudden fatal illnesses, are to be killed by someone, or come to an abrupt end of life with many others from a catastrophic event. Souls who become involved in these tragedies are not caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, with a capricious God looking the other way. Every soul has a motive for the events in which it chooses to participate. One client told me his last life was planned in advance, to end at seven years of age as an American Indian boy. He said, I was looking for a short burst lesson in humility, and this life as a mistreated starving half-breed was enough. Another more graphic example of a soul volunteering for a terrible assignment was that of one of my subjects who elected in her last life to join with three others of her soul group, the bodies of Jewish women taken from Munich into the death camp at Dachau in 1941. All were assigned to the same barracks, also prearranged, where my client died in 1943 at age 18, comforting the children and trying to help them survive. Her mission was accomplished with courage. While events, race, culture, and geographic location often appear to come first in the selection process, they are not the most significant choices for the soul's next life. Aside from all other considerations, incarnation comes down to souls making that all-important decision of a specific body and what can be learned by utilizing the brain of a certain human being. The next chapter is devoted to an analysis of why souls choose their bodies for various biological and psychological reasons. 13. Choosing a New Body In the place of life selection, our souls preview the lifespan of more than one human being within the same time cycle. When we leave this area, most souls are inclined toward one leading candidate presented to us for soul occupation. However, our spiritual advisors give us ample opportunity to reflect upon all we have seen in the future before making a final decision. This chapter is devoted to the many elements which go into that decision. Our deliberations over body alternatives actually begin before we go to the place of life selection. Souls do this in order to adequately prepare themselves for viewing certain people in different cultural settings on earth. I sense those souls who set up the screening room know in advance what to show us because of these thoughts in our minds. Great care must be taken in choosing just the right body to serve us in the life to come. As I have said, guides and peer group members are part of this evaluation process 
prior to and after we visit the place of life selection. When listening to my subjects describe all the preparations which go into picking a new physical body, I am constantly reminded of the fluidity of spiritual time. Our teachers use relative future time in the place of life selection to allow souls to measure human usefulness for working on unfinished lesson plans. Blueprints for the next life vary in the degree of difficulty the soul mind sets for itself. If we have just come off an easy life, making little interpersonal progress, our soul might want to choose a person in the next time cycle who will face heartache and perhaps tragedy. It is not out of the ordinary for me to see someone who has skated through an unchallenging life overloading themselves with turmoil in the next one to catch up with their learning goals. The soul mind is far from infallible as it works in conjunction with a biological brain. Regardless of our soul level, being human means we will all make mistakes and have the necessity of engaging in mid-course corrections during our lives. This will be true with any body we select. Before taking up the more complex mental factors in a soul's decision to join with the brain of a human baby, I will begin with the physical aspects of body choice. Despite the fact that our souls know in advance what they are going to look like, a national survey in the United States indicated 90% of both males and females were dissatisfied with the physical characteristics of their bodies. This is the power of conscious amnesia. Much unhappiness is created by society stereotyping an ideal appearance. Yet this too is part of a soul's lesson plan. How many times have we all looked in a mirror and said, Is this the real me? Why do I appear this way? Am I in a body where I belong? These questions are especially poignant when the type of body we have prevents us from doing those things we think we ought to be able to do in life. I have had a number of clients who came to me convinced their bodies prevented them from achieving satisfying lives. Many handicapped people think if it were not for a genetic mistake or being the victim of an accidental injury which damaged their body, their lives would be more fulfilled. As heartless as this may sound, my cases show few real accidents involving body damage which don't fall under the free will of souls. As souls, we choose our bodies for a reason. Living in a damaged body does not necessarily have to involve a karmic debt we are paying off because of past life responsibility for an injury to someone else. As my next case will demonstrate, when a soul is inside a damaged body, this choice can involve a learning path to another type of lesson. It is difficult to tell a newly injured person trying to cope with physical disablement that he or she has an opportunity to advance at a faster rate than those of us with healthy bodies and minds. This knowledge must come through self-discovery. The case histories of my clients convince me that the effort necessary to overcome a body impediment does accelerate advancement. Those of us whom society deems less than perfect suffer discrimination which makes the burden even heavier. Overcoming the obstacles of physical ailments and hurt makes us stronger for the ordeal. Our bodies are an important part of the trial we set for ourselves in life. The freedom of choice we have with these bodies is based far more on psychological elements than from the estimated 100,000 genes inherited by each human being. However, I want to show in the opening case of this chapter why souls want certain bodies based largely on physical reasons without heavy psychological implications. The case exhibits the planning involved in the decision of a soul to be in contrasting physical bodies in different lives. After this case, we will examine why souls choose their bodies for other reasons. Case 26 was a tall, well-proportioned woman who enjoyed participating in sports despite being bothered all her life with recurring leg pains. During her preliminary interview, I learned the pain was a dull ache in both legs, about midway down the thigh bones. Over a period of years, she had been to a number of doctors who could find no medical evidence of anything wrong with her legs. Clearly, she was worn down and willing to try anything for relief. 
When I heard the doctors had concluded her discomfort was probably psychosomatic, I suspected the origin of this woman's pain might lie in a past life. Before going to the source of her problem, I decided to take my client through a couple of past lives to ascertain her motivations for body choices. When I asked her to tell me about a life in which she was the happiest with a human body, she told me of being in the body of a Viking called Leth around 800 AD. She said Leth was a child of nature who traveled by the Baltic Sea route into western Russia. Leth was described as wearing a long fur-lined cloak and soft form-fitting animal skin pants with roped up boots and a cap wrapped with metal. He carried an axe and a heavy broad bladed sword which he wielded easily in battle. My subject was intrigued by the picture in her mind of again being inside this magnificently proportioned warrior with dirty strands of reddish blonde hair spilling all over my shoulders. Standing well over six feet tall, he must have been a giant of his time, with enormous strength, a huge chest, and powerful limbs. A man of great endurance, Leth navigated with other Norsemen over long distances, sailing up rivers and hiking through thick virgin forests, pillaging settlements along the way. Leth was killed during a raid while looting a village. Case 26 Dr. N. What was most important to you about this life you have just recalled as Leth the Viking? Subject To experience that magnificent body and the feeling of raw physical power. I have never had another body like that one in all my existences on earth. I was fearless because my body did not react to pain even when wounded. In every respect, it was flawless. I never got sick. Dr. N. Was Leth ever mentally troubled by anything? Was there any emotional sensitivity for you in this life? Subject bursts out laughing. Are you kidding? Never. I lived only for each day. My concerns were not getting enough fighting, plunder, food, drink, and sex. All my feelings were channeled into physical pursuits. What a body. Dr. N. All right. Let's analyze your decision to choose this great body in advance of Leth's life. At the time you made your choice in the spirit world, did you request this body of good genetic stock, or did your guide simply make the selection for you? Subject. Counselors don't do that. Dr. N. Then explain to me how this body came to be chosen by you. Subject. I wanted one of the best physical specimens on earth at the time, and Leth was offered to me as a possibility. Dr. N. You had only one choice? Subject. No, I had two choices of people living in this time. Dr. N. What if you didn't like any of the body choices presented to you for occupation in that time segment? Subject. Thoughtfully. The alternatives of my choices always seem to match what I want to experience in my lives. Dr. N. Do you have the sense the counselors know in advance which body selections are exactly right for you? Or are they so harried it's just an indiscriminate grab bag of body choices? Subject. Nothing here is careless. The counselors arrange everything. Dr. N. I have wondered if the counselors might get mixed up once in a while. With all the new babies born, could they ever assign two souls to one baby? Or leave a baby without a soul for a while? Subject, laughing. We aren't in an assembly line. I told you they know what they are doing. They don't make mistakes like that. Dr. N. I believe you. Now as to your choices. I am curious if two bodies were sufficient for your examination in the place of life selection. Subject. We don't need a lot of choices for lives once the counselors get their heads together about our desires. I already had some idea of the right body size and shape and the sex I wanted before being exposed to my two choices. Dr. N. What was the body choice you rejected in favor of Leth? 
Subject. Pause. That of a soldier from Rome. Also with the strong body I wanted in that lifetime. Dr. N. What was wrong with being an Italian soldier? Subject. I didn't want... control over me by the state. Subject shakes head from side to side. Too restrictive. Dr. N. As I remember, by the ninth century, much of Europe had fallen under the authority of Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire. Subject. That was the trouble with the soldier's life. As a Viking, I answered to nobody. I was free. I could move around with my band of invaders in the wilderness without any governmental control. Dr. N. Then freedom was also an issue in your choice. Subject. Absolutely. The freedom of movement, the fury of battle, the use of my strength and uninhibited action. Life at sea and in the forests was robust and constant. I know the life was cruel, too, but it was a brutal time. I was no better or worse than the rest. Dr. N. But what about other considerations, such as personality? Subject. Nothing bothered me as long as I was able to physically express myself to the fullest. Dr. N. Did you have a mate? Children? Subject. Shrugs. Too restrictive. I was on the move. I possessed many women. Some willing. Others not. And this pleasure added to my expression of physical power. I didn't want to be tied down in any way. Dr. N. So, the body of Leth was your preference as a pure physical extension of sensual feeling? Subject. Yes. I wanted to experience all body senses to the fullest, nothing more. I felt my subject was now ready to go to work on her current problem. After bringing her out of superconscious into a subconscious state, I asked her to go directly to a life which may have involved leg pain. Almost at once, the woman dropped into her most recent past life and became a six-year-old girl named Ashley, living in New England in the year 1871. Ashley was riding in a fully loaded, horse-drawn carriage when suddenly she opened the door and tumbled out under the vehicle. When she hit the cobblestone street, one of the heavy rear carriage wheels rolled over her legs at the same point above both knees, crushing the bones. My subject re-experienced a sharp pain in her legs while describing the fall. Despite efforts from local physicians and the prolonged use of wood splints, Ashley's leg bones did not heal properly. She was never able to stand or walk again, and poor circulation caused repeated swelling in her legs for the rest of a rather short life. Ashley died in 1912 after a productive period of years as a writer and tutor of disadvantaged children. When the narration of Ashley's life ended, I returned my subject to the spirit world. Dr. N. In your history of body choices, why did you wait a thousand years between being a physically strong man and a crippled woman? Subject. Well, of course I developed a better sense of who I was during the lives in between. I chose to be crippled to gain intellectual concentration. Dr. N. You chose a broken body for this? Subject. Yes, you see, being unable to walk made me read and study more. I developed my mind and listened to my mind. I learned to communicate well and to write with skill because I wasn't distracted. I was always in bed. Dr. N. Was any characteristic about your soul particularly evident in both Ashley and Leth the Viking? Subject. That part of me which craves fiery expression was in both bodies. Dr. N. I want you to go to the moment you were in the process of choosing the life of Ashley. Tell me how you decided on this particular damaged body. Subject. I picked a family in a well-established, settled part of America. I wanted a place with libraries and to be taken care of by loving parents so I could devote myself to scholarship. 
I constantly wrote to many unhappy people and became a good teacher. Dr. N. As Ashley, what did you do for this loving family who took care of you? Subject. It always works two ways. The benefits and liabilities. I chose this family because they needed the intensity of love with someone totally dependent upon them all their lives. We were very close as a family because they were lonely before I was born. I came late as their only child. They wanted a daughter who would not marry and leave them to be lonely again. Dr. N. So it was a trade-off. Subject. Most definitely. Dr. N. Then let's track this decision further back to the place of life selection. When your soul first saw Ashley's life. Did you see the details of your carriage accident then? Subject. Of course. But it wasn't an accident. It was supposed to happen. Dr. N. Once you came to Earth, who was responsible for the fall? Was it your soul mind or Ashley's biological mind? Subject. We worked in unison. She was going to be fooling with the carriage door handle and... I capitalized on that. Dr. N. Tell me what was going through your soul mind in the life selection room when you saw the scene of Ashley falling and being injured. Subject. I thought about how this crippled body could be put to good use. I had some other choices for body injuries but I preferred this one because I didn't want to have the capability for much movement. Dr. N. I want to pursue the issue of causality here. Would Ashley have fallen anyway if she had a soul other than your own? Subject. Defensively. We were right for each other. Dr. N. That doesn't answer my question. Subject. Long pause. There are forces beyond my knowledge as a spirit. When I saw Ashley for the first time, I was able to see her without me. Healthy. Older. Another life possibility. Dr. N. Now we are getting somewhere. Are you saying if Ashley had begun her life with another soul entity, that she might not have fallen at all? Subject. Yes, that's a possibility, one of many. She could also have been less severely injured with the ability to walk on crutches. Dr. N. Well, did you see a physically healthy Ashley living happily without your soul? Subject. I saw a grown woman, normal legs, unhappiness with a man, Frustration at being trapped in an unrewarding life. Sorrowful parents. But easier. Voice becomes more firm. No, that course would not have worked well for either of us. I was the best soul for her. Dr. N. Were you the prime mover of the fall once you elected to become Ashley's soul? Subject. It was both of us. We were one at that moment. She was being naughty, bouncing around in the carriage, playing with the door handle when her mother said she must stop. Then I was ready and she was ready. Dr. N. Just how rigid was your destiny? Once you were Ashley's soul, was there any way you could have backed out of this entire incident in the carriage? Subject. Pause. I can tell you I had a flash just before I fell. I could have pulled back and not fallen out. A voice inside my mind said, It's an opportunity. Don't wait any longer. Take the fall. This is what you wanted. It's the best course of action. Dr. N. Was that particular moment important? Subject. I didn't want Ashley to get too much older. Dr. N. But the pain and suffering this child went through. Subject. It was horrible. The agony of those first five weeks was beyond belief. I almost died. 
but I learned from enduring it all. And I now see the memories of Leth's capacity for managing pain helped me. Dr. N, did your inner mind have any regrets during those moments when the pain was most severe? Subject, as I slipped in and out of consciousness during the worst of the ordeal, my mind began gaining in power, overriding my damaged body. I started to better control the pain. Lying in bed, the doctors helpless. The skills I developed in managing pain were later used to concentrate on my studies, and my counselor was helping me too in subtle ways. Dr. N., so you gained a lot in this life by being unable to walk. Subject. Yes. I became a listener and a thinker. I corresponded with many people and learned to write with inspiration. I gained teaching ability with the young and felt guided by an internal power. Dr. N. Was your counselor proud of your accomplishments after you returned to the spirit world? Subject, very. Although I was told I had become a little too indulged and pampered, <laughs>, laughs. But that's an okay trade-off. Dr. N, how does your experience with the strong body of Leth and the weak one of Ashley help you today? Or is this of no consequence? Subject, I benefit every day by my appreciation of the necessity of a union between mind and body to learn lessons. During my client's reliving of the street scene which broke her legs, I initiated desensitization measures. At the close of our session together, I then deprogrammed her generational memory of leg pain entirely. This woman later notified me she has had no further pain and regularly enjoys playing tennis. The two past lives I have represented in this case were largely devoted to physical choices for soul actualization in two quite different environments. Souls search for self-expression by developing different aspects of their character. Regardless of what physical or mental tools are used through the use of many bodies, the laws of karma will prevail. If the soul chooses one extreme, Somewhere down the line this will be counterbalanced by an opposite choice to even out development. The physical lives of Leth and Ashley are examples of karmic compensation. The Hindus believe a rich man sooner or later must become a beggar for his soul to develop adequately. By surviving different challenges, our soul identity is strengthened. The word strength should not be misunderstood. My subjects say the real lessons of life are learned by recognizing and coming to terms with being human. Even as victims, we are beneficiaries because it is how we stand up to failure and duress, which really marks our progress in life. Sometimes one of the most important lessons is to learn to just let go of the past. While souls carefully consider the physical attributes of an earth body in a variety of cultural settings, they give much more attention to the psychological aspects of human life. This decision is the most vital part of the entire selection process for the soul. Before entering the place of life selection, it is to a soul's advantage to ponder the factors of heredity and environment which affect how a biological life form will function. I have heard that a soul's spiritual energy has a fluctuating influence on whether the temperament of its human host will be extroverted or introverted, rationalistic or idealistic, emotionally or analytically dominated. Because of such variables, souls need to reflect in advance on the types of bodies which will serve them best in the life to come. From what I can gather, a soul's thoughts about certain human behavior preferences for themselves in the next life are known by guides and those masters charged with operating the life selection stations. It appears to me some souls take this responsibility more seriously than others. Yet a soul in the pre-life selection phase can reflect only so much on how they would fit into a specific body. When souls are called to the place of life selection, the guesswork is over. Now they must match their spiritual identity 
against a mortal being. Why one soul joined, for psychological reasons, with two human beings thousands of years apart is the basis of my next case. Case 27 is a Texas businessman who owns a large, successful clothing firm. During a vacation in California, Steve came to see me on the advice of a friend. As I took his history, I noticed he was tense and hypervigilant. While his fingers toyed with a keychain, Steve's eyes darted anxiously around my office. I asked if he was nervous or afraid of hypnosis as a procedure, and he replied, No, I'm more afraid of what you will uncover. This client told me his employees were demanding and disloyal, and the multitude of personnel complaints had become intolerable. His solution had been to increase discipline and fire people. I learned that he had two failed marriages and was a binge alcoholic. He said he had recently tried a recovery program but quit because they were getting too critical of me. As we talked further, Steve explained that his mother disappeared after leaving him on the steps of a church in Texas within a week of his birth. After a few lonely and unhappy years in an orphanage, an older couple adopted him. He added that these people were stern disciplinarians who seemed to disapprove of him all the time. Leaving home in his teens, Steve had many scrapes with the law and once attempted suicide. I found this client's personality to be overly assertive and untrusting of authority. His anger was rooted in feelings of isolation and abandonment issues. Steve said he felt like he was losing control over his life and was willing to try anything to find the real me. I agreed to short-term exploration of his unconscious mind if he would consider seeing a therapist later in his own town for sustained counseling. As this case unfolds, we will see how Steve's soul maintains its identity while responding to physical life in a human body. The intensity of this association is increased in hypnosis when my subjects discuss their motives for body selection. One reason why I have used this case is to expose a difficult barrier to discovering our identity, that of childhood trauma. Souls who unite with people that develop early personality disorders deliberately set themselves up for a difficult life. Before taking my client into the spirit world to learn why his soul chose this life, it was necessary to relive his early childhood memories. In the short excerpt which begins this case, this subject will see his real mother again. It is one of the most poignant scenes I have ever facilitated. Case 27 Dr. N You are now a baby in the first week of life, and your mother is seeing you for the last time. It doesn't matter that you are a baby, because your inner adult mind knows everything that is going on. Describe to me exactly what transpires. Subject. Subject starts to shake. I... I'm in a basket. There's a faded blue blanket around me. I'm being set down on some steps. It's cold. Dr. N. Where are these steps? Subject. In front of a church. In Texas. Dr. N. Who is setting you down on the church steps? Subject. The shaking increases. My mother is bending down over me, saying goodbye. Begins to cry. Dr. N. What can you tell me about your mother's reason for leaving you? Subject. She is young, not married to my father. He is already married. She is crying. I can feel her tears falling on my face. Dr. N, look up at her. What else do you see? Subject chokes. Blowing black hair. Beautiful. I reach up and touch her mouth. She kisses me. Soft. Gentle. 
She is having a terribly hard time leaving me here. Dr. N, does she say anything to you before leaving? Subject. Subject can now hardly talk. I must leave you for your own good. I have no money to take care of you. My parents won't help us. I love you. I will always love you and hold you in my heart forever. Dr. N, what happens then? Subject. She takes hold of a heavy door knocker. It has an animal on it. And bangs on the door. We have footsteps coming. Now she is gone. Dr. N. What do your inner thoughts tell you about all you have seen? Subject. Almost overcome by emotion. Oh. She wanted me after all. Didn't want to leave me. She loved me. Dr. N. I place my hand on the subject's forehead and begin a series of post-hypnotic suggestions, which end with the following instructions. Steve, you will be able to recall this subconscious memory in your conscious mind. You will retain this picture of your mother for the rest of your life. You now know how she truly felt about you and that her energy is still with you. Is this clear? Subject. Yes. It is. Dr. N. Now, move forward in time and tell me how you feel about your foster parents. Subject. Never satisfied with me. Made me feel guilty about everything. Controlling and judging me. Subject's face is dripping wet with tears and perspiration. Don't know who I'm supposed to be. I'm not real. Dr. N, I raise my voice. Tell me what is unreal about you. Subject, pretending. Stops. Dr. N, keep going. Subject, I'm not really in control. Constant anger. Mistreating people to get even. Hopelessness. Note, after additional conditioning, I will now take my subject back and forth between his subconscious and superconscious mind. Dr. N. All right, Steve. Now let's go back to the time before your birth into this life. Tell me if you have ever lived in another life with the soul of your birth mother. Subject. Long pause. Yes. I have. Dr. N. Was there ever a particular life you lived with this soul on earth which involved any sort of physical or emotional pain between the two of you? Subject. After a moment, Subject's hands gripped the arms of his chair. Oh, damn! That's it! Of course, it's her! Dr. N, try to relax and not go too fast for me. I want you to enter the life you see in your mind at the most crucial point in your relationship with this soul. On the count of three. One. Two. Three. Subject. A deep sigh. Oh, my. It's the same person. A different body. But she was my mother then, too. Dr. N, stay focused on the earth scene. Is it day or night? Subject. Pause. Broad daylight. Hot sun and sand. Dr. N, Describe what is happening under the hot sun in the sand. Subject, haltingly. I am standing in front of my temple. Before a large crowd of people. My guards are in back of me. Dr. N. What is your name? Subject. Harum. Dr. N. What are you wearing, Harum? Subject. A long white robe and sandals. I have a staff in my hand with gold snakes on it as a symbol of my authority. Dr. N. What is your authority, Harun? Subject. Proudly. I am a high priest. 
Note, further inquiries revealed this man was a tribal leader who was located on the Arabian Peninsula close to the Red Sea around 2000 BC. In pre-classical times, this area was known as the Kingdom of Sheba or Saba. I also learned the temple was a large oval structure of mud bricks and stone dedicated to a moon god. Dr. N, what are you doing in front of your temple? Subject, I am on the steps judging a woman. She is my mother. She is kneeling down in front of me. There's a look of pity and fear in her eyes as she looks up at me. Dr. N, how can her eyes show both pity and fear at once? Subject, there is pity in her eyes because of the power which has consumed me in taking so much control over the daily lives of my people. And there is fear, too, for what I'm about to do. This disturbs me, but I must not show it. Dr. N., why is your mother kneeling on the temple steps before you? Subject. She has broken into the storage house and stolen food to give to the people. Many are hungry at this time of year, but I alone can order distribution. The food must be measured out carefully. Dr. N., did she act against some rule of food rationing? Was this a question of survival? Subject, abruptly, there is more to this. By disobeying me, she is undermining my authority. I use the distribution of food as a means of control over my people. I want them all to be loyal to me. Dr. N., what are you going to do with your mother? Subject, with conviction. My mother has violated the law. I can save her, but she must be punished as an example. I decide she will die. Dr. N., how do you feel about killing your own mother, Harum? Subject, it must be done. She has been a constant thorn in my side, causing unrest among my people because of her position. I cannot govern freely with her here any longer. Even now she is defiant. I order her death by banging my staff on the stone steps. Dr. N. Later on, are you sad about ordering your mother's execution? Subject. Voice becomes strained. I must not think about such things if I am to maintain power. At this point, Steve's mind had relived two emotionally wrenching events involving voluntary actions of separation between mother and son. Although he had made the karmic connection, it was important that his abandonment as a baby not be isolated as pure historic retribution. For healing to begin, we had to go further. The next stage in our session together was designed to recover Steve's soul identity. To do this, I took him into the spirit world. In each of my cases, I tried to bring the subject back to the most appropriate spiritual area to get the best results. In case 13, I used the place of orientation. With case 27, we will go back to relive the spiritual time just after his return from the place of life selection. In this setting, I want Steve to see the reasons for his current body choice and the role of other soul participants in his life. Dr. N. By what name are you known in the spirit world? Subject, Sumus. Dr. N. All right, Sumus. Since we are now in the spirit world again, I want us to go to the period just following your initial viewing of the man who is Steve. What are your thoughts? Subject, such a resentful man. He is so angry about his mother dumping him on a doorstep and those hard-nosed people who will take over as his parents. I don't know if I even want to take this body. Dr. N. I understand. But why don't we put that decision aside for a few minutes while other things develop? Tell me what you actually do once you leave the place of life selection. Subject. Sometimes I might want to be by myself for a while. Usually I am anxious to have the opinions of my friends about the lives I look at, especially one this rough. 
Dr. N. Surely you had more than one body option. Subject shakes head. This is the one I should take. It's a rough decision. Dr. N. Tell me, Sumus. When you are back with your group of friends, do you discuss the possibility of yourself associating with some of them in the next life? Subject. Yes. More often than not, these close friends are going to be in my life to come, just as I will be in theirs. Some of my clutch will not be in certain lives. It doesn't matter. We all discuss our next life with each other. I want to get their ideas on details. You see, we all know each other so well. Our strengths and weaknesses, former successes and failures. What to watch out for, that kind of thing. Dr. N., did you discuss with them any details about the kind of person you should be in your next life before actually going to the place of life selection? Subject. Oh, yeah, in a roundabout way. Nothing concrete. Now that I have seen Steve and who the others might be in relation to him in this life, there are reservations. So I talked to Jor. Dr. N. Is Jor your guide? Subject. Yes, he listened a lot to what I had to say about who I thought I should be before I was sent to the place where we look at lives. Dr. N. Okay, Sumus. You have just returned to your primary cluster group from the place of life selection. What do you do first? Subject. I talk about this guy Steve who is so unhappy. No real mother, all that stuff. What kinds of people will be around him, their plans too. It must fit all together for us. Dr. N., you mean which souls are going to take certain bodies? Subject. Right. We need to firm that up. Dr. N., are soul assignments still negotiable at this point? Or is everyone told which body they will be in after leaving the place of life selection? Subject. No one is forced to do anything. We know what should be done. Jor... And the others help us make adjustments. They are sent in to round out the picture. Subject's face becomes grave. Dr. N, is something bothering you at this moment, Sumus? Subject, in a cheerless manner. Uh, my friends are moving away. There are others coming. Oh. Dr. N, I gather some deliberations are about to occur with other souls. Try to relax as best you can. On my command, you will clearly relate to me everything that is happening. Do you understand? Subject, nervously. Yes. Dr. N, begin. How many entities do you see? Subject, there are four of them coming over to me. Jor is one of them. Dr. N, who is first? Subject, subject grabs my hand. It's... Ioni. She wants to be... My mother again. Dr. N. Is this the soul of the woman who is Harum's and Steve's mother? Subject. Yes, she is... Oh! I don't want to. Dr. N. What's going on? Subject. Ioni is telling me it's time for us to... Settle things. To be in a disordered life as mother and son again. Dr. N. But Sumus, didn't you know this at the place of life selection when you viewed Steve's mother taking her baby to the church? Subject. I saw the people. The possibility. It was still an abstract consideration. It wasn't actually me yet. I guess I need more convincing because Sioni is here for a reason. Dr. N. I take it none of these newly arrived entities is from your own clutch. Subject. Size. No, they are not. Dr. N. Why did you and Ioni wait 4,000 Earth years before discussing a balancing out of your treatment of her in Arabia? Subject. Earth years mean nothing. It could have been yesterday. I just wasn't ready to offset the harm I did to her as Harum. She says the circumstances are right for this exercise now. Dr. N. 
If your soul joins with the body of Steve in Texas, will he only consider this karmic payment for your debt? Subject, pause. My life as Steve is not supposed to be a punishment. Dr. N., I'm glad you see that. So what is the lesson to be learned? Subject, to feel what desertion is like in a family relationship. Deliberate severing. Dr. N., the severing of the mother and son bond by deliberate action. Subject, yes, to appreciate what it is like to be cast off. Dr. N., allow Ioni to move away and have the other entities join us, Sumos. Subject, distressed. Ioni is floating back to... Sure, coming forward or... Oh, shit, it's Talu and Kalish. Subject squirms in his chair and tries to ward off the two spirits in his mind by pushing the palms of his hands outward. Dr. N., who are they? Subject, in a rush of words. Talo and Kalish have volunteered to be Steve's, my foster parents. They work together a lot. Dr. N., what's the problem then? Subject, I just don't want them again so soon. Dr. N., slow down for me, Sumos. You have worked with these souls before? Subject, still muttering to himself. Yes, yes, but they're so hard for me to be with. Especially Kalish. It's too soon. They were my in-laws in the German life. Note. We digress for a few minutes, while Sumas briefly explains a past life in Europe as a high-ranking army officer who neglected his family and was the object of scorn from his wife's influential parents. Dr. N. Are you saying that Talu and Kalish lack the capability for the assignment of being your foster parents in Texas? Subject shakes head with resignation. No, they know what they are doing. It's just that with Kalish, it's always a rough ride. She chooses to be people who are critical, demanding, cold. Dr. N. Does she always present that sort of behavior in human bodies? Subject. Well, that's her style with me. Kalish is not a soul who engages easily with others. She is independent and very determined. Dr. N. How about Talu as your adoptive father? Subject. Stern. Allows Kalish to lead. Can be too detached. Emotionally private. I'm going to really rebel against them this time. Dr. N. Okay. But will they teach you something? Subject. Yes, I know they will. But I am still arguing about it. Jor and Ioni come over. Dr. N. What do you say next at this conference? Subject. I want Ioni to be my foster mother. They all laugh at me. Jor won't buy my explanations. He knows I am close to Ioni. Dr. N. Do they make fun of you, Sumus? Subject. Oh, no, it's not that way at all. Talu and Kalish question my reluctance to tackle my faults with them. Dr. N. Well, I was getting the impression you thought these souls were ganging up on you to force a decision to join with the Texas baby. Subject. That's not how it goes here. We are discussing my misgivings about the life itself. Dr. N. But I thought you didn't like Talu and Kalish. Subject. They know about me. I need strict people or I ride over them. Everyone here sees I have a tendency to indulge myself. They convince me an easy life without them will be like treading water. Both of them are very disciplined. Dr. N. Well, it sounds like you have about made up your mind to go with them into the Texas life. Subject. Musing. Yes. They are going to make a lot of demands on me as a child. Kaler's sarcastic. Talu a perfectionist. Losing Ioni. It's going to be a rough ride. Dr. N. What will playing the roles of your parents do for Talu and Kalish? 
Subject. Kalish and Talu are in different configurations than me. I'm not supposed to get all muddled up in their business. It has something to do with their being rigid people and overcoming pride. Dr. N, when you are on Earth, does your soul mind always know the reason why certain people who influence you positively or negatively are significant in your life? Subject, yes, but that doesn't mean the person I am in that life understands what my spirit knows. Smiles, that's what we should be able to figure out on Earth. Dr. N, which is what we are doing now. Subject. Yeah. And I am cheating a little with you helping. But it's okay. I can use it. It does seem an enigma that the knowledge of who we really are as souls is so difficult for many of us to reach through our conscious minds. By now, I'm sure the reader has discerned that even in a superconscious state, we do retain the ability to observe ourselves with a portion of the critical center of our conscious mentality. Assisting clients in reaching their inner selves by linking all facets of the mind is the most important part of my work in hypnotherapy. I want Steve to gain insight into the motives for his behavior by understanding his soul. The dialogue which follows provides us with further disclosures as to why Sumus integrated into Steve's body. The spiritual conference with Jor, Ioni, Talu and Kalish is over and I have taken Sumus to a quiet setting in the spirit world for this discussion. Dr. N. Tell me, Sumus, how much of who you really are as a soul identity is reflected in the human beings you have occupied? Subject. Quite a lot. But no two bodies are alike. Laughs. Good body and soul mergers don't always happen, you know. I remember some of my former bodies more fondly than others. Dr. N. Would you say your soul dominates or is subordinated by the human brain? Subject. That's difficult to answer. Because there are subtle differences with the brain of each body which affects how we exhibit ourselves from that body. A human would be pretty vacant without us. We treat earth bodies with respect, though. Dr. N, what do you think human beings would be like without souls? Subject, oh, dominated by senses and emotions. Dr. N, and you believe each human brain causes you to react differently? Subject, well, that which I am is able to utilize some bodies better than others. I don't always feel fully attached to a human being. Some physical emotions are overpowering, and I am not so effective. Dr. N, such as the high level of rage displayed by Steve's temperament, perhaps affected by the central nervous system of this body? Subject, yes, we inherit these things. Dr. N, but you knew what Steve would be like before you chose his body? Subject, in disgust. That's right and it's typical of how I can make a bad situation worse. I am able to interpret only when the storms of the human mind are quiet, and yet I want to be stormy people. Dr. N, what do you mean by interpret? Subject, interpret ideas, make sense out of Steve's reactions to turmoil. Dr. N, to be frank, Sumus, you sound like a stranger inside Steve's body. Subject, I'm sorry to give you that impression. We don't control the human mind. We try by our presence to elevate it to see meaning in the world and to be receptive to morality, to give understanding. Dr. N, that's all very well, but you use human bodies for your own development too, don't you? Subject, Sure, it's a blending. We give and take with our energy. Dr. N. Oh, you tailor your energy to fit a host body? Subject. It would be better to say I use different facets of expression 
depending on the emotional drives of each body. Dr. N. Let's get specific, Sumus. What is going on between you and Steve's brain at this time on Earth? Subject. I have felt submerged. Sometimes my energy is tired and unresponsive to so much negativity. Dr. N. Looking back to your choices of Harum, Steve, and those other human bodies in between, do they all have traits in common which attracted you? Subject. Long pause. I am a contact entity. I seek humans who involve themselves aggressively with others. Dr. N. When I hear the word aggression, this means hostility to me, as opposed to being assertive. Is this what you intended to say? Subject. Pause. Well, I'm attracted to those who influence other people uh, vigorously, at full tilt. Dr. N. Are you a soul who enjoys controlling other people? Subject. I wouldn't say control exactly. I avoid choosing to be people who have no intense involvement with those around them. Dr. N. Sumus, aren't you being controlling when you try to direct other souls in their lives? Subject. No response. Dr. N. What would Jor say about your human relationships? Subject. Hmm. That I like power as a means of influencing the acts of humans who are decision makers. That I crave social and political groups where I lead. Dr. N. So you would not enjoy being in a human body which was quiet and unassuming? Subject. Definitely not. Dr. N. I push harder. Sumus. Isn't it true you took pleasure in the way you were a part of Harum's misuse of power in Arabia, and that you gained satisfaction as Steve from mistreating your employees in Texas? Subject, loudly. No, that isn't true. Things get out of hand easily when you try to lead humans. It's the conditions on Earth which screw everything up. It isn't all my fault. Dr. N. Is it possible that both Harum and Steve became more extreme in their conduct because your soul was with them? Subject, heavily. I haven't done well. I know that. Dr. N. Look, Sumus. I hope you know I don't think you are a bad soul. But maybe you are easily seduced by the trappings of human authority, and you have now become someone who feels in conflict with society. Subject, disturbed. You are beginning to sound like Jor. Dr. N. I don't presume to be doing that, Sumus. Perhaps Jor is helping us both to understand what is going on inside you. Subject. Probably. Steve and I have reached a productive stage of contact with his soul. I address this subject as if he were two people, while tightening the bowstring between his conscious and unconscious self. After applying additional conditioning to pull these two forces closer together, I close our session with a final series of questions. It is important his mind not be allowed to drift or his memories to become dissociated. To foster responsiveness, my questions are confrontive and spoken rapidly to increase the tempo of my subject's answers. Dr. N. Sumus, begin by telling me why you originally accepted Steve's body. Subject, to rise above my attraction for leading others, always wanting to be in charge. Dr. N, is your soul identity in conflict with the direction Steve's life has taken? Subject, I don't like that part of him which is fighting to be on top and at the same time having thoughts of escape by self-destruction. Dr. N, if this is a contradiction for you, why does it exist? Subject, childhood. Sadness stops. Dr. N, who am I listening to now? Sumus, why aren't you more active in helping yourself as Steve overcome the shame of abandonment by Ioni and your anger from an unloving childhood with Talu and Kalish? Subject, I am grown now and managing others won't let 
people hurt me anymore. Dr. N. Sumus, if you and Steve are now speaking to me as one intelligence, I want to know why your lifestyle is so self-destructive. Subject. Long pause. Because my weakness is using power for self-preservation on Earth. Dr. N., do you feel if you were less controlling of people as an adult, life would revert to the way you were treated as a child? Subject, angrily, yes! Dr. N., and when you don't get self-gratification from the body of your choice, what do you do as a soul? Subject, I tune out. Dr. N., I see. And how is this accomplished, Sumus? Subject, by not being too active. Dr. N, because you are intimidated by a body in an emotional tailspin? Subject, well, I go into a shell. Dr. N, so you use avoidance in not actively dealing with the major lesson you came to Earth to learn. Subject, uh-huh. Dr. N, Steve, your adoptive parents were rough on you, weren't they? Subject, yes. Dr. N, do you now see why? Subject, pause, to know what being constantly judged is like. Dr. N, what else? Subject, to overcome and be whole, bitterly. I don't know. Dr. N, I think you do know, Steve. Tell me about the damaged self you present to people around you. Subject, after some procrastination, pretending to be happy, covering up my feelings by drinking and mistreating people. Dr. N, do you want to stop this cover-up and go to work? Subject, yes, I do. Dr. N, define who you really want to be. Subject, tearfully, I, we don't want to be hostile to people, but don't want to risk being a non-person without respect or recognition either. Dr. N, so you are on a fence. Subject, quietly, yes, life is so painful. Dr. N, do you think this is an accident? Subject, no, I see it isn't. Dr. N, Steve and Sumus, repeat after me. I'm going to give back the pain of Ioni, Talu, and Kalish, which they gave to me for my own good, and get on with my life by becoming the identity I really want to be. Subject repeats these words three times for me. Dr. N. Steve, what are you going to do about revealing yourself in the future and taking responsibility for improvement? Subject, after a couple of false starts, Learn to be more honest. Dr. N. And to trust that you are not a victim of society? Subject. Yes. This case ended with my reinforcing Steve's understanding of who he really is and his mission in life. I wanted to help liberate him as a person of value with a contribution to make in society. We talked about his love and fear choices as well as the necessity to get in touch with himself frequently. I felt we had laid the groundwork for his dealing with resentment and a lack of intimacy. I reminded Steve of the need for follow-up counseling. About a year later, he wrote to tell me his recovery was going well and that he had found the lost child within himself. Steve realized his past mistakes were not failures, but the means to improvement. Case 27 demonstrates how the hard tasks we set for ourselves often begin in childhood. This is why considerable weight is given to family selection by the soul. The idea that each of us voluntarily agreed to be the children of a given set of parents before we came into this life is a difficult concept for some people to accept. Although the average person has experienced love from his or her parents, Many of us have unresolved, hurtful memories of those near to us who should have offered protection and did not. We grow up thinking of ourselves as victims of biological parents and family members whom we inherited without any choice in the matter. 
this assumption is wrong. When clients tell me how much they suffered from the actions of family members, my first question to their conscious mind is, if you had not been exposed to this person as a child, what would you now lack in understanding? It may take a while, but the answer is in our minds. There are spiritual reasons for our being raised as children around certain kinds of people, just as other people are designated to be near us as adults. To know ourselves spiritually means understanding why we joined in life with the souls of parents, siblings, spouses, and close friends. There is usually some karmic purpose for receiving pain or pleasure from someone close to us. Remember, along with learning our own lessons, we come to earth to play a part in the drama of others' lessons as well. There are people who, because they live in a terrible environment, suspect the spirit world of not being a center of divine compassion. However, it is the ultimate in compassion when beings who are spiritually linked to each other come forward by prior agreement into human lives involving love-hate relationships. Overcoming adversity in these relationships may mean we won't have to repeat certain abrasive alliances in future lives. Surviving such trials on earth places us into a heightened state of perception with each new life and enhances our identity as souls. People in trance may have trouble making a clear distinction between their soul identity and human ego. If the human personality has little structure beyond the five senses and basic drives for survival without ensoulment, then the soul is our total personality. This means, for example, that one could not have a human ego which is jealous and also possess a soul which is not jealous. Yet my cases indicate there are subtle variations between their soul identity and all that is manifested by the human personalities of many host bodies. Case 27 showed similarities and differences in the personalities of Harum and Steve. Our constant soul self seems to be a governing agent of human temperament, but we may express ourselves differently with each body. The souls of my subjects apparently select bodies which try to match their character flaws with human temperament for specific growth patterns. In one life, an overly cautious, low-energy soul might be disposed to blending with a quiet, rather subdued human host. This same soul, encouraged to take greater risks in another life, could choose to work more in opposition to its natural character by melding with a temperamentally high-strung, aggressive body type on Earth. Souls both give and receive mental gifts in life through a symbiosis of human brain cells and intelligent energy. Deep feelings generated by an eternal consciousness are conjoined with human emotion in the expression of one personality, which is as it should be. We don't need to change who we are in relation to life's experiences, only our negative reactions to these events. Asian Buddhists say enlightenment is seeing the absolute soul ego reflected in the relative human ego and acting through it during life. In the chapters on beginning, intermediate, and advanced soul levels, I gave case samples of soul maturity. I think souls do demonstrate their own patterns of ego in the bodies they inhabit, and they exert a powerful influence over body performance. However, Making hasty judgments on a soul's maturity based solely on behavioral traits has its pitfalls. The design plan of souls could include holding parts of their energy in reserve in some lives. Sometimes a negative trait is selected by an otherwise developed soul for special attention in a certain body. We have seen how a soul selects the person with whom it wishes to associate in a given life. This does not mean that it has absolute control over that body. In extreme cases, a fractured personality struggling with internalized conflicts may result in a dissociative reaction to reality. I feel that this is a sign the soul is not always able to regulate and unify the human mind. I have mentioned how souls may become so buried by human emotion in bodies which are unstable that by the time of death they are contaminated spirits. If we become obsessed by our physical bodies 
or carried along on an emotional roller coaster in life, the soul can be subverted by its outer self. Many great thinkers in history believed the soul can never be fully homogeneous with the human body and that humans have two intellects. I consider human ideas and imagination as emanating from the soul, which provides a catalyst for the human brain. How much reasoning power we would have without souls is impossible to know, but I feel that the attachment of souls to humans supplies us with insight and abstract thought. I view the soul as offering humans a qualitative reality, subject to conditions of heredity and environment. If it is true that every human brain has a host of biological characteristics, including raw intelligence and the facility for invention, which are separate from the soul, then choosing our body raises an important question. Do souls choose bodies whose intellectual capabilities match their own development? For instance, are advanced souls drawn to human brains with high intelligence? In looking at the scholastic and academic achievements of my clients, I find there is no more correlation here than with an immature soul being inclined to bodies with lower intellectual aptitudes. The philosopher Kant wrote that the human brain is only a function of consciousness, not the source of real knowledge. Regardless of body choice, I find souls do demonstrate their individualism through the human mind. A person may be highly intelligent and yet have a closed attitude about adjusting to new situations, with little curiosity about the world. This indicates a beginner soul to me. If I see someone with an evenness of mood, whose interests and abilities are solidly in focus and directed toward helping human progress, I suspect an advanced soul at work. These are souls who seek personal truths beyond the demands of ego. It does seem a heavy burden that in every new life a soul must search all over again to find its true self in a different body. However, some light is allowed through the blackout of amnesia by spiritual masters who are not indifferent to our plight. When it comes to finding soulmates on earth and remembering aspects of the lives we saw in the place of life selection, there is an ingenious form of coaching which is given to souls just before the next life. We will see how this is done in the following chapter. 14. Preparation for Embarkation After souls have completed their consultations with guides and peers about the many physical and psychological ramifications of a new life and body choice, the decision to incarnate is made. It would be logical to assume that they would then go immediately to Earth, this doesn't happen before a significant element of preparation occurs. By now, I'm sure it is understood that souls returning from the place of life selection must not only sort out the best choice of who they are going to be in their next life, but coordinate this decision with other players in the coming drama. Using the analogy of life as being one big stage play, we will have the lead role as an actor or actress. Everything we do in the play affects other minor characters, minor because they are not us, in the script. Their parts can be altered by us and ours by them because script changes, the result of free will, can be made while the play is in progress. Those souls who are going to have a close association with us on the stage of life represent our supporting cast, each with prominent roles. But how will we know them? The issue of how to find soulmates and other important people in their lives is of paramount concern with many clients who come to me seeking hypnotic regression. Eventually, most of my subjects answer their own questions in superconsciousness because finding these souls was an integral part of their preparations for leaving the spirit world. The space souls go to for this in the spirit world is commonly called the place of recognition or recognition class. I am told the activity here is like cramming for a final exam. As a result, my subjects also use the term prep class to describe this aspect of spiritual reinforcement that occurs just before their souls embark on the passage back to Earth. The next case represents this experience. 
In order to clearly understand what is behind the spiritual activity of a recognition class, perhaps the word soulmate ought to be defined. For many of us, our nearest and dearest soulmate is our spouse. Yet, as we have seen in previous cases, souls of consequence in our lives may also be other family members or a close friend. The amount of time they are with us on earth can be long or short. What matters is the impact they have on us while here. At the risk of oversimplifying a complex issue, our relationships can be divided into a few general categories. First, there is the kind of relationship involving love which is so deep that both partners genuinely don't see how each could live without the other. This is a mental and physical attraction which is so strong neither partner doubts that they were meant for each other. Second, there are relationships based upon companionship, friendship, and mutual respect. Finally, we have associations based largely upon more casual acquaintances, which offer some purposeful ingredient to our life. Thus, a soulmate can take many forms, and meeting people who fall into one of these categories is no game of Russian roulette. Soulmates are designated companions to help you and themselves accomplish mutual goals, which can best be achieved by supporting each other in various situations. In terms of friends and lovers, identity recognition of kindred spirits comes from our highest consciousness. It is a wonderful and mysterious experience, both physically and mentally. Connecting with beings we know from the spirit world in all sorts of physical disguises can be harmonious or frustrating. The lesson we must learn from human relationships is accepting people for who they are without expecting our happiness to be totally dependent upon anyone. I have had clients come to me with the assumption that they are probably not with a soulmate because of so much turmoil and heartbreak in their marriages and relationships. They fail to realize that karmic lessons set difficult standards for each of us, and painful experiences involving the heart are deliberate tests in life. They are often of the hardest kind. Whatever the circumstances, relationships between people are the most vital part of our lives. Is it coincidence, ESP, deja vu, or synchronicity, when the right time and place come together and you meet someone for the first time who will bring meaning into your life? Was there a fleeting forgotten memory Something familiar tugging at the back of your mind? I would ask the reader to sort through these memories involving a distinctive first encounter with someone important in the past. Was it at school? Did this individual live in your neighborhood? How about meeting him or her at work or during some recreation? Did someone introduce you or was it a chance meeting? What did you feel at that moment? I hate to tamper with your fond recollections of a supposedly spontaneous past meeting, but such descriptions as chance, happenstance, or impulse aren't applicable to crucial contacts. This makes them no less romantic. In cases involving soulmates, I have heard many heartfelt accounts of close spiritual beings who journeyed across time and space to find each other as physical beings at a particular geographic spot on earth at a certain moment. It is also true our conscious amnesia can make meeting significant people difficult, and we may take a wrong turn and miss the connection at some juncture. However, there can be a prearrangement here for backup contingencies. In the case which follows, I will begin the dialogue at a point in the session where I am asking my subject about his spirit world activity just before rebirth into his present life. Case 28 Dr. N Is it close to the time when you will be leaving the spirit world for another life? Subject Yes, I'm about ready. Dr. N After you left the place of life selection, was your soul mind made up as to who you would be and the people you were to meet on earth? Subject Yes, Everything is beginning to come together for me. Dr. N. What if you had second thoughts about your choice of a time frame or a particular human body? 
Could you back out? Subject, size. Yes, and I have done that before. We all have. At least people I know. Most of the time it's intriguing to think about being alive on Earth again. Dr. N. But what if you resisted coming back to Earth shortly before you were due to incarnate? Subject. It's not that... rigid. I would always discuss the possibilities. My concerns for a new life with my tutor and companions before making a firm commitment. The tutors know when we are stalling, but I have made up my mind. Dr. N. Well, I'm glad. Now tell me, once you are firmly committed to return to Earth, does anything else of importance transpire for you in the spirit world? Subject. I must go to the recognition class. Dr. N. What is this place like for you? Subject. It's an observation meeting with my companions, so I can recognize them later. Dr. N. When I snap my fingers, you will go immediately to this class. Are you ready? Subject. Yes, I am. Dr. N. Snapping my fingers. Explain to me what you are doing. Subject. I am floating in with the others to hear the speaker. Dr. N. I would like to accompany you, but you will have to be my eyes. Is that all right? Subject. Sure, but we must hurry a little. Dr. N. How does this place appear to you? Subject. Hmm. A circular auditorium with a raised dais in the middle. That's where the speakers are. Dr. N. Are we going to float in and sit down on seats? Subject shakes head. Why would we need seats? Dr. N. Just wondering. How many souls are around us? Subject. Oh, about ten or fifteen. People who are going to be close to me in the life to come. Dr. N. That's all the souls you see? Subject. No, you asked how many were around me. There are others, further away in groups, to hear their speakers. Dr. N. Are the ten or fifteen souls around you all from your cluster group? Subject. Some of them. Dr. N. Is this gathering similar to the one near the gateway where you met a few people right after your last life? Subject. Oh, no, that was more quiet. With just my family. Dr. N. Why was that homecoming meeting more quiet than where we are now? Subject. I was still in a daze from losing my body. Here there is lots of conversation and milling around. Anticipation. Our energy is really up. Listen, we have to move along faster. I have got to hear what the speakers are saying. Dr. N. Are these speakers your tutor guides? Subject. No, they are the prompters. Dr. N. Are they souls who specialize in this sort of thing? Subject. Yes. They give us the signs by coming up with ingenious ideas. Dr. N. Okay, let's move in close to the prompter while you continue to tell me what is happening. Subject. We form a circle around the dais. The prompter is floating back and forth in the center, pointing a finger at each of us and saying we must pay close attention. I have to do it. Dr. N., lowering my voice. I understand, and I wouldn't want you to miss a thing. But please explain what you mean by signs. Subject. This prompter is a sign to us so we will know what to look for in our next life. The signs are placed in our minds now in order to jog our memories later as humans. Dr. N. What kind of signs? Subject. Flags. Markers in the road of life. Dr. N. Could you be more specific? Subject. The road signs kick us into a new direction in life at certain times when something important is supposed to happen. And then we must know the signs to recognize one another too. Dr. N. And this class takes place for souls before each new life? Subject. Naturally. We need to remember the little things. Dr. N. But haven't you already previewed the details of your next life in the place of life selection? Subject. That's true, but not the small details. Besides, I didn't know all the people who would be operating with me then. This class is a final review, bringing all of us together. 
Dr. N, for those of you who will have an impact on each other's lives? Subject, that's right. It's mainly a prep class because we won't recognize each other at first on Earth. Dr. N, do you see your primary soulmate here? Subject, flushing. She is here. And there are other people that I am supposed to contact. Or they will contact me in some way. The others need their signs, too. Dr. N. Oh, so that's why these souls are a mixed gathering of entities from different groups. They are all going to play some significant role in each other's new life. Subject, impatiently. Yes, but I can't listen to what is going on with you talking. Shh. Dr. N. Lowering my voice again. All right. On the count of three, I am going to hold this class in suspension for a few minutes, so you won't miss anything. Softly. One, two, three. The speaker is now quiet while you are going to explain a little more about the flags and the signs. Okay? Subject. I guess so. Dr. N. I am going to call these signs memory triggers. Are you telling me there will be special triggers for each of these people with you? Subject. That's why we have been brought together. There will be times in my life when these people will appear. I must try to remember some action by them. The way they look, move, talk. Dr. N. And each will trigger a memory for you? Subject. Yeah. And I'm going to miss some. The signs are supposed to click in our memory right away and tell us, Oh good, you are here now. Inside us. We can say to ourselves, It is time to work on the next phase. They may seem like insignificant little things, But the flags are turning points in our lives. Dr. N. What if people miss these road flags or signs of recognition? Because, like you said, you forgot what the prompter told you. Or what if you choose to ignore your inclinations and take another path? Subject, pause. We have other choices. They may not be as good. You can be stubborn, but... Stops. Dr. N. But what? Subject, with conviction. After this class, we usually don't forget the important signs. Dr. N. Why don't our guides just give us the answers we need on Earth? Why all this fooling around with signs to remember things? Subject. For the same reason we go to Earth without knowing everything in advance. Our soul power grows with what we discover. Sometimes our lessons get resolved pretty fast. Usually not. The most interesting part of the road are the turns, and it's best not to ignore the flags in our mind. Dr. N. All right. I'm going to count from ten down to one. And when I reach one, your class will start again and you will listen while the prompter gives out signs. I will not speak until you raise the index finger of your right hand. This will be my sign that the class is over. And you can relate to me the signs you are to remember. Are you ready? Subject. Yes. Note. I finish my count and wait a couple of minutes before my subject raises his finger. This is a simple example of why time comparisons between Earth and spirit worlds are meaningless. Dr. N. That didn't take long. Subject. Yes, it did. The speaker had a lot to go through with all of us. Dr. N. I assume you have the details of recognition signs now firmly in your mind? Subject. I hope so. Dr. N. Good. Then tell me about the last sign you were given as the class ended. Subject. Pause. A silver pendant. I will see it when I am seven years old. Around the neck of a woman on my street. She always wore it. Dr. N. How will this silver object be a trigger for you? Subject. Abstractly. It shines in the sun. To catch my attention. I must remember. Dr. N. In a commanding tone. You have the capacity to bring your spiritual and earthly knowledge together. 
placing my hand on the subject's forehead. Why is the soul of this woman important for you to know? Subject. I meet her riding my bike on our street. She smiles. The silver pendant is bright. I ask about it. We become friends. Dr. N. Then what? Subject. Wistfully. I will only know her a short time before we move. But it is enough. She will read to me and talk to me about life and teach me to respect people. Dr. N. As you grow older, can people themselves be signs or provide flags to help you make a connection? Subject. Sure. They might arrange introductions at the right time. Dr. N. Do you already know most of the souls who will be meaningful people to you on Earth? Subject. Yes. And if I don't, I'll meet them in class. Dr. N. I guess they can set up love relationship meetings, too. Subject. Laughs. Oh, the matchmakers. Yes, they do that. But meetings can be for friendship. Getting people together to help your career. That kind of stuff. Dr. N. Then the souls who are in this auditorium and elsewhere can be involved with different kinds of associations in your life? Subject. Enthusiastically. Yeah, I'm going to connect with the guy who is on my baseball team. Another one will be a farming partner. Then there will be my lifelong pal from grade school. Dr. N. What if you connect with the wrong person in business, love or whatever? Does that mean you missed a relationship sign or a red flag for an important event? Subject. Hmm. It probably won't be wrong exactly. It could be a jump start to get you going in a new direction. Dr. N. Okay. Now tell me what is the most important recognition sign you must remember from this prep class. Subject. Melinda's laugh. Dr. N. Who is Melinda? Subject. My wife-to-be. Dr. N. What is there to remember about Melinda's laugh? Subject. When we meet, her laugh is going to sound like tiny bells, chimes. I really can't describe it to you. Then the scent of her perfume when we first dance, a familiar fragrance. Her eyes. Dr. N. So you are actually given more than one trigger sign for your soulmate? Subject. Yes. I'm so dense, I guess the prompters thought I needed more clues. I didn't want to make a mistake when I met the right person. Dr. N. What is supposed to trigger her recognition of you? Subject. Grins. My big ears. Stepping on her toes, dancing. What we feel when we first hold each other. It is an old saying that the eyes are the windows to our soul. No physical attribute has more impact when soulmates meet on earth. As to our other physical senses, I mentioned in an earlier chapter that souls retain such memories as sounds and smell. All five senses may be used by spiritual prompters as recognition signals in future lives. Case 28 began to express some discomfort with my keeping him from participating in his spiritual recognition class. I reinforced his visual association of floating around a central dais in an auditorium. Other people use different names. I gave my subject time to finish taking instruction and communicating with his friends and then moved him out of the place of recognition. It is my practice never to rush clients in and out of their spiritual settings during a session because I find this hinders the intensity of concentration and recall. When we had established ourselves away from the other souls, I talked to this man about his soulmate, Melinda. I learned these two souls were most comfortable in husband and wife roles, although occasionally they chose to relate differently in their lives together. Both these souls wanted to make sure they would connect on Earth in their current lives. I thought I would follow up on what actually had transpired. Dr. N. When you and Melinda came to Earth and were young, did you live close to each other? 
Subject. No, I lived in Iowa and she was in California. Musing. It was Claire that I knew in Iowa. Dr. N. Were you interested in Claire romantically? Subject. Yes, I almost married her. It was close. And that would have been a mistake. Claire and I weren't right for each other. But going together in high school had become a habit. Dr. N. And yet you left your hometown for California? Subject. Yes. Claire didn't want me to go, but my parents wanted to leave our farm and move west. I liked Iowa and was uneasy about moving and torn over leaving Claire, who was still in high school. Dr. N. Was there a road sign, a flag of some sort, which helped you make the decision to move with your parents? Subject. Size. It was my sister who waved a red flag at me. She convinced me I would have more opportunities in the city where my parents were planning to go. Dr. N. Do you see your sister in the spirit world? Subject. Oh, yeah, she is in my circle. Cluster group. Dr. N. Is Claire one of your soulmates? Subject. Pause. More a friend. Just friends. Dr. N. Was leaving Claire hard for you? Subject. Oh, yes. Even more for her. We were sexually attracted to each other in high school. The infatuation had no real mental connection. It's so hard on earth to figure out what you are supposed to do with other people. Sex is a big trap. We would have grown bored with one another. Dr. N. Was the physical attraction different with Melinda than you had with Claire? Subject. Pause. When Melinda and I met at the dance, there was the strong physical attraction of her body. And I guess she liked the way I looked, too. But we both felt something much more. Dr. N. I want to get this straight. Did you and Melinda choose your male and female bodies in the spirit world deliberately to attract each other once you reached Earth? Subject. Nodding. To some extent. But we were attracted to each other on Earth because inside our minds was the memory of what we were supposed to look like. Dr. N. When the time of the dance rolled around, what happened in your mind? Subject. I can see it all now. Our tutor was helping Melinda and me that night. My idea to go to the dance was sudden. I hate to dance because I'm clumsy. I didn't know anybody in the town yet and felt stupid. But I was guided there. Dr. N. Had you and Melinda scripted the dance scene together during the spiritual prep class? Subject. Yes. We knew about it then. And when I saw her at the dance, alarms went off. I did something very uncharacteristic of me. I cut in on the man she was dancing with. When I first held her, my legs were like rubber. Dr. N. And what else did you and Melinda feel at that moment? Subject. As if we were in another world. There was this familiarity. It was so weird during that dance. A knowing without doubt that something important was unfolding. A guidance. The intent of our meeting... Our hearts were racing. It was enchantment. Dr. N. Then why was Claire in your life earlier as a complication? Subject. To tempt me to stay on the farm. One of the false trails I needed to get past. Another kind of life. After I left, Claire found the right person. Dr. N. If you and Claire had taken the lesser trail together and missed your sister's flag... Would that life have been a total disaster? Subject. No, but it would not have been as good. There is one main course of life we choose in advance, but alternatives always exist and we learn from them too. Dr. N. In your lives, do you ever make mistakes and take false trails and miss the flags in the road for a job change, moving to another town or... Meeting someone important because the details you saw at the place of life selection or in the recognition class 
were not implanted firmly enough? Subject, long pause. The signs are there, but sometimes I overrule my inclinations. There are times in my lives when I change directions because of too much thinking and analysis, or I do nothing for the same reasons. Dr. N. Ah, so you might do something other than what was planned in the spirit world. Subject. Yeah, and it may not work out as well. But we have the right to miss the red flags. Dr. N. Well, I have enjoyed our talk about the place of recognition, and I wondered if there is anything else this spiritual class does for you later in physical life. Subject, in a faraway voice. Yes. Sometimes when I am confused about my life and don't know where to turn next, I just imagine where I might be going compared to where I've been. And it comes to me what to do. Helping clients recognize people who are destined to have an impact on their lives is a fascinating aspect of my practice. I believe those who come to see me about relationships are not in my office at a certain point in their lives by chance. Am I spoiling the purpose of their spiritual recognition class by assisting these subjects in recalling clues? I don't think so, for two basic reasons. What they are not supposed to know yet probably won't be revealed in hypnosis, while on the other hand, quite a few of my clients only want confirmation of what they already suspect is true. I can speak about recognition signs from personal experience, since I was blessed by three specific clues to help me find my wife. Thumbing through Look magazine as a teenager, I once saw a Christmas advertisement for Hamilton watches modeled by a beautiful dark-haired woman dressed in white. The caption in the ad said, To Peggy, because she was holding a wristwatch as a gift from an imaginary husband. An odd sensation came over me, and I never forgot the name or face. On my 21st birthday, I received a watch of the same make from a favorite aunt. A few years later, while attending a graduate school in Phoenix, I was washing a load of white laundry one Saturday. Suddenly, the first trigger was activated in my mind with the message, It's time to meet the woman in white. I tried to shake it off, but the face in the ad pushed all other thoughts away. I stopped, looked at my Hamilton watch, and heard the command, Go now. I thought about who wears white. Acting as if I was obsessed, I went to the largest hospital in the city, and asked at the desk for a nurse matching the name and description. I was told there was such a person who was coming off her shift. When I saw her, I was stunned by the resemblance to the picture in my mind. Our meeting was awkward and embarrassing, but later we sat in the lobby and talked nonstop for four hours as old friends who hadn't seen each other for a while, which, of course, was true. I waited until after we were married to tell my wife about the reason I came to her hospital and the clues given to me to find her. I didn't want her to think I was crazy. It was then that I learned that on the day of our first meeting, she had told her astonished friends, I just met the man I'm going to marry. My advice to people about meaningful encounters is not to intellectualize coming events too much. Some of our best decisions come from what we call instinct. Go with your gut feelings at the time. When a special moment is meant to happen in life, it usually does. One of the last requirements before embarkation for many souls is to go before the Council of Elders for the second time. While some of my subjects see the Council only once between lives, most see them right after death and just before rebirth. The spirit world is an environment personified by order, and the elders want to reinforce the significance of a soul's goals for the next life. Sometimes my clients tell me they return to their spirit group after this meeting to say goodbye, while others say they leave immediately for reincarnation. The latter procedure was used by a subject who described this exit meeting in the following manner. 
My guide, Magra, escorts me to a soft white space which is like being in a cloud-filled enclosure. I see my committee of three waiting for me as usual. The middle elder seems to have the most commanding energy. They all have oval faces, high cheekbones, no hair and smallish features. They seem to me to be sexless, or rather they appear to blend from male to female and back. I feel calm. The atmosphere is formal but not unfriendly. Each in turn asks me questions in a gentle way. The elders are all knowing about my entire span of lives, but they are not as directive as one might think. They want my input to assess my motivations and the strength of my resolve towards working in a new body. I am sure they have had a hand in the body choices I was given for the life to come, because I feel they are skilled strategists in life selection. The committee wants me to honor my contract. They stress the benefits of persistence and holding to my values under adversity. I often give in too easily to anger, and they remind me of this while reviewing my past actions and reactions towards events and people. The elders and Magra give me inspiration, hope, and encouragement to trust myself more in bad situations and not let things get out of hand. And then, as a final act to bolster my confidence when I am about to leave, they raise their arms and send a power bolt of positive energy into my mind to take with me. One aspect of the two council meetings which I initially found rather odd is that members of the same soul group do not necessarily go before the same panel. For a while, I assumed there would always be a correlation here because all members of a single soul group have the same guide. I was wrong. In the minds of my subjects, even senior guides are thought to be a couple of steps below the developmental level of the omnipotent beings who make up their councils. They are similar to the old ones that Thies told us about in Chapter 11, but with more specific responsibilities toward life evaluation of souls. While a guide might, in some respects, be considered a personal confidant to a soul, this same familiarity does not extend to an elder. In time, I came to appreciate that an elder's authority, unlike that of guides, involves a cross-section of souls from many groups. Apparently, everyone in a soul group respects the intensely private nature of these proceedings. They all see their individual council of elders as godly. The elders are bathed in bright light, and the whole setting has an aura of divinity. A subject put it this way, when we are taken into the presence of these superior beings who exist in such a high spiritual realm, it validates our feelings about the source of creation. 15. Rebirth We have seen how a soul's decision to come forward into the next life at a specific time and place on earth involves an ordered progression of spiritual planning. As I bring the soul consciousness of my subjects nearer to the moment of their exit from the spirit world, most become quietly introspective, while others engage in light bantering with their friends. These reactions toward what lies ahead depend more on the individual soul than on the length of time since the last incarnation. Rebirth is a profound experience. Those souls getting ready for embarkation to earth are like battle-hardened veterans girding themselves for combat. This is the last chance for souls to enjoy the omniscience of knowing just who they are before they must adapt to a new body. My last case involves the soul of a woman who offers us a well-defined description of her most recent passage to Earth. Case 29 Dr. N. Has the time arrived for you to be reborn into your next life? Subject Yes, it has. Dr. N. What is uppermost in your mind about returning to Earth? Subject The opportunity to live in the 20th century. It's an exciting time of many changes. Dr. N. And have you seen this life, or at least parts of it, in advance? Subject Yes. I've been through that. Subject seems distracted. Dr. N. 
Is there something else you want to talk to me about concerning your next incarnation? Subject. I'm having a last talk with Pomar, Subject's guide, on all the alternatives to my project. Life. Dr. N., might this be considered a final exit interview with Pomar? Subject. Yes, I, I suppose it would. Dr. N., would it help you to talk to me about the contingency plans you have for the next life? Subject. Voices dry and rather thin. I think I have them straight. Dr. N., how did your recognition class go? I assume that phase of your preparation is complete? Subject, still distracted. Uh-huh. I've met with the rest of the participants for my project. Dr. N., are the recognition signs clear in your mind for meeting the right souls at the right time? Subject, nervous laugh. Ah, the signals. My compacts with people. Yes, that's all done. Dr. N., Without analyzing or censoring your impressions in any way, tell me what you are feeling at this moment. Subject, I'm just gathering myself for a big jump into a new life. There is apprehension, but I am excited too. Dr. N, are you a little scared and perhaps wondering if you should go to Earth at all? Subject, pause and then more cheerfully. A little concern for what lies ahead of me, leaving my home here, but happy too at the opportunity. Dr. N., so you have mixed emotions about leaving the spirit world? Subject, most of us do as our time draws near. I have second thoughts before some lives, but Pomar knows when I'm lagging behind my schedule. You can't hide anything here, you know. Dr. N., Okay, let's assume it's a go situation for your next life. On the count of three, your decision to return at an appointed time is firm, and you are in the final stage to leave the spirit world. One, two, three. Describe to me what happens to you now. Subject, I say goodbye to everyone. This can be... difficult. Tosses her head back with resolution. Anyway, they all wish me well and I move away from them, drifting alone. There's no great rush. Pomar allows me to collect my thoughts. When I am quite ready, he comes to escort me, to offer encouragement, reassurance. And he knows when I am prepared to go. Dr. N., I sense that you are now more upbeat about the prospect of rebirth. Subject, yes. It's a period of inspiration and expectations. A new body, a course ahead. I now prepare this subject to leave the spirit world for the last time before her current life. I am as careful here as when I brought her into the spirit world for the first time, following normal age regression. Starting with a reinforcement of the protective energy shield already placed around this subject, I apply additional conditioning techniques to keep her soul in proper balance with the mind of the child she is joining on Earth. Dr. N. All right. You and Pomar are together for your exit from the spirit world. I want you to go deep inside yourself and explain to me what you do next as if it were happening in slow motion. Go. Subject. Pause. We begin to move at a greater speed. Then I am aware of Pomar detaching from me, and I am alone. Dr. N., what do you see and feel? Subject. Oh, I... Dr. N., stay with it. You are alone and moving faster. Then what? Subject, in a faint voice. Away. Slanting away. Through pillars of whiteness. Moving away. Dr. N., stay with it. Keep going and report back to me. Subject. Oh, I'm passing through folds of silky cloth. Smooth. I'm on a band, a pathway. Faster and faster. 
Dr. N, keep going. Don't stop talking to me. Subject. Everything is blurred. I'm sliding down. Down into a long, dark tube. A hollow feeling. Darkness. Then... Warmth. Dr. N, where are you now? Subject. Pause. I'm aware of being inside my mother. Dr. N, who are you? Subject. Chuckles. <laughs> I'm in a baby. I'm a baby. The hollow tube effect described by my cases is apparently not the mother's birth canal. It is similar to the tunnel souls pass through at physical death and may be the same route. The listener might wonder why I would take more care with the act of birthing when I have already brought my subjects in and out of a number of past lives during a session. There are two reasons. First, reliving a past life does not need to involve the birthing process. I help my clients go straight from the spirit world into the next life, usually as adults. Second, if I return subjects to their current body and decide to command them to relive the birthing experience, I want to remove any minor discomforts felt by some people after they wake up. Before continuing with this case, I should offer a little more general information about souls and babies. All my subjects tell me the transition of their souls from the spirit world to the mind of a baby is relatively more rapid than the passage back. What is the reason for this difference? After physical death, our souls travel through the time tunnel and move past a gateway into the spirit world in a progressive way. We have seen how the outward passage is intended to be more gradual than our return to Earth in order to allow for acclimatization of a newly freed soul. However, as souls who enter babies, we come from a state of all-knowing and thus are mentally able to adjust more quickly to our surroundings than at the end of a physical life. Then, too, we are given additional time for adaptation while in our mother's womb. Nevertheless, having this time inside our mother does not mean we are fully prepared for the jarring paroxysm of birth, with blinding hospital lights, having to suddenly breathe air, and being physically handled for the first time. My subjects say if they were to compare the moment of birth with that of death, the physical shock of being born is much greater. At some point prior to birth, the soul will carefully touch and join more fully with the impressionable developing brain of a baby. When a soul decides to enter a baby, apparently that child has no free choice in accepting or rejecting the soul. At the moment of first entry, chronological time begins for the soul. Depending upon the inclinations of the particular soul involved, the connection may be early or late in the mother's pregnancy. I have had cases where souls timed their arrival at the last minute during delivery, but this is unusual. My findings indicate even those souls who join the baby early seem to do a lot of traveling outside the mother's womb during her term. Once birth has taken place, the union of spirit and flesh has been fully solidified into a partnership. The immortal soul then becomes the seat of perception for the developing human ego. The soul brings a spiritual force which is the heritage of infinite consciousness. Although I have said souls can be confined by a human in trauma, they are never trapped. Besides leaving at the moment of death, Souls may also come and go when the body is sleeping, in deep meditation, or under an anesthetic in surgery. The soul's absences are much longer in cases of severe brain damage and coma. Case 29 continues by explaining the creative beauty of a soul joining with a new human being. This coupling of an intelligent life force before birth brings us full circle from the death scene described in Case 1. Dr. N. Well, I'm glad you arrived safe and sound in your new body. Tell me, how old is the baby? Subject. Five months have passed since conception. Dr. N. Is this your usual arrival time as far as the maturation of a child? Subject. In my lives, I have arrived at different times, 
depending on the baby, the mother, and my life to be. Dr. N. As a soul, are you in distress if the baby is aborted from the mother's womb for any reason before full term? Subject. We know if a baby is going to full term or not. Not being born comes as no surprise to us. We may be around to just comfort the child. Dr. N. Well, if the child does not go to term, is your life assignment as a soul aborted as well? Subject. No, there never was a full life assignment as far as that child was concerned. Dr. N. Might some babies who are aborted never have souls? Subject. That depends on how far along they are. The ones who die very early often don't need us. Note. This issue was as hotly debated in the past as it is today. During the 13th century, the Christian Church found it necessary to establish guidelines for the existence of souls with regard to an aborted fetus. St. Thomas Aquinas and other medieval theologians arbitrarily decided ensoulment took place 40 days after conception. Dr. N. Assuming a baby is going to full term, do you know about the convergence habits of other souls with these children? Subject, offhandedly. Oh, some float around more than others, going in and out of the baby until birth because they get bored. Dr. N. What do you usually do? Subject. I'm average, I guess. Actually, I don't spend a long time at any one stretch with babies because it can get pretty dull. Dr. N. All right. Let's take this current situation inside your mother and allow some time to pass. What do you do when you are not with the unborn baby? Subject. Laughs with delight. <laughs> you want the truth? I'll tell you. Me? I play. It's a fine time to leave and purely goof off when the baby is less active. I have fun with my friends who are doing the same thing. We bounce around Earth to visit with each other and go to interesting places where we have once lived together in former lives. Dr. N. Don't you and these other souls feel leaving the unborn baby for long periods is shirking the responsibilities of your assignment on Earth? Subject, defensively. Oh, lighten up. Who said anything about long periods? I don't do that. Anyway, our tough exercises haven't begun yet. Dr. N. When you leave the baby for a while, what astral plane are you on in relation to Earth? Subject. We are still on the Earth plane, and we try not to get too distracted either. A lot of our fooling around is in the neighborhood of the baby. I don't want you to get the idea there's nothing for us to do with unborn babies. Dr. N. Oh? Subject continues. I'm busy with this new mind, even though it's not fully ready. Dr. N. Why don't we talk more about that? When your soul enters a baby to remain with this new body for a lifetime, give me the scope of this undertaking. Subject takes a deep sigh. Once I attach to a child, it is necessary to bring my mind into synchronization with the brain. We have to get used to each other as partners. Dr. N. This is what other people tell me. But do you and the baby have an affinity for each other right away? Subject. Well, I am in the mind of the child, but separate too. I go slowly at first. Dr. N. Okay. Why don't you explain what you do with the mind of the baby? Subject. It's delicate and can't be hurried. I start with a gentle probe. Defining connections. Gaps. Every mind is different. Dr. N. Is there any conflict within the child against you? Subject. Softly. Ah. There is a slight resistance in the beginning. Not full acceptance while I trace the passages. That's usual. Until there is familiarization. Stops for a moment and laughs quietly. <laughs> I keep bumping into myself. Dr. N. As you integrate with the baby, when does it become receptive to the force of your identity as a soul? 
Subject. I'm disturbed by your word force. We never force ourselves when entering an unborn baby. My tracing is done carefully. Dr. N. Did it take you many lives to learn to trace a human brain? Subject. Uh, a while. New souls are assisted with their tracing. Dr. N. Since you represent pure energy, are you tracing electrical brain connections, such as neurotransmitters, nerve cells, and the like? Subject. Pause. Well, something like that. I disrupt nothing, though, while I learn the brainwave patterns of the baby. Dr. N., are you referring to the thought regulation circuitry of the mind? Subject, how this person translates signals, its capacity. No two children are the same. Dr. N., be completely frank with me. Isn't your soul taking over this mind and subjugating it to your will? Subject, you don't understand. It's a melding. There is an emptiness before my arrival, which I fill to make the baby whole. Dr. N., do you bring intellect? Subject, we expand what is there. Dr. N., could you be more specific about what your soul actually provides the human body? Subject, we bring a comprehension of things, a recognition of the truth of what the brain sees. Dr. N., are you sure this child doesn't think of you at first as an alien entity in her mind? Subject, no. That's why we unify with undeveloped minds. She recognizes me as a friend, a twin who is going to be part of her. It's as if the baby was waiting for me to come. Dr. N., do you think a higher power prepares the baby for you? Subject, I don't know. It would seem so. Dr. N., is your work at unification completed before birth? Subject, not really. But at birth, we have started to complement each other. Dr. N., so the unification process does take some time? Subject, sure, while we adjust to each other. And like I told you, I leave the unborn baby at intervals. Dr. N., but what about those souls who join babies at the last minute before birth? Subject, hmm, that's their style, not mine. They have to start their work in the crib. Dr. N., how far along in age is the body by the time your soul stops leaving the child altogether? Subject. At about five or six years of age, usually we get fully operational when the child starts school. Children under this age can be left to their own devices a lot. Dr. N., don't you have a duty to always be with your body? Subject. If things get bad in a physical way, then I'm back inside like a shot. Dr. N., how would you know this if you were off fooling around with other souls? Subject, every brain has a wave pattern. It's like a fingerprint. We know immediately if the baby assigned to us is in trouble. Dr. N., so you are watching the baby assigned to you all the time, both inside and out, during the early stages of growth? Subject, with pride. Oh, yes. And I watch the parents. They might be having squabbles around the baby, which sets up disturbing vibrations. Dr. N., if this happens to the child, what do you do as its soul? Subject, quiet the child as best I can. Reach out to the parents through the baby to calm them. Dr. N., Give me an example of how you can reach out to your parents. Subject. Oh, make the baby laugh in front of them by poking my parents' faces with both hands. This sort of thing further endears babies to parents. Dr. N. As a soul, you can control motor movements of the baby? Subject. I'm 
me. I can push a little on that part of the brain which controls movements. I can tickle the kid's funny bone sometimes, too. I'll do whatever it takes to bring harmony to my assigned family. Dr. N., tell me what it is like being inside a mother's womb. Subject, I like the warm, comfortable feeling of love. Most of the time there is love. Sometimes there is stress. Anyway, I use this time to think and plan what I'm going to do after birth. I think about my past lives and missed opportunities with other bodies. And this gives me incentive. Dr. N. And you haven't yet had the memories of all your past lives and your life in the spirit world blocked out by amnesia? Subject. That starts after birth. Dr. N. When the baby is born, does it have any conscious thoughts of who its soul is and the reasons for the attachment? Subject. Pause. The child mind is so undeveloped, it does not reason out this information. It does have parts of this knowledge as a means of comfort, which then fades. By the time I speak, this information is locked deep inside me. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Dr. N. So, will you have fleeting thoughts of other lives as a child? Subject. Yes, we daydream. The way we play as children, creating stories, having imaginary friends who are real. But it fades. In the first few years of life, babies know more than they are given credit for. Dr. N. All right. Now it is the time right before your birth in this life. Tell me what you are doing. Subject. I'm listening to music. Dr. N. What music? Subject. I'm listening to my father play records. Very relaxing for him. It helps him to think. I'm a bit anxious for him. Dr. N. Why? Subject. Giggles. He thinks he wants a boy, but I'll change his mind in a hurry. Dr. N. So this is a productive time for you? Subject. With determination. Yes. I'm busy planning for the approaching time when I will enter the world as a human and take that first breath. This is my last chance for quiet contemplation of the next life. When I come out, I'll be running. Conclusion The information contained in this book about the existence of souls after physical death represents the most meaningful explanation I have found in my life as to why we are here. All my years of searching to discover the purpose of life hardly prepared me for that moment when a subject in hypnosis finally opened the door to an eternal world. My oldest friend is a Catholic priest today. As boys walking together in the hills and along the beaches of Los Angeles, we had many philosophical discussions but were miles apart in our spiritual beliefs. He once told me, I think it must take courage for you to be an atheist and believe in nothing beyond this life. I didn't see it that way at the time, nor for many years afterward. Starting at age five, I had been sent by my parents to military-type boarding schools for long periods. The feelings of abandonment and loneliness were so great, I believed in no higher power than myself. I now realized strength was given to me in subtle ways I was unable to see. My friend and I still have different approaches to spirituality, but we both have convictions today that order and purpose in the universe emanate from a higher consciousness. Looking back, I suppose it was no accident in my own life that people would eventually come to me for hypnosis, a medium of truth I could believe in, to tell me about guides, heavenly gateways, spiritual study groups, and creation itself in a world of souls. Even now I sometimes feel like an intruder in the minds of those who describe the spirit world and their place in it, 
but their knowledge has given me direction. Still, I wonder why I am the messenger for the spiritual knowledge contained in this book, when someone with less original cynicism and doubt would surely have been much better suited. Actually, it is the people represented in these cases who are the real messengers of hope for the future, not the reporter. Everything I have learned about who we are and where we come from, I owe to those who were drawn to me for help. They have taught me that a major aspect of our mission on Earth as souls is to mentally survive being cut off from our real home. While in a human body, the soul is essentially alone. A soul's relative isolation on Earth during a temporary physical life is made more difficult on a conscious level by thoughts that nothing exists beyond this life. Our doubts tempt us into finding attachments solely in a physical world we can see. The scientific knowledge that Earth is only a grain of sand at the edge of a galactic shoreline within a vast sea in the universe adds to our feelings of insignificance. Why is no other living thing on Earth concerned with life after death? Is this simply because our inflated egos hate to think of life as only temporary? Or is it because our being is associated with a higher power? People argue that any thoughts of a hereafter are wishful thinking. I used to do so myself. However, there is logic to the concept we were not created by accident for mere survival, and that we do operate within a universal system which directs the physical transformation of self for a reason. I believe it is the voice of our souls which tell us we do have personhood that is not intended to die. All the accounts of life after death in my case files have no scientific foundation to prove the statements of these subjects. To those readers who find the material offered in this book too unprecedented to accept, I would hope for one thing. If you carry away nothing except the idea you may have a permanent identity worth finding, I will have accomplished a great deal. One of the most troublesome concerns of all people who want to believe in something higher than themselves is the causality of so much negativity in the world. Evil is given as the primary example. When I ask my subjects how a loving God could permit suffering, Surprisingly, there are few variations in their responses. My cases report our souls are born of a creator which places a totally peaceful state deliberately out of reach, so we will strive harder. We learn from wrongdoing. The absence of good traits exposes the ultimate flaws in our nature. That which is not good is testing us, otherwise we would have no motivation to better the world through ourselves and no way to measure advancement. When I ask my subjects about the alternating merciful and wrathful qualities we perceive to be the self-expression of a teacher oversoul, some of them say the Creator only shows certain attributes to us for specific ends. For instance, if we equate evil with justice and mercy with goodness, and if God allowed us only to know mercy, there would be no state of justice. This book presents a theme of order and wisdom rising from many spiritual energy levels. In a remarkable underlying message, particularly from advanced subjects, the possibility is held out that the God Oversoul of our universe is on a less than perfect level. Thus, complete infallibility is deferred to an even higher divine source. From my work, I have come to believe that we live in an imperfect world by design. Earth is one of countless worlds with intelligent beings, each with its own set of imperfections to bring into harmony. Extending this thought further, we might exist as one single dimensional universe out of many, each having its own creator governing at a different level of proficiency in levels similar to the progression of souls seen in this book. Under this pantheon, the divine being of our particular house would be allowed to govern in his, her, or its own way. If the souls who go to planets in our universe are the offspring of a parent oversoul, who is made wiser by our struggle, then could we have a more divine grandparent who is the absolute God? The concept that our immediate God is still evolving as we are 
takes nothing away from an ultimate source of perfection who spawned our God. To my mind, a supreme, perfect God would not lose omnipotence or total control over all creation by allowing for the maturation of less than perfect superior offspring. These lesser gods could be allowed to create their own imperfect worlds as a final means of edification, so they might join with the ultimate God. The reflected aspects of divine intervention in this universe must remain as our ultimate reality. If our God is not the best there is because of the use of pain as a teaching tool, then we must accept this as the best we have and still take the reasons for our existence as a divine gift. Certainly this idea is not easy to convey to someone who is physically suffering, for example from a terminal illness. Pain in life is especially insidious because it can block the healing power of our souls, especially if we have not accepted what is happening to us as a preordained trial. Yet throughout life, our karma is designed so that each trial will not be too great for us to endure. At a Wat temple in the mountains of northern Thailand, a Buddhist teacher once reminded me of a simple truth. Life, he said, is offered as a means of self-expression, only giving us what we seek when we listen to the heart. The highest forms of this expression are acts of kindness. Our soul may be traveling away from a permanent home, but we are not just tourists. We bear responsibility in the evolution of a higher consciousness for ourselves and others in life. Thus, our journey is a collective one. We are divine but imperfect beings who exist in two worlds, material and spiritual. It is our destiny to shuttle back and forth between these universes through time and space while we learn to master ourselves and acquire knowledge. We must trust in this process with patience and determination. Our essence is not fully knowable in most physical hosts, but self is never lost because we always remain connected to both worlds. Perhaps the most gratifying feature of my work in uncovering the existence of a spirit world in the minds of my subjects is the effect this conscious knowledge has on them. The most significant benefit which comes from knowing we have a home of everlasting love waiting for us is being receptive to the higher spiritual power within our minds. The awareness that we do belong somewhere is reassuring and offers us peace, not merely as a haven from conflict, but to unify ourselves with a universal mind. One day we are going to finish this long journey, all of us, and reach an ultimate state of enlightenment where everything is possible. This concludes Journey of Souls. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.